Essay 1 of Conduct of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Christopher June. Conduct of Life by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Essay 1. Fate. Delicate omens trace an air to the lone barge who witness bear. Birds and auguries on their wing chanted undeceiving things, him to beckon, him to warn. Well might then the poet scorn to learn of scribe or courier, hence written vaster character, and his mind at dawn of day soft shadows of the evening lay. For the provision is allied unto the thing so signified, or say, the foresight that awaits is the same genius that creates. It chanced during one winter, a few years ago, that our cities were bent on discussing the theory of the age. By an odd coincidence, four or five noted men were each reading a discourse to the citizens of Boston or New York on the spirit of the times. It so happened that the subject had the same prominence in some remarkable pamphlets and journals issued in London at the same season. To me, however, the question of the time resolved itself into a practical question of the conduct of life. How shall I live? We are incompetent to solve the times. Our geometry cannot span the huge orbits of the prevailing ideas. Behold the return and reconcile their opposition. We can only obey our own polarity. "'Tis fine for us to speculate and elect our course, if we must accept an irresistible dictation. "'In our first steps to gain our wishes, we come upon immovable limitations. "'We are fired with the hope to reform men. "'After many experiments, we find we must begin earlier, at school. "'But the boys and girls are not docile. We can make nothing of them. "'We decide that they are not of good stock. "'We must begin our reform earlier still, at generation. "'That is to say, there is fate, or laws of the world.' But if there be a resistible dictation, this dictation understands itself. If we must accept fate, we are not less compelled to affirm liberty, the significance of the individual, the grandeur of duty, the power of character. This is true, and that other is true. But our geometry cannot span these extreme points and reconcile them. What to do? By obeying each thought frankly, by harping, or if you will, pounding on each string, we learn at last its power. With the same obedience to other thoughts, we learn theirs, and then comes some reasonable hope of harmonizing them. We are sure that, though we know not how, necessity does comport with liberty, the individual with the world, my polarity with the spirit of the times. The rule of the age has for each a private solution. If one would study his own time, it must be by this method of taking up in each turn each of the leading topics which belong to our scheme of human life, and by firmly stating all that is agreeable to experience on one, and doing the same justice to the opposing facts on the others, the true limitations will appear. Any excess of emphasis on one part will be corrected, and a just balance will be made. But let us honestly state the facts. Our America has a bad name for superficialness. Great men, great nations, have not been boasters and buffoons, but perceivers of the terror of life, and have manned themselves to face it. The Spartan, embodying his religion and his country, dies before its majesty without a question. The Turk, who believes his doom is written on the iron leaf from the moment when he entered the world, rushes on the enemy's saber with undivided will. The Turk, the Arab, the Persian, accepts the foreordained fate. On two days it says not to run from thy grave, the appointed and the unappointed day. On the first neither balm nor physician can save, nor thee on the second the universe slay. The Hindu under the wheel is as firm. Our Calvinists in the last generation had something of the same dignity. They felt that the weight of the universe held them down to their place. What could they do? Wise men feel that there is something which cannot be talked or voted away a strap or belt which girds the world. The destiny, minister general, that executeth in the world o'er all, the reveance which God hath seen before, so strong it is, that though the world has sworn the contrary of a thing, it be yea or nay, yet sometimes it shall fall on a day that falleth not often a thousand years, for certainty our appetites here, be it of war, of peace, or hate, or love, all this is ruled by the sight above. Chaucer, The Knight's Tale the greek tragedy expressed the same sense whatever is fated that will take place the great immense mind of jove is not to be transgressed savages cling to a local god of one tribe or town the broad ethics of jesus were quickly narrowed to village theologies which preach an election or favoritism and now and then an amiable person like young stilling or robert huntington believe in a pistorian providence which whenever the good man wants a dinner makes it somebody shall knock at his door and leave a half dollar but nature is no sentimentalist, does not cosset or pamper us. We must see that the world is rough and surly, and will not mind drowning a man or woman, but swallows your ship like a grain of dust. The cold and considerate of persons tingles your blood, benumbs your feet, freezes a man like an apple. 
the diseases, the elements, fortune, gravity, lightning, respect no persons. The way of providence is a little rude. The habits of snake and spider, the snap of tiger and other leapers and bloody jumpers, the crackle of the bones of his prey and the coil of the anaconda, these are in the system, and our habits are like theirs. We have just dined, and however scrupulously the slaughterhouse is concealed in that graceful distance of miles, there is complicity, expense of races, race living at the expense of race. The planet is liable to shocks from comets, perturbations from planets, rendings from earthquakes and volcanoes, alterations of climate, processions of equinoxes. Rivers dry up by opening up the, of the forest. The sea changes its bed. Towns and counties fall into it. At Lisbon, an earthquake killed men like flies. At Naples, three years ago, ten thousand persons were crushed in a few minutes. The scurvy at sea, the sword, the climate in the west of Africa, at Cayenne, at Panama, at New York, cut off men like a massacre. Our western prairies shake with fever and ague. The cholera, the smallpox, have proved as mortal to some tribes as a frost to the crickets, which, having filled the summer with noise, are silenced by the fall of the temperature of one night. Without uncovering what does not belong to us, or counting how many species of parasites hang on a bamboise, or groping after intestinal parasites, or infusory biters, or the obscurities of alternate generations, the form of the shark, the bilabrus, the jaw of the sea wolf, paved with crushing teeth, the weapons of the grampus, and the warriors hidden in the sea, are hints the ferocity in the interiors of nature. Let us not deny it up and down. Providence has a wild, rough, incalculable road to its end, and is of no use to try to whitewash its huge mixed instrumentalities, or to dress it up with that terrific benefactor of a clean shirt and white neckcloth of a student in divinity. Will you say the disasters which threaten mankind are exceptional, and one need not lay his account for cataclysm of every day? Aye, but what happens once may happen again, and so long as these strokes are not to be parried, they must be feared. But these shocks and ruins are less destructive to us than the stealthy power of other laws which act on us daily. An expensive ends to means is fate, organization tyrannizing over character, menagerie, or forms and powers of the spine, is a book of fate. The bill of the bird, the skull of the snake, determines tyrannically its limits. So is the scale of races, of temperaments, so is sex, so is climate, so is the reaction of talent prisoning the vital force in certain directions. Every spirit makes its house, but afterwards the house confines the spirit. The gross lines are legible to the dull. The cabman is phrenologist so far. He looks on your face to see if a shilling is sure. A dome of brow denotes one thing, a pot belly another. A squint, a pug nose, mats of hair, the pigments of the epidermis betray character. People seem sheathed in their tough organization. Ask for Zane, ask the doctors, ask Quetelet if temperaments decide nothing. If there be anything they do not decide, read the description of medical books of the four temperaments, and you will think you are reading your own thoughts which you had not yet told. Find the part which black eyes, which blue eyes play severally in the company. How shall a man escape from his ancestors, or draw from his veins the black drop which he drew from his father's or his mother's life? It often appears in a family, as if all the qualities of the progenitors were potted in several jars, some ruling qualities in each son or daughter in the house, and sometimes the unmixed temperament, that the rank unmitigated elixir, the family vice, is drawn off in a separate individual, and the others are proportionally relieved. We sometimes see a change of expression in our companion, and say, his father or his mother comes to the window of his eyes, and sometimes a remote relative. In different hours, a man represents each of several of his ancestors, as if there were seven or eight of us rolled up in a man's skin. Seven or eight ancestors at least, and they constitute the variety of notes on which the new piece of music which his life is. At the corner of the street, you read the possibility of the passenger, in the facial angle, and the complexion, in the depth of his eye. His parentage determines it men are what their mothers made them. You may as well ask a loom which weaves Huckabuck why it does not make cashmere, or expect poetry from this engineer, or a chemical discovery from that jobber. Ask the digger in the ditch to explain Newton's law. The fine organs of his brain have been pinched by overwork and squalid poverty from father to son for hundreds of years. When each comes forth from his mother's womb, the gate of gifts closes behind him. Let him value his hands and feet. He has but one pair." but he has but one future and that is already predetermined in his lobes it describes in that little fatty face pig eye and squat form all the privilege and all the legislation of the world cannot meddle or help to make a poet or a prince of him jesus said when he looketh on her he hath committed adultery but he is an adulterer before he has yet looked on the woman by the superfluity of the animal and the defect of the thought in his constitution who meets him or who meets her in the street sees that they are ripe for each other's victim in certain men, digestion and sex absorb the vital force, and the stronger these are, the individual is so much weaker. The more of these drones perish, the better for the hive. 
If later they give birth to some superior individual, with force enough to add to his animal a new aim and a complete apparatus to work it out, all the ancestors are gladly forgotten. Most men and women are merely one couple more. Now and then one is a new cell of Camarilla, open in his brain, an architectural, musical, or philological knack, some stray taste or talent for flowers or chemistry or pigments or storytelling, a good hand for drawing, a good foot for dancing, an athletic frame for wide journeying, etc., which skill no wise alters rank in the scale of nature, but serves to pass the time, the life of sensation goes on as before. At last, these hints and tendencies are fixed in one, or in a succession, each absorbs so much food and force as to become itself a new center. The new talent draws off so rapidly the vital force that not enough remains for the animal functions, hardly enough for health, so that in the second generation, if the like genius appears, the health is visibly deteriorated and the generative force impaired. People are born with a moral or with a material bias, uterine brothers with a diverging destination. I suppose with high magnifiers, the Fraunhofer or Carpenter might come to distinguish in the embryo of the fourth day, this is a wig, that a free soiler. It was a poetic attempt to lift this mountain of fate, to reconcile this despotism of race and liberty, which led the Hindus to say, fate is nothing but the deeds committed in the prior state of existence. I find the coincidence of the extremes of Eastern and Western speculation in the daring statement of Schelling, there is in every man a certain feeling that he has been what he is from all eternity, and by no means from such in time. To say it less sublimely, the history of the individual is always an account of his condition, and he knows himself to be party to his estate. A good deal of our politics is physiological. Now and then, a man of wealth in the heyday of youth adopts the tenet of broadest freedom. In England, there is always some man of wealth and large connection planting himself during all his years of health on the side of progress, who, as soon as he begins to die, checks his forward play, calls in his troops, and becomes conservative. All conservatives are such from personal defects. They have been effeminated by position or nature, born halt and blind, the luxury of their parents, and can only, like invalids, act on the defensive. But strong natures, backwoodsmen, New Hampshire giants, Napoleons, Burks, Browns, Websters, Kassuths, are inevitable patriots until their life ebbs and their defects and gout, palsy and money, warp them. The strongest idea incarnates itself in majorities and nations, and the healthiest and strongest. Probably the election goes by a vorpitous weight, and if you could weigh bodily the tonnage of any hundred of the Whigs and Democratic Party in a town, on the Dearborn balance, as he passed the hay scales, you could predict with certainty which party would carry it. On the whole, it would be rather the speediest way of deciding the vote, to put the selectmen or the mayor and aldermen on the hay scales. In science, we have to consider two things, power and circumstance. All we know of the egg, from each successive discovery, is another vesicle. And if, after five hundred years, you got a better observer, or a better glass, he finds within the last observer another. In vegetable and animal tissues, it is just alike, and all that the primary power of spasm operates is still vesicle, vesicle. Yes, but the tyrannical circumstance, a vesicle and a new circumstance, a vesicle lodged in darkness, oaken thought, becomes animal. In light, a plant, lodged in the parent animal, it suffers changes, which ends in unsheathing miraculous capability in the unaltered vesicle, and unlocks itself to fish, bird, quadruped, head and foot, eye and claw. The circumstance is nature. Nature is what you may do. There is much you may not. We have two things, the circumstance and life. Once we thought, positive power was all. Now we learn that negative power or circumstance is half. Nature is the tyrannous circumstance, the thick skull, the sheathed snake, the ponderous, rock-like jaw, necessitated activity, the violent direction, the conditions of a tool, like the locomotive, strong enough on its track, but which can do nothing but mischief off of it, or skates, which are wings on the ice, but fetters on the ground. The book of nature is the book of fate. She turns the gigantic pages, leaf after leaf, never returning one. One leaf she lays down, a floor of granite, then a thousand ages, and a bed of slate. A thousand ages in a measure of coal, a thousand ages in a layer of marl and mud. Vegetable forms appear, her first mishappened animal, zoophyte, trilibium, fish, then saurons, rude forms, in which she has only blocked her future statute, concealing under these unwieldy monsters the fine type of her coming king. The face of the planet cools and dries, the races meliorate, the man is born, and when he race has lived its term, it comes no more again. The population of the world is a conditional population. Not the best, but the best that could live now. The scales of tribes, and the steadiness with which victory adheres to one tribe, and defeat to another, is as uniform as the superposition of strata. We know in history that weight belongs to race. We see the English, French, and Germans planting themselves on every shore and market of America and Australia, monopolizing the commerce of these countries. We like the nervous and victorious habit of our own branch of the family. 
we follow the step of the Jew, of the Indian, of the Negro, we see how much will still be expended to extinguish the Jew, in vain. Look at the impalatable conclusions of Knox in his Fragment of Races. A rash and satisfactory writer, but charged with pungent and forgettable truths. Nature respects race, not hybrids. Every race has its own habitat. Detach a colony from its race, and it deteriorates to the crab. See the shades of the picture. The German and Irish millions, like the Negro, have a great deal of guano on their destiny. They ferried over the Atlantic and carted all over America to ditch and drudge, to make corn cheap, and then to lie prematurely to make a spot of green grass on the prairie. One more faggot of these adamantian bandages is the new science of statistics, is a rule that the most casual and extraordinary events, if the basis of population is broad enough, become matter of fixed calculation. It would not be safe to say that the captain like Bonaparte, a singer like Jenny Lynn, or a navigator like Bodworth would be born in Boston, but, on a population of twenty or two hundred millions, something like accuracy may be had. Tis frivolous to fix pedantically the date of particular inventions. They have all been invented over and over fifty times. Man is the arc machine, of which all these shifts draw from himself are toy models. He helps himself on each emergency by copying or duplicating his structure, just so far as the need is. It is hard to find the right Homer, Zoroaster, or Menu. Harder still to find the Tubal Cain, or Vulcan, or Cadmus, or Copernicus, or Fuse, or Fulton, the indisputable inventor. There are scores and centuries of them. The air is full of men. This kind of talent so abounds, this constructive tool-making efficiency, as if it adhered to the chemical atoms, as if the air he breathes were of Volkonsons, Franklins, and Watts. Doubtless in every million there would be an astronomer, a mathematician, a comic poet, a mystic. No one can read the history of astronomy without perceiving that Copernicus, Newton, Laplace are not new men, or a new kind of men, but that Thales, Anaximenes, Hipparchus, Empedocles, Aristarchus, Pythagoras, and Apodes had anticipated them, each of the same geometrical mind, apt for the same vigorous computational logic, a mind parallel to the movement of the world. The Roman mile probably rested on a measure of a degree of the meridian. Mahatman and Chinese know of, of the leap year, of the Gregarian calendar, of the procession of equinoxes. As in every barrel of cowries brought to New Bedford, there shall be one Orangia, so there will be in a dozen millions of Malays and Mahatmans, one or two astronomical skulls. In large city, the most casual things, the things whose beauty lie in their casualty, are produced as punctually and to order as a baker's muffin for breakfast. Punch makes exactly one capital joke a week, and the journals contrive to furnish one good piece of news every day. Not less work the laws of repression, the penalties of violated functions. Famine, typhus, frost, war, suicide, effete races must be reckoned calculable parts of the system of the world. These are pebbles from the mountain, hints of the terms by which our life is walled up, and which show a kind of mechanical exactness, or a loom or mill, in which we call casual or fortuitous events. The force with which we resist these torrents of tendency looks so ridiculously inadequate that it amounts to little more than the criticism of a protest made of a minority of one under compulsions of millions. I seemed, in the height of a tempest, to see men overboard struggling in the waves, and driven about here and there. They glanced intelligently at each other, but t'was little they could do for one another. T'was much if they could keep afloat alone, while well, they had a right to their eye beams, and all the rest was fate. I cannot trifle with this reality, this cropping out in our planted gardens in the core of the world. No picture of life can have any veracity that does not admit the odious facts. A man's power is hooped in by necessity, which by many experiments he touches on every side until he learns his arc. The element running through entire nature, which we popularly call fate, is known to us as limitation. Whatever limits us, we call fate. If we are brute and barbarous, the fate takes a brute and dreadful shape. As we refine, our checks become finer. If we rise to spiritual culture, the antagonism takes a spiritual form. In the Hindu fables, Vishnu follows Maya through all her ascending changes, from insect to crawfish, up to elephant. Whatever form she took, he took the male form of the kind, until she became at last woman and goddess, and he a man and god. The limitations refine as the soul purifies, but the ring of necessity is always perched at the top. When the gods in the north's heaven were unable to bind the Fenris wolf, with steel or with weight of mountains, the one he snapped and the other he spurned with his heel, they put on his foot a limp band softer than silk or cobweb, and this held him. The more he spurned it, the stiffer it grew. So soft and so staunch is the ring of fate. Neither brandy nor nectar, nor sulfuric ether, nor hellfire, nor ichor, nor poetry, nor genius can get rid of this limp band. For if we give it the high sense in which the poets use it, even thought is itself not above fate. That too must act according to eternal laws, and all that is willful and fantastic in it is in opposition to its fundamental essence. And, last of all, high over thought, in the world of morals, fate is vindicator. 
leveling the high, lifting the low, requiring justice in man, and always striking soon or late when justice is not done. What is useful will last, what is hurtful will sink. The doer must suffer, said the Greeks. It would soothe the deity not to be soothed. God himself cannot procure good for the wicked, said the Welsh triad. God may consent, but only for a time, said the bard of Spain. The limitation is impassable by any insight of man. In his last and loftiest ascensions, insight itself, and the freedom of the will, is one of its obedience members, but we must not run into generalizations too large, but show the natural bounds of our essential distinctions, and seek to do justice to the other elements as well. Thus we trace fate in matter, mind, and morals, in race and retardations of strata, and in thought and character as well. It is everywhere bound or limitation, but fate has its lord, limitation its limits, is different seen from above and from below, from within and from without. For though fate is immense, so is power, which is the other fact in the dual world, immense. If fate follows the limits power, power attempts and antagonizes fate. We must respect fate as natural history, but there is more than natural history. For who and what is this criticism that pries into the matter? Man is not order of nature, sack and sack, belly and members, link in a chain, nor any ignominious baggage, but a stupendous antagonism, a dragging together the poles of the universe. He betrays the relation to what is below him. Thick-skulled, small-brained, fishy, quadrominous, crawled about ill disguised, hardly escaped into biped, and has paid for the new powers by loss of some of the old ones. The lightning which explodes and fashions planets, maker of planets and suns, is in him. On one side, elemental order, sandstone, granite, rock ledges, peat bog, forest, sea and shore. On the other part, thought, the spirit which composes and decomposes nature. Here they are, side by side, god and devil, mind and matter, king and conspirator, belt and spasm, riding peacefully together in the eye and brain of every man. Nor can he blink the free will. To hazard the contradiction, freedom is necessary. If you please to plant yourself on the side of fate and say, fate is all, then we say, part of fate is the freedom of man. Forever wells up the impulse to choosing and acting in the soul. Intellect annuls fate. So far as a man thinks, he is free. And though nothing is more disgusting than the crowing about liberty by slaves, as most men are, and the flippant mistaking for freedom of some paper preamble like the Declaration of Independence, or the statute right to vote, by those who have never dared to think or to act, it is wholesome to man to look not at fate, but at the other way, the practical view of the other. His sound relation to these facts is to use and command, not to cringe to them. Look not on nature, for her name is fatal, said the oracle. Too much contemplation on these limits induces meanness. They who talk much of destiny, their birth stars, etc., are in a lower dangerous plane, and invite the evils they fear. I cited the instinctive and heroic races as proud believers in destiny. They conspire with it. A loving resignation is with the event. But the dogma makes a different impression when it is held by the weak and lazy. Tis weak and vicious people who cast the blame on fate. The right use of fate is to bring up our conduct to the loftiness of nature. Rude and invincible except by themselves are the elements. So let man be. Let him empty his breast of his windy conceits and show his lordship by manners and deeds on the scale of nature. Let him hold his purpose as with a tug of gravitation. No power, no persuasion, no bribe shall make him give up his point. A man ought to compare advantageously with a river, an oak, or a mountain. He should not have not less the flow, the expansion, the resistance of these. "'Tis the best use of fate to teach a fatal courage. Go face the fire at sea, or the cholera in your friend's house, or the burglar in your own, or what danger lies in the way of duty, knowing you are guarded by the cherubim of destiny. If you believe in fate to your harm, believe it at least for your good. For if fate is so prevailing, man also is part of it, and can confront fate with fate. If the universe have these savage accidents, our atoms are as savage in resistance. We should be crushed by the atmosphere, but for the reaction of the air within our body." A tube made of a film of glass can resist the shock of the ocean, if filled with the same water. If there be omnipotence in the stroke, there is omnipotence of recoil. 1. But fate against fate is only pairing defense. There are also the noble creative forces. The revelation of thought takes man out of servitude into freedom. We rightly say of ourselves, we are born, and afterwards, we are born again, and many times. We have successful experiences so important that the new forgets the old, and hence the mythology of the seven or nine heavens. The day of days, the great day of the feast of life, is that in which the inward eye opens the unity in things, the omnipresence of laws. Sees that what is must be, and ought to be, or is the best. The beatitude dips from on high down on us, and we see, is not, on, is not in us so much as we are in it. If the air come to our lungs, we breathe and live. If not, we die. If the light comes to our eyes, we see, else not. 
and if truth come to our mind, we suddenly expand to its dimensions, as if we grew to worlds. We are as lawgivers, we speak for nature, we prophesy and divine. This insight throws us on the party interests of the universe, against all and sundry, against ourselves as much as others. A man speaking from insights affirms of himself what is true of the mind. Seeing its immortality, he says, I am immortal. Seeing its invincibility, he says, I am strong. It is not in us, but we are in it. It is not of the maker, not of what is made. All things are touched and changed by it. This uses and is not used. It distances those who share it from those who share it not. Those who share it not are flocks and herds. It dates from itself, not from former men or better men, gospel or constitution or college or custom. Where it shines, nature is no longer intrusive, but all things make a musical or pictorial impression. The world of men shows like a comedy without laughter populations interests governments history this all toy figures in a toy house it does not overvalue particular truths we hear eagerly every thought and word quoted by an intellectual man but in his presence our own mind is roused to activity and we forget very fast what he says much more interested in the new play of our own thought than any thought of his tis the majesty into which we have suddenly mounted the impersonality the scorn of egotisms the sphere of laws that engage us once we were stepping a little this way and a little that way now we are as men in a balloon, and do not think so much of the point we had left, or the point we would make, as of the liberty and glory of the way. Just as much intellect as you add, so much organic power. He who sees through the design presides over it, and must will that which must be. We seek and rule, and though we sleep, our dream will come to pass. Our thought, though it were an hour old, affirms an oldest necessity, not to be separated from thought, and not to be surpassed, and not to be separated from will. They must always have coexisted. It prizes us of its sovereignty and Godhead, which refuses to be severed from it. it. Is not mine or thine, but the will of all mind. It is poured into the souls of all men, as the soul itself which constitutes them men. I know not whether there be, as is alleged, in the upper region of our atmosphere, a permanent westerly current, which carries all its atoms which rise to that height. But I see that when a soul reaches a certain clearness of perception, they accept a knowledge and motive above selfishness. A breath of will breathes eternally through the universe of souls in the direction of right and necessary. It is the air which all intellects inhale and excel. It is the wind which blows the worlds into orbit and orbit. Thought dissolves the material universe by carrying the mind up into a sphere where all is plastic. Of two men, each obeying his own thought, he who thought is deepest will be the stronger character. Always one man more than another represents the will of divine providence to the period. 2. If thoughts make free, so does a moral sentiment. The mixtures of spiritual chemistry refuse to be analyzed, yet we can see that the perception of truth is joined to the desire that it shall prevail. That affection is essential to will. Moreover, when a strong will appears, it usually results from a certain unity of organization, as if the whole energy of the body and mind float in one direction. All great force is real and elemental. There is no manufacturing a strong will. There must be a pound to balance a pound. Where power is shown in the will, it must rest on the universal force. Alaric and Bonaparte must believe they rest on a truth, or they can be bought or bent. There is a bribe and possibility for any finite will. But the pure sympathy with universal ends is an infinite force and cannot be bribed or bent. Whoever has had experience in the moral sentiment cannot choose but believe its unlimited power. Each pulse from that heart is an oath from the Most High. I know not the world's sublime means if it is not intimations of this infinite of a terrific force. A text of heroism, a name and an anecdote of courage are not arguments, but sallies of freedom. One of these is the verse of the Persian Hafiz. "'Tis written on the gate of heaven, woe unto him who suffers himself to be betrayed by fate. Does the reading of history make us fatalists? What courage does not the opposite opinion show? A little whim of will will be free gallantly contending against the universe of chemistry. But insight is not will, nor is affection will. Perception is cold, and goodness dies in wishes. As Voltaire says, "'Tis the misfortune of worthy people that they are cowards. There must be a fusion of these two to generate the energy of will." There can be no deriving force except through the conversion of man into his will, making him the will, and the will him. One may say boldly that no man has the right to perception of any truth who has not been reacted on by it, so as to be ready to be its martyr. The one serious and formal thing in nature is a will. Society is servile for one of will, and therefore the world wants saviors and religions. One way is right to go, the hero sees it, and moves down that aim, and that the world under him for root and support he is to others as the world his approbation is honor his descent infamy the glance of his eye has the force of sunbeams a personal influence towers up in memory and only worthy and we gladly forget numbers money climate gravitation and the rest of fate 
We cannot afford to allow the limitation. If we know it is the limiter of the growing man, we stand against fate, as children stand against the wall in their father's house, and notch their height from year to year. When the boy grows to man and is master of the house, he pulls down that wall and builds it newer and bigger. It is only a question of time. Every great youth is in training to ride and rule his dragon. His science is to make weapons and wings of these passions and retarding forces. Now, whether seeing these two things, fate and power, we are permitted to believe in unity? The bulk of mankind believe in two gods. They under one dominion here in the house, as friend and parent, in social circles, in letters, in art and love, in religion. But in mechanics, in dealing with steam and climate, in trade, in politics, they think they come under another, and that it would be practical blunder to transfer the methods of ways of working of one sphere to the other. What good, honest, generous men at home will be wolves and foxes on change? What pious men in the parlor will vote for reprobates at the polls? To a certain point, they believe themselves in the care of providence, but in a steamboat, in an epidemic, in war, they believe in malignant energy rules. But relation and connection are not somewhere and sometimes, but everywhere and always. The divine order does not stop where sight stops. The friendly powers work on the same rules, on the same farm, and the next planet. Where they have not experienced, they run against it and hurt themselves. Fate, then, is named for facts not yet passed under the fire of thought, for causes which are unpenetrated. But every jet of chaos which threatens to exterminate us is convertible by intellect into wholesome force. Fate is unpenetrated causes. The water drowns ship and sailor are like a grain of dust. But learn to swim, trim your bark, and the wave which drowned it will be cloven by it and carry it like its own foam, a plume and a power. The cold is inconsiderate of persons, tingles your blood, freezes a man like a dewdrop. But learn to skate, and the ice will give you a graceful, sweet, and poetic motion. The cold will brace your limbs and brain to genius, and make you foremost men of time. Cold and sea will train an imperial Saxon race, where nature cannot bear to lose, and after cooping it up for thousands of years, the under Eglin gives a hundred Englands, a hundred Mexicos. All the bloods it shall absorb and domineer, and more than Mexicos, the secret of water and steam, the spasm of electricity, the ductility of metals, the chariot of the air, the ruddered balloon are waiting for you. The annual slaughter from typhus far exceeds that of war. The right drainage destroys typhus. The plagues in the sea service from scurvy is healed by lemon juice and other diets portable and procurable. The depopulation by cholera and smallpox is ended by drainage and vaccination, and every other pest is not less in the chain of cause and effect, and may be fought off. And whilst arts draw out the venom, it commonly extorts some benefit from the vanquished enemy. The mischievous torrent is taught to drudge for man, the wild beast he makes for useful food or dress or labor. The chemic explosions are controlled like his watch. They are now the seeds which he rides. Man moves on all modes, by legs of horses, by wings of wind, by steam, by gas of balloon, by electricity, and stands on tiptoe, threatening to hunt the eagle in his own element. There is nothing he will not make his own carrier. Steam was, till the other day, the devil which he dreaded. Every pot made by a human potter or brazier was a hole in his cover, to let off the enemy, lest he should lift pot and roof, and carry the house away. But the Marquis of Walchester, Watt and Fulton, bethought themselves that where was power was not devil, but was God that it must be availed of, and not by any means let off and wasted. Could he lift pot and roof and houses so handily? He was a workman we were in search for. He would be used to lift away, chain, and compel other devils, far more reluctant and dangerous, namely, cubic miles of earth, mountains, weight of resistance of water, machinery, and the labors of all men in the world. And time he shall lengthen and shorten space. It has not fared much otherwise with higher kinds of steam. The opinion of millions was the terror of the world, and it was attempted either to dissipate them by amusing nations, or to pile it over with strata of society, a layer of soldiers, over that a layer of lords, and a king on top, with clamps and hoops and castles and garrisons and police. But sometimes the religious principle would get out and burst the hoops, and arrive every mountain laid on top of it. The Fultons and Watts of politics believe in unity, saw that it was a power, and by satisfying it, as just as satisfies everybody, through a different disposition of society, grouping it on a level instead of piling it into a mountain, they have contrived to make of this terror the most harmless and energetic form of state. Very odious, I confess, are the lessons of fate. Who likes to have a dapper phrenologist pronouncing on his fortunes? Who likes to believe that he has hidden in his skull, spine, and pelvis all the vices of Saxon or Celtic race, which will be sure to pull him down, with the grandeur of hope and resolve he has fired, into a selfish, huckstering, servile, dodging animal? A learned physician tells us the fact is invariable with the Neapolitan that, when mature, he assumes the forms of the unmistakable scoundrel. That is a little overstated, but it may pass. But these are magazines and arsenals. A man must thank his defects and stand in some terror at his talents. A transcendent talent draws so largely on his forces as to lame it. A defect pays him revenues on the other side. Sufferance, which is the badge of the Jew, has made him, in these days, the ruler of the rulers of the earth. 
if fate is or in quarry if evil is good and in the making if limitation is power that shall be if calamities oppositions and ways or wings and means we are reconciled fate involves amelioration no statement of the universe can have any soundness which does not admit its ascending effort the direction of the whole and of the parts is toward benefit and in proportion to the health behind every individual closes the organization before him open liberty the better the best the first and worst races are dead the second and perfect races are dying out or remain for the maturing of higher in the latest race in man every generosity every new perception and love and praise he extorts from his fellows are certificates of advance out of fate into freedom liberation of the will from the sheaths and clogs of organization which he has outgrown is the end and aim of the world every calamity is a spur and valuable hint and whereas endeavors do not fully avail they tell his tendency the whole circle of life tooth against tooth devouring war war for food a yelp of pain and a grunt of triumph and at last the whole menagerie the whole chemical mass is mellowed and refined for higher use pleases that a sufficient perspective but to see how fate slides into freedom and freedom into fate observe how far the roots of every man run or find if he can a point where there is no thread of connection our life is constantaneous and far related the snout of nature is so well tied and nobody has ever had the cunning enough to find the two ends nature is intricate overlapped interweaved and endless christopher wren said of the beautiful king's college chapel that if anybody would tell him where to lay the first stone he would build another where shall we find the first atom in this house of man which is all constant inosculation and balance of parts the web of relation is shown in habitat shown in hibernation when hibernation was observed it was found that while some animals become torpid in winter others were torpid in summer hibernation then was a false name the long sleep is not an effect of cold but is regulated by the supply of proper food for the animal it becomes torpid when the fruit or prey it lives on is not in season and regains its activity when its food is ready eyes are found in light ears in auricular air feet on land fins in water wings in air and each creature where it was meant to be with mutual fitness every zone has its own fauna there is adjustment between the animal and its food its parasite its enemy balances are kept it is not allowed to diminish in numbers nor to exceed the like adjustments exist for man his food is cooked when he arrived his coal in the pit the house ventilated the mud of the deluge dried his companions arrived at the same hour and awaiting him with love concert laughter and tears these are coarse adjustments but the invisible are not less there are more belongings to every creature than his air and his food his instincts must be met and he has a predisposing power that bends and fits what is near to him to his use he is not possible until the invisible things are right for him as well as the visible of what changes then in sky and earth and in finer skies and earths does the appearance of some dante or columbus surprise us how is this affected nature is no spendthrift but takes the shortest way to her ends as general says of the soldiers if you want a fort build a fort so nature makes every creature do its own work and get its living is it planet animal or tree the planet makes itself the animal cell makes itself and what it wants every creature run or dragon shall make it its own lair so soon as there is life there is self-direction and absorbing and using of material life is freedom life in the direct ratio of its amount you may be sure that the newborn man is not inert life works both voluntary and supernaturally in its neighborhood do you suppose he can be assimilated by his weight or pounds or that he is contained in his skin this reaching radiating ejaculating fellow the smallest candle fills a mile with its rays and the papillae of man runs to every star when there is something to be done the world knows how to get it done the vegetable eye makes leaf pyrocarp root bark and thorn as the need is the first cell converts itself into stomach mouth nose or nail according to the want the world throws its life into a hero or shepherd and puts him where he is wanted dante and columbus were italians in their time they would be russians or americans today. things ripen new men come the adaptation is not capricious the ultra aim the purpose beyond itself the correlation by which planets subside and crystallize then animate beast animal will not stop but will work into finer particulars and from the finer to the finest the secret of the world is the tie between person and event person makes event the event person the times the age what is that but a few profound persons and a few active persons who epitomize the times goethe hegel metternich adams calhoun Gazou, Peel, Cobden, Kasuth, Rothschild, Astor, Brunel, and the rest. The same fitness must be resumed a man in the time and event as between the sexes, or between a race of animals and the food it eats, or the inferior races it uses. He thinks his fate alien, because the copula is hidden. But the soul contains the event that shall befall it, for the event is only the actualization of its thoughts. And what we pray to ourselves for is always granted. The event is a print of your form. It fits you like your skin. 
what Jesus does is proper to him. Events of the children of the body and mind, we learn of the soul of fate as the soul of us, as if he sings, Alas, to all I had not known, my guide and fortune's guides are one. All the toys that infatuate men, and which they play for, houses, land, money, luxury, power, fame, are the self-same thing, with a new gauze or two of illusion overlaid, and of the drums and rattles by which men are made willing to have their heads broken, and are led out soundly every morning to parade, the most admirable is this by which we are brought to believe that events are arbitrary and independent of actions. At the conjurers we detect the hair by which he moves his puppet, but we have not yet eyes sharp enough to descry the thread that ties cause and event. Nature magically suits the man to his fortune by making these the fruits of his character. Ducks take to the water, eagles to the sky, waders to the sea margin, hunters to the forest, clerks to the conning room, soldiers to the frontier. Thus events grow on the same stem with persons, our subpersons. The pleasures of life are according to the man that lives it, and not according to the work of the place. Life is an ecstasy. We know that madness belongs to love. What power to paint a vile object in hues of heaven. As insane persons are indifferent to their dress, diet, or other accommodations, and as we do in dreams, with, equ with equanimity, the most absurd act, so the drop more of wine or a cup of life will reconcile us to the strange company and work. Each creature puts forth its, from itself its own condition and sphere, as the slug sweats its slimy house on the pearl leaf, and the woolly aphids on the apple perspire their bone bed, and the fish its shell. In youth we clothe ourselves in rainbows, and go as brave as the zodiac. In age we put on another sort of perspiration, gout, fever, rheumatism, caprice, doubt, fretting, and avarice. A man's fortunes are the fruit of his character. A man's friends are his magnetisms. We go to Herodotus and Plutarch for examples of fate. But we are examples. The tendency of every man to enact all that is in his constitution is expressed in the old belief, that the effort by which we make to escape from our destiny only serves to lead us into it. And I have noticed, a man likes better to be complimented in his position, as a proof of the last or total excellence, than on his merit. A man will see his character omitted in the events that seem to meet, but which exude from and accompany him. Events expand from the character. As once he found himself among toys, so now he plays a part in the colossal systems, and his growth is declared in his ambition, his companions, in his performance. He looks like a piece of luck, but as a piece of causation. The mosaic, angulated and ground to fit into the gap he fills. Hence, in each town, there is some man who, in his brains and performance, an explanation of the tillage, production, factories, banks, churches, ways of living, and society of that town. If you do not chance to meet him, all that you see will leave you a bit puzzled. If you see him, it will become plain. We know in Massachusetts who built New Bedford, who built Lynn, Lowell, Lawrence, Clinton, Fickburg, Holyoke, Partland, and uh, many other noisy mart. Each of these men, if they were transparent, would seem to you not so much as men as walking cities. Wherever you put them, they would build one. History is the action and reaction of these two, nature and thought. Two boys pushing each other on the curbstone of the pavement. Everything is pushed and pusher, and matter and mind are in perpetual tilt and balance so. Whilst the man is weak, the earth takes up him. He plants his brain in affectations. By and by he takes up the earth, and half his garden and vineyards in the beautiful order and production of his thought. Every solid on the earth is ready to become fluid on the approach of the mind, and the power of the flux is in the measure of the mind. If the wall remain adamant, it accuses the want of thought. To a subtler thought, it may stream into new forms, expressive of the character of the mind. What is the city in which we sit here but an aggregate of incongruous materials which have obeyed the will of some man? The granite was reluctant, but his hands were stronger, and it came. Iron was deep in the ground, and well combined with stone, but it could not hide from his fires. Wood, lime, stuffs, fruit, gums were disposed over the earth and sea, in vain. Here they are within reach of every man's day labor, what he wants of them. The whole world is the flux of matter over the wires of thought to the poles and points where it would build. The races of men rise out of the ground, preoccupied with the thoughts which rule them, and divided into parties, ready, armed, and angry to fight for this metaphysical abstraction. The quality of the thought differences the Egyptian and the Roman, the Austrian and the American. The men who come on the stage at one period are all found to be related to each other. Certain ideas are in the air. We are all impressionable, and we are made of them. All impressionable, but some more than others, and these first express them. This explains the curious contemporaneousness of inventions and discoveries. The truth is in the air, and the most impressionable brain will announce it first, but all will announce it a few minutes later. So women, as most susceptible, are the best index of the coming hour. So the great man, that is, the man most imbued with the spirit of the time, is the impressionable man, of a fiber irritable and delicate, like iodine delight. He feels the infinitesimal attractions. His mind is righter than others, because he yields to a current so feeble as can be felt only by a needle delicately poised. 
The correlation is shown in defects. Moiler, in his essay on architecture, taught the building which was fitted accurately to answer its ends would be turned out to be beautiful, though beauty had not been attended. I find the like unity in human structures rather violent and pervasive. That crudity in the blood will appear in the argument. A hump in the shoulder will appear in the speech and the handwork. If this mind could be seen, the hump would be seen. If a man has a seesaw in his voice, it will run into his sentences, into his poem, into the structure of his fable, into his speculation, into his charity. And as every man is hunted by his own daemon, vexed by his own disease, this checks all of activity. So each man, like each plant, has his parasites. A strong, astringent, bilious nature has more truculent enemies than the slugs and moss that fret my leaves. Such a one has curculios, borers, knife worms. A swindler ate him first, then a client, then a quack, then smooth, plausible gentleman, bitter, selfish as Moloch. This correlation really existing can be divined. If the threads are there, thought can follow and show them, especially when a soul is quick and docile, as Chaucer sings. Or if the soul of proper kind be so perfect as men find, that it wot what is to come, that he warneth all and some of every of their adventures, by have provisions and figures, that our flesh hath not might to it to understand or write, for it is worn too darkly. So people are made up of rhyme, coincidence, omen, curiosity, and presage. They meet the person they seek. What their companion prepares to say to them, they first say to him, and a hundred signs apprise them of what is about to befall. Wonderful intricacy in the web, wonderful constancy in the design this vagabond life admits. We wonder how the fly finds its mate, and yet year after year we find two men, two women, without legal or carnal right, spend a great part of their best time together within a few feet of each other. And the moral is that what we seek we shall find. What we flee from flees from us. As Goethe said, what we wish for our youth comes to us in heaps in old age, too often cursed with the granting of our prayer, and hence the high caution that since we are sure of having what we wish, we beware of only wishing for high things. One key, one solution to the mysteries of human condition, one solution to the old knots of fate, freedom for knowledge, exists, the propounding, namely, of the double consciousness. Man must ride alternately on the horses of his private and his public nature, as the equestrians of the circus throw themselves nimbly from horse to horse, or plant one foot on the back of one and the other foot on the back of the other. So a man is victim of his fate, his sciatica in his loins, the cramp in his mind, a club foot and a club in his wit, a sour wit and a selfish temper, a strut in his gait, and a conceit in his affectation or is ground to powder by the vice of his race, he is to rally on his relation to the universe, which his ruin benefits. Leaving the daemon who suffers, he is to take sides with the deity, who secures universal benefit by his pain. To offset the drag of temperament and race which pulls down, learn this lesson, namely, that by the cunning co-presence of two elements, which is throughout nature, whatever lames or paralyzes you, draws in with it the divinity of some form to repay. A good intention clothes itself with sudden power, when a god wishes to ride, any chip or pebble will bud and shoot out winged feet and serve him for a horse. Let us build altars to blessed unity, which holds nature and souls in perfect solution, and compels every atom to serve in a universal end. Or not wonder at the snowflake, a shell, a summer landscape, or the glory of the stars, but at the necessity of beauty under which the universe lies, that all is and must be pictorial, that the rainbow and the curve of the horizon and the arc of the blue vault are only results from the organism of the eye. There is no need for foolish amateurs to fetch me to admire a garden of flowers, or a sun-gilt cloud, or a waterfall, when I cannot look without seeing splendor and grace. How idle to choose a random sparkle here or there, when the indwelling necessity plants the rose of beauty on the brow of chaos, and discloses the central intention of nature to be harmony and joy. Let us build altars to the beautiful necessity. If we thought men were free in the sense that, in a single exception, one fantastical will could prevail over the law of things. It were all one as if a child's hand could pull down the sun. If, in the least particular, one could derange the order of nature, who would accept the gift of life? Let us build altars to the beautiful necessity, which secures that all is made of one piece, that plaintiff and defendant, friend and enemy, animal and planet, food and eater, are of one kind. In astronomy is vast space, but no foreign system. In geology, vast time, but the same loss as today. Why should we be afraid of nature, which is no other than philosophy and theology embodied? Why should we fear to be crushed by savage elements, we who are made up of the same elements? Let us build to the beautiful necessity, which makes men brave in believing that he cannot shun a danger that is appointed, nor incur one that is not, to the necessity which rudely or softly educates them to the perception that there are no contingencies, the law rules throughout existence, a law which is not intelligent, but intelligence, not personal nor impersonal, it disdains words and passes understanding, it dissolves persons, it vivifies nature. It solicits the pure in heart to draw on all its omnipotence. 
End of Fate. Recording by Daniel Christopher June. Visit my website at www.perfectidius.com. That's perfect, I D I U S dot com. Essay 2 of Conduct of Life by Ralph Waldo Emerson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Daniel Christopher June. Power. His tongue was framed to music, and his hand was armed with skill. His face was the mold of beauty, and his heart the throne of will. There is not yet any inventory of a man's faculties, any more than a Bible of his opinions. Who shall set a limit to the influence of a human being? There are men who, by their sympathetic attractions, carry nations with them, and lead the activity of the human race. If there be such a tie that, whether the mind of man goes, nature will accompany him, perhaps there are men whose magnetisms are of that force to draw material and elemental powers, and, where they appear, immense instrumentalities organize around them. Life is a search after power. And this is an element with which the world is so saturated, there is no chink or crevice in which it is not lodged, that no honest seeking goes unrewarded. A man should prize events and possessions as the ore in which his fine mineral is found, and he can well afford to let events and possessions, and the breath of the body go, if their value has been added to him in the shape of power. If he have secured the elixir, he can spare the wide gardens from which it was distilled. A cultivated man, wise to know and bold to perform, is the end to which nature works, and the education of the will is a flowering result of all this geology and astronomy. All successful men have agreed on one thing. They were causationalists. They believed that things went not by luck, but by law, that there was not a weak or a cracked link in the chain of that joins the first and the last of things. A belief in causality, or a strict connection between every trifle and the principles of being, and, in consequence, belief in compensation, or that nothing is got for nothing, characterizes all valuable minds, and must control every effort that is made by an industrious one. The most valiant men are the best believers in the tensions of the laws. All the great captains, said Bonaparte, have performed vast achievements by conforming with the rules of the art, by adjusting efforts to obstacles. The key to the age may be this, or that, or the other, as the young orators describe. The key to all ages is imbecility. Imbecility in the vast majority of men, at all times, and even in heroes, in all but certain eminent moments. Victims of gravity, customs, and fear. This gives strength to the strong, that the multitude have no habit of self-reliance or original action. We must reckon success a constitutional trait. Courage, the old physicians taught, and their meaning holds if their physiology is a little mythical. Courage, or the degree of life, is the degree of circulation of the blood in the arteries. During passion, anger, fury, trials of strength, wrestling, fighting, a large amount of blood is collected in the arteries, the maintenance of bodily strength requiring it, and but little is sent into the veins. This condition is constant with intrepid persons. Where the arteries hold their blood is courage and adventure possible. Where they pour it unrestrained into the veins, the spirit is low and feeble. For performance of great mark, it needs extraordinary health. If Eric is in robust health, and has slept well, and is at the top of his condition, and thirty years old, at his departure from Greenland he will steer west, and his ships will reach Newfoundland. But take out Eric, and put in a stronger and bolder man, Bjorn or Thornfin, and the ships will, with just as much ease, sail six hundred, one thousand, fifteen hundred miles further, and reach Labrador and New England. There is no chance in results. With adults, as with children, one class enter cordially into the game, and whirl with a whirling world, and others have cold hands and remain bystanders, or are only dragged in by the humor and vivacity of those who can carry a dead weight. The first wealth is health. Sickness is poor-spirited and cannot serve anyone. It must husband its resources to live. But health and fullness answers its own ends, and has to spare, runs over, and inundates the neighborhoods and creeks of other men's necessities. All power is of one kind, a sharing of the nature of the world. The mind that is parallel with the laws of nature will be in the current of events, and strong with their strength. One man is made of the same stuff of which the events are made, is in sympathy with the course of things, can predict it. Whatever befalls, befalls him first, so that he is equal to whatever shall happen. A man who knows men can talk well on politics, trade, law, war, religion, for everywhere men are led in the same manners. The advantage of a strong pulse is not to be supplied by any labor, art, or concert. 
It is like the climate, which easily rears a crop, which no glass, or irrigation, or tillage, or manures can elsewhere rival. It is like the opportunity of a city like New York or Constantinople, which needs no diplomacy to force capital or genius to labor to it. They come of themselves as the waters flow to it, so a broad, healthy, massive understanding seems to lie on the shore of unseen rivers, of unseen oceans, which are covered with barks, that night and day are drifted to this point. That is poured into its laps, which other men are plotting for. It is in everybody's secret, anticipates everybody's discovery, and if it did not command every fact of the genius and the scholar, it is because it is large and sluggish, and does not think them worth the exertion which you do. This affirmative force is in one, and is not in another, as one horse has a spring in him, and another in the whip. On the neck of the young man, says Hafiz, sparkles no gem so gracious as enterprise. And pour it into any stationary district, as into an old Dutch population in New York or Pennsylvania, or among the planters of Virginia, a colony of hardy Yankees, with seething brains, heads full of steam hammers, pulley, crank, and tooth wheel, and everything will begin to shine with values. What enhancement to all the water on land in England is the rival of James Watt or Brunel? In every company there is not only the active and passive sex, but in both men and women a deeper and more important sex of mind, namely the inventive or creative class of both men and women, and the uninventive or accepting class. Each plus man represents his set, and if he have the accidental advantage of personal ascendancy, which applies neither more nor less of talent, but merely the temperamental or taming eye of the soldier or schoolmaster, which one has and one has not, as one has a black mustache and one a blonde, then quite easily and without envy or resistance all his coadjutors and feeders will admit his right to absorb them. The merchant works by bookkeeper and cashier, the lawyer's authorities are hunted up by clerks, the geologist reports the surveys of his subalterns, Commander Wilkes appropriates the results of all the naturalists attached to his expedition, the Walsons statue is finished by stone cutters. Dumas has journeymen, and Shakespeare was a theatre manager, and used the labour of many young men, as well as the playbooks. There is always room for a man of force, and he makes room for many. Society is a troop of thinkers, and the best heads among them take the best places. A feeble man can see the farms that are fenced and tilled, the houses that are built. The strong man sees the possible houses and farms. His eye makes the states, as fast as the sun breeds clouds. When a new boy comes into school, a man travels and encounters strangers every day, or when into any old club a newcomer is domesticated, the happens which befalls when a strange ox is driven into a pen or pasture where cattle are kept. There is at once a trial strength between the best pair of horns and the newcomer, and is settled thenceforth which is the leader. So now there is a measuring of strength, very courteous but decisive, and an acquiescence thenceforth when the two meet. Each reads his fate in the other's eyes. The weaker party finds that none of his information or wit quite fits this occasion. He thought he knew this or that. He finds that he omitted to learn the end of it. Nothing that he knows will quite hit the mark, whilst all the rival's arrows are good and well thrown. But if he knows all the facts, then the encyclopedia would not help him. For this is an affair of presence of mind, of attitude, of aplomb. The opponent has the sun and the wind, and every cast the choice of weapon and mark. And when he himself is matched with some other antagonist, his own shafts fly well and hit. "'Tis a question of stomach and constitution. "'The second man is as good as the first, perhaps better, "'but has not the stoutness of stomach as the first has, "'and so his wit seems overfine and underfine. "'Health is good, power, life that resists disease, "'poison all enemies, and is conservative as well as creative. "'Here is question, every spring, whether to graft with wax "'or whether with clay, whether to whitewash or potash, "'or to prune, but the one point is a thrifty tree.' A good tree, that agrees with the soil, will grow in spite of blight, or bug, or pruning, or neglect, by night and by day, in all weathers and all treatments. Vivacity, leadership, must be had, and we are not allowed to be nice in choosing. We must fetch the pump with dirty water, if clean cannot be had. If we will make bread, we must have contagion, yeast, emptyings, or what not, to induce fermentation into the dough, as a torpid artist seeks inspiration at any cost, by virtue or by vice, by friend or by fiend, by prayer or by wine. And we have a certain instinct that where is great amount of life, though gross and peccant, it has its own checks and purifications, and will be found at last in harmony with moral laws. We watch in children with pathetic interest the degree in which they possess the recuperative force. When they are hurt by us or by each other, or go to the bottom of the class, or miss the annual prize, or are beaten in the game, if they lose heart, remember the mischance in their chamber at home, they have a serious check. But if they have the buoyancy and resistance that preoccupies them with new interests in the new moment, the wound cicatrize, and the fiber is the tougher for the hurt. One comes to value this plus health when he sees that all difficulties vanish before it. 
a timid man listening to the alarmists in a Congress and in the newspapers and observing the profligacy of the party, sectional interests urged with a fury which shuts his eyes to consequences, with a mind made up to desperate extremities, ballot of one hand and rifle on the other, might easily believe that he and his country have seen their best days, and he hardens himself the best he can against the coming ruin. But, after this, has been foretold with equal confidence fifty times, and government six percents have not declined a quarter of a mill, he discovers that the enormous elements of strength which are here in play make our politics unimportant. Personal power, freedom, and the resources of nature strain every faculty of every citizen. We prosper with such vigor that, like thrifty trees which grow in spite of ice, lice, mice, and borers, so we do not suffer from the profligate swarms that fatten on the national treasury. The huge animals nourish huge parasites, and the rancor of the disease attests the strength of the Constitution. The same energy in the Greek demos drew the remark that the evils of the popular government appear greater than they are. There is compensation for them in spirit and energy it awakens. The rough and ready style which belongs to a people of sailors, foresters, farmers, and mechanics has its advantages. Power educates the potentate. As long as our people quote English standards, they dwarf their own proportions. A Western lawyer of eminence said to me he wished it were a penal offense to bring an English law book into a court in this country. So pernicious had he found in his experience a deference to English precedent. The very commerce has only an English meaning, and is pinched to the cramped exigencies of English experience. The commerce of rivers, the commerce of railroads, and who knows but the commerce of air balloons, must add an American extension to the pond hole of admiralty. As long as our people quote English standards, they will miss the sovereignty of power. But let these rough riders, legislators in shirt sleeves, Hoosier, Sucker, Wolverine, Badger, or whatever hardhead Arkansas, Oregon, or Utah sons, half orator, half assassin, to represent its wrath and cupidity at Washington. Let these drive as they may, and the disposition of territories and public lands, the necessity of balancing and keeping at bay the snarling majorities of German, Irish, and of native millions, will bestow promptness, address, and reason at last on our buffalo hunter, and authority and majesty of manners. The instinct of the people is right. Men expect from good Whigs, put into office by the respectability of the country, much less skill to deal with Mexico, Spain, Britain, or with our own malcontent members, than with some strong and transgressor like Jefferson or Jackson, who first conquers his own government, and then uses the same genius to conquer the foreigner. The senators who descended from Mr. Polk's Mexican War were not those who knew better, but those who, from political position, could afford it, not Webster, but Benton and Calhoun. This power, to be sure, is not clothed in satin. It is the power of lynch law, of soldiers and pirates, and it bullies the peaceable and loyal. But it brings its own antidote. And here is my point, that all kinds of power usually emerge at the same time, good energy and bad, power of mind with physical health, the ecstasies of devotion with the exasperations of debauchery. The same elements are always present, only sometimes these conspicuous and sometimes those. What was yesterday foreground being today background what was surface, playing now a not less effective part as basis. The longer the drought lasts, the more is the atmosphere surcharged with water. The faster the ball falls to the sun, the force to fly off is by so much augmented, and in morals, wild liberty breeds iron conscience. Natures with great impulses have great resources, and return from far. In politics, the sons of Democrats will be Whigs, whilst red republicanism in the father is a spasm of nature to engender an intolerable tyrant in the next age. On the other hand, conservatism, ever more timorous and narrow, disgusts the children and drives them for a mouthful of fresh air into radicalism. Those who have most of this coarse energy, the bruisers, who have run the gauntlet of caucus and tavern through this country and the state, have their own vices, but they have good nature of strength and courage. Fierce and unscrupulous, they are usually frank and direct, and above falsehood. Our politics falls into bad hands, and churchmen and men of refinement, it seems agreed, are not fit persons to send to Congress. Politics is a deleterious profession, like some poisonous handicrafts. Men in power have no opinions, but may be cheap for any opinion, for any purpose, and if it be a question between the most civil and the most forcible, I lean to the last. These hoosiers and suckers are but really better than the sniveling opposition. Their wrath is at least as bold and manly cast. They see, against the unanimous declarations of the people, how much crime the people will bear. They proceed from step to step, and they have calculated but too justly upon their excellencies, the New England governors, and upon the honors, the New England legislators. The message of the governors and the resolutions of the legislators are a proverb for expressing a sham virtuous indignation, which, in the course of events, is sure to be belied. 
In trade, also, this energy usually carries a trace of ferocity. Philanthropic or religious bodies do not commonly make their executive officers out of saints. The communities hitherto founded by socialists, the Jesuits, the party royalists, the American communities of New Harmony, of Brook Farm, of Zorra, are only possible by installing Judas as steward. The rest of the offices may be filled by good burgesses. The pious and charitable proprietor has a form and not quite so pious and charitable. The most amiable of country gentlemen has a certain pleasure in the teeth of the bulldog, which guards his orchard. Of the Shaker Society, it was formerly a sort of proverb in the country, that they always sent the devil to market. And in representations of the deity, painting, poetry, and popular religion have ever drawn from the wrath of hell. It is an esoteric doctrine of society, that a little wickedness is good to make muscle, as if conscience were not good for hands and legs, as if poor decayed formless of law and order cannot run like wild goats, wolves, and conies. That is, there is a use in medicine for poisons, so the world cannot move without rogues. That public spirit and the ready hand are as well found among the malignants. It is not very rare the coincidence of sharp private and political practice with public spirit and good neighborhood. I knew a burly Boniface, who for many years kept a public house in one of the rural capitals. He was a knave whom the town could ill spare. He was a social, vascular creature, grasping and selfish. There was no crime which he did not or could not commit, but he made good friends with the selectmen, served them with his best chop when they supped at his house, and also with his honor the judge. He was very cordial, grasping his hand. He introduced all the friends, male and female, into the town, and united in his person the functions of bully, incendiary, swindler, barkeeper, and bu burglar. He girdled the trees and cut off the horses' tails of the temperance people in the night. He led the rummies and radicals in town meetings with a speech. Meantime he was civil, fat, and easy in his house, and precisely the most public-spirited citizen. He was active in getting the roads repaired and planted with shade trees. He subscribed for the fountains, the gas, and the telegraph. He introduced the new horse-rake, the new scraper, the baby-jumper, and what not, that Connecticut sends to the admiring citizens. He did this the easier, that the peddler stopped at his house and paid his keeping. Whilst thus the energy for originating and executing work deforms itself by excess, and so our axe chaps off our own fingers, this evil is not without remedy. All the elements whose aid man calls on will sometimes become his masters, especially those of most subtle force. Shall he then renounce steam, fire, and electricity, or shall he learn to deal with them? The rule for this class of agencies is, all plus is good, only put in the right place. Men of this surcharge of arterial blood cannot live on nuts, herb teas, and allergies, cannot read novels and play whist, cannot satisfy all their wants at the Thursday lecture or the Boston Athenaeum. They pine for adventure, and must go to Pike's Peak, had rather die at the hatchet of a Pawnee than sit all day every day at a counting-room desk. They are made for war, for the sea, for mining, hunting, and clearing, for hair-breadth adventure, huge risks, and the joy of eventful living. Some men cannot endure an hour of calm at sea. I remember poor Malay Cook, on board at Liverpool Packet, who, when the wind blew a gale, could not contain his joy. Blow, he cried, me do tell you blow. Their friends and governors must see that some vent for their explosive complexion is provided. The roisters who are destined for infamy at home, if sent to Mexico, will cover you with glory and come back heroes and generals. There are Oregons, Californias, and exploring expeditions enough for pertaining to the America, to find them in file to gnaw, and in crocodiles to eat. The young English are fine animals, full of blood, and when they have no wars to breathe, they ride as valors, and they seek for travelers as dangerous as war, diving into maelstroms, swimming in hellspons, wading up the snowy Himalaya, hunting lion, rhinoceros, elephant in South Africa, gypsying with burro in Spain and Algiers, riding alligators in South America with Waterton, utilizing Bedouin, Sheik, and Paca with Layard, yachting amongst the icebergs of Lancaster Sound, peeping into craters on the equator, or running on the creases of Malays and Borneo. The excess of virility has the same importance in general history as in private and industrious life. Strong race or strong individuals rest at last on natural forces, which are best in the savage, who, like the beasts around them, is still in reception of the milk from the teats of nature. Cut off the connection between any of our works and this aboriginal source, and the work is shallow. The people lean on this, and the mob is not quite so bad an argument as some people say, for it has this good side. March without the people, said a French deputy from the tribune and you march into night. Their instincts are a finger pointing at providence, always turning toward real benefit. But when you espouse an Orleans party, or a Bourbon, or a Mantle and Bart party, or any other but an organic party, though you mean well, you have a personality instead of a principle, which will inevitably drag you into a corner. 
The best antidotes of this force are to be had from savage life, in explorers, soldiers, and buccaneers. But who cares for the falling-outs of assassins, and fights of bears, and grindings of icebergs? Physical force has no value where there is nothing else. Snow and snowbanks, fire and volcanoes, and solfateras is cheap. The luxury of ice is in tropical countries, and midsummer days. The luxury of fire is to have a little on our hearth, and electricity, not volleys of charged cloud, but the manageable stream of the battery wires. So of spirit or energy. The rest or remains of it in the civil and moral man are worth all the cannibals in the Pacific. In history, the great moment is when the savage is just ceasing to be a savage, with all his hairy pelagic strength directed in the opening sense of beauty, and you have a Pericles or a Phidias not yet passed over into the corinthian civility everything good in nature and the world is in that moment of transition and when the swarthy juices still flow plentifully from nature but their astringency or acidity is got out by ethics and humanity the triumphs of peace have been in some proximity to war whilst the hand was still familiar with the sword hilt whilst the habits of the camp were still visible in the port and complexion of the gentleman his intellectual power culminated the compression and tension of these stern conditions is a training for the finest and softest arts, and can rarely be compensated in tranquil times, except for some analogous vigor drawn from occupations as hardy as war. We say that success is constitutional, depends on a plus condition of mind and body, on power of work, on courage, that it is a main efficacy in carrying on the world, and, though rarely found in the right state for an article of commerce, but oftener in the supersaturate or excess, which makes it a dangerous and destructive, yet it cannot be spared, and must be had in that form, an absorbance provided to take off its edge. The affirmative class monopolize the homage of mankind. They originate and execute all the great feats. What a force was coiled up in the skull of Napoleon. Of the sixty thousand men making his army at Elu, it seems some thirty thousand were thieves and burglars. The men whom, in peaceful communities, we hold if we can, with iron at their legs, in prisons, under the muskets of sentinels, this man dealt with, hand to hand, dragged them to their duty, and won his victories by their bayonets. This aboriginal might give us a surprising pleasure, when it appears under conditions of supreme refinement, as in the proficience of high art. When Michelangelo was forced to paint the Sistine Chapel in fresco, of which art he knew nothing, he went down to the Pope's garden, behind the Vatican, and with a shovel dug out ochres, red and yellow, and mixed them with glue and water with his own hands, and having after many trials at last suited himself, climbed his ladders and painted away, week after week, month after month, the sibyls and prophets. He surpassed his successors in rough vigor, as much as in purity of intellect and refinement. He was not crushed by his one picture, left unfinished at last. Michael was wont to draw his figures first in skeleton, then to clothe them with flesh, and lastly to drape them. Ah, said a brave painter to me, thinking on these things, if a man has failed, you will find he has dreamed instead of working. There are no ways to success in our art but to take off your coat, grind paint, and work like a digger on the railroad, all day, every day. Success goes thus invariably with a certain plus or positive power. An ounce of power must balance an ounce of weight. And though a man cannot return into his mother's womb and be born in with a new amount of vivacity, yet there are two economies which are the best secundia which the case admits. The first is the stopping off decisively of our miscellaneous activity, and concentrating our force on one or a few points. As a gardener, by severe pruning, forces the sap of the tree into one or two vigorous limbs, instead of suffering it to spindle into a sheaf of twigs. Enlarge not thy destiny, said the oracle. Endeavor not to do more than is given thee in charge. The one prudence in life is concentration, the one evil is dissipation, and it makes no difference whether our dissipations are coarse or fine, property and its cares, friends and a social habit or politics, or music or feasting. Everything is good which takes away one plaything and delusion more, and drives us home to add one stroke of faithful work. Friends, books, pictures, lower duties, talents, flatteries, hopes, all our distractions which cause oscillations in our giddy balloon, and make a good poise in a straight course impossible. You must elect your work. You shall take what your brain can, and drop off all the rest. Only so can that amount of vital force accumulate, which can make the step from knowing to doing. No matter how much faculty of idle seeing a man has, the step from knowing to doing is rarely taken. It is a step out of the chalk circle of imbecility into fruitfulness. Many an artist lacking this lacks all. He sees the masculine Angelo or Cellini with despair. He too is up to nature in the first cause in his thought. But the spasm to collect and swing his whole being into one act he has not. The poet Campbell said, A man accustomed to work was equal to any achievement he resolved on, 
and that for himself necessity not inspiration was the prompter of his muse concentration is a secret of strength in politics and war and trade in short in all management of human affairs one of the high anecdotes of the world is the reply of newton to the inquiry how he had been able to achieve his discoveries by always intending my mind or if you have a text from politics take this from plutarch there was in the whole city but one street in which pericles was ever seen the street which led to the market-place and the council-house he declined all invitations to banquets and all gay assemblies and company during the whole period of his administration he never dined at the table of a friend or if we see an example from trade i hope said a good man to rothschild your children are not too fond of money and business i am sure you would not wish that i am sure i would wish that i wish them to give mind soul heart and body to business that is the way to be happy it requires a great deal of boldness and a great deal of caution to make a great fortune and when you have got it it requires ten times as much wit to keep it if i were to listen to all the projects proposed to me i should ruin myself very soon stick to one business young man stick to your brewery he said this to a young buxton and you will be the great brewer of london be brewer and banker and merchant and manufacturer and you will soon be in the gazette many men are knowing many are apprehensive and tenacious but they do not rush to a decision but in our flowing affairs a decision must be made the best if you can but any is better than none there are twenty ways of going to a point and one is the shortest but set out at once on one a man who has a presence of mind which can bring to him on the instant all he knows is worth for action a dozen men who know as much but can only bring it to light slowly the good speaker in the house is not the man who knows the theory of parliamentary tactics but the man who decides off-hand the good judge is not he who does hair-splitting justice to every allegation but who aiming at substantial justice rules something intelligible for the guidance of suitors the good lawyer is not the man who has nigh to every side an angle of contingency but qualifies all his qualifications but he who throws himself on your part so heartily that he can get you out of a scrape dr johnson said in one of his flowing sentences miserable beyond all names of wretchedness is that unhappy pair who are doomed to reduce beforehand to the principles of abstract reason all the details of each domestic day there are cases where little can be said and much must be done the second substitute for temperament is drill the power of use and routine the hack is a better roadster than the arab barb in chemistry the galvan extreme slow and continuous is equal in power to electric spark and is in our arts a better agent so in human action against a spasm of energy we offset the continuity of drill we spread the same amount of force over much time instead of condensing it into a moment tis the same ounce of gold here in the ball and there in the leaf at west point colonel buford the chief engineer pounded with a hammer on the trunions of a cannon until he broke them off he fired a piece of ordnance some hundred times in swift succession until it burst now which stroke broke the trunion every stroke which blast burst the piece every blast diligence passe sens henry the eighth was wont to say or great as drill john Campbell said that the worst provincial company of actors could go through a play better than the best amateur company basil hall likes to show that the worst regular troops will beat the best volunteers practices nine-tenths a course of mobs is good practice for orators all the great speakers were bad speakers at first stepping it through england for seven years made cobden a consummate debater stuffing it through new england for twice seven trained wendell phillips the way to learn german is to read the same dozen pages over and over a hundred times till you know every word and particle in them and can pronounce and repeat them by heart no genius can recite a ballad at first reading so well as mediocrity can at the fifteenth or twentieth reading the rule for hospitality and irish help is to have the same dinner every day throughout the year at last mrs o'shignessy learns to cook it to a nicety and the host learns to carve it and the guests are well served a humorous friend of mine thinks that the reason why nature is so perfect in her arts and gets up such inconceivably fine sunsets is that she had learned how at last by dint of doing the same thing first very often cannot one converse better on a topic in which one has experience than the one which is new men whose opinion is valued on change are only such as have a special experience and off that ground their opinion is not valuable more are made good by exercitation than by nature said democritus the friction in nature is so enormous that we cannot spare any power it is not a question to express our thought to elect our way but to overcome resistances to the medium and material in everything we do hence the use of drill and the worthlessness of amateurs to cope with practitioners six hours every day at the piano only to give facility of touch six hours a day at painting only to give command to the odious materials oil ochres and brushes the masters say that they know a master in music only by seeing the pose of his hand on the keys 
so difficult and vital an act is the command of the instrument to have learned to use the tools by thousands of manipulations to have learned the arts of reckoning by endless adding and dividing is the power of the mechanic and the clerk i remarked in england in the confirmation of a frequent experience at home that in literary circles the men of trust and consideration bookmakers editors university deans and professors bishops too were by no means of the largest literary talent but usually of low and ordinary intellectuality with a sort of mercantile activity and working talent indifferent hacks and mediocrities tower by pushing their forces to a lucrative point or by working power over multitudes of superior men in old as in new england i have not forgotten that there are sublime considerations will limit the value of talent and superficial success we can easily overpraise the vulgar hero there are sources in which we have yet not drawn i know what i abstain from i adjourn what i have to say on this topic to the chapters on culture and worship but this force of spirit by the means relied on by nature for bringing a work of the day about as far as we attach importance to a household life and the prizes of the world we must respect that and i hold that an economy may be applied to it it is much a subject of exact law and arithmetic as fluids and gases are it may be husbanded or wasted every man is efficient only as he is a container or vessel of this force and never was any signal act or achievement in history but by this expenditure this is not gold but the gold maker not the fame but the exploit if these forces and this husbandry are within reach of our will and the laws of them can be read we infer that all success and all conceivable benefits for man is also first or last within his reach and has its own sublime economies by which it may be attained the world is mathematical and has no casualty in all its vast and flowing curve success has no more eccentricity than the jinjim or muslim we weave in our wills I know no more affecting lesson to our busy, plodding New England brains than to go into one of the factories with which we align the watercourses in the States. A man hardly knows how much he is a machine until he begins to make telegraph, loom, press, and locomotive in his own image. But in these he is forced to leave out his follies and hindrances, so that when we go to the mill, the machine is more moral than we. Let a man dare go to the loom and see if he be equal to it. Let machine confront machine and see how they come out. The world mill is more complex than the calico mill, and the architect less stooped. The world mill is more complex than the calico mill, and the architect stoop less. And the ginger mill, a broken thread or a shred, spoils the web through a piece of a hundred yards, and is traced back to the girl that wove it, and lessens her wages. The stockholder, on being shown this, rubs his hand with delight. Are you so cunning, Mr. Profit Loss, and do you expect to swindle your master employer in the web you weave? A day is a more magnificent cloth than a muslin. The mechanism that makes it is infinitely cunninger, and you shall not conceal the sleazy, fraudulent, rotten hours you have slipped into the piece, nor fear that any honest thread, or straighter steel, or an inflexible shaft will not testify in the web. End of Power Recording by Daniel Christopher June www.perfectidius.com That's perfectidius.com Wealth, Essay 3 of Conduct of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Christopher June. Conduct of Life by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Fate. Who shall tell you what did befall far away in time when once, over the lifeless ball, hung idle stars and suns? What God the elements obeyed, wings of what wind the lichen bore, wafting the puny seeds of power, which lodged in rocks the rock abraid. And while the primal pioneer knew the strong task to it assigned, patient though heaven's enamored year, to build in matter home for mind. From air of creeping centuries drew, this matted thicket low and wide, this must the leaves of ages strew, the granite slab of cloth and hide, ere wheat can wave its golden pride. What smiths and in what furnace rolled, in dizzy aeons, dim and mute, the reeling brain can ill compute, copper and iron, lead and gold, what oldest star the fame can save, of race perishing to pave, the planet with a floor of lime, dust is their pyramid and mole, who saw what firms and palms were pressed under the tumbling mountain's breasts, in the safe herbal of the coal. But when the quarry means were piled, all is waste and worthless till, arrives the wise selecting will, and out of the slime and chaos wit, draws the threads of fair and fit, then temples rose in towns and marts, the shop of toil, the hall of arts, then flew the sails across the seas to feed the north from tropic trees. 
the strong wind wove the torrent span where they were bid the rivers ran new slaves fulfilled the poet's dream galvanic wire strong-shouldered stream then docks were built and crops were stored and ingots added to the hoard but though light-handed man forget remembering matter pays her debt still through her motes and masses draw electric thrills and tides of law which bring the strength of nature wild to the conscience of a child as soon as a stranger is introduced into any company one of the first questions which all wish to have answered is how does that man get his living and with reason he is no whole man until he knows how to earn a blameless livelihood society is barbarous until every industrious man can get his living without dishonest customs every man is a consumer and ought to be a producer he fails to make his place good in the world unless he not only pays his debt but also adds something to the commonwealth nor can he do justice to his genius without making some larger demand on the world than a bare subsistence he is by constitution expensive and needs to be rich wealth has its source in applications of the mind to nature from the rudest strokes of spade and axe up to the last secrets of art intimate ties subsist between thought and all production because a better order is equivalent to vast amounts of brute labor the forces and resistances are nature's but the mind acts in bringing things from where they bound to where they are wanted in wise combining in directing the practice of the useful arts and in the creation of finer values by fine art by eloquence by song or the reproductions of memory wealth is in applications of mind to nature and the art of getting rich consists not in industry much less than saving but in better order in timeliness in being at the right spot one man has stronger arms or longer legs another sees by the course of streams and grows of markets where land will be wanted makes a clearing of the river goes to sleep and wakes up rich steam is no stronger now than it was a hundred years ago but is put to better use a clever fellow was acquainted with the expansive force of steam he also saw the wealth of wheat and grass rotting in michigan then he cunningly screws on the steam pipe to the wheat crop puff now o steam the steam puffs and expands as before but this time it is dragging all michigan on its back to hungry new york and hungry england coal lay in ledges under the ground since the flood until a laborer with pick and windlass brings it to the surface we may well call it black diamonds every basket is power and civilization for coal is a partible climate it carries the heat of the tropics to labrador and the polar circle and is the means of transporting itself whithersoever it is wanted watt stephenson whispered in the ear of mankind their secret that half ounce of coal will draw two tons a mile and coal carries coal by rail and by boat to make canada as warm as calcutta and with its comfort brings its industrial power when the farmer's peaches are taken from under the tree and carried into town they have a new look and a hundredfold value over the fruit which grew on the same bough and lies fulsomely on the ground the craft of the merchant is this bringing things to where it abounds to where it is costly wealth begins in a tight roof that keeps the rain and wind out in a good pump that yields that you plenty of sweet water in two clean suits so to change your dress when you are wet in dry sticks to burn in a good double wick lamp in three meals in a horse or a locomotive to cross the land in the boat to cross the sea in tools to work with in books to read and so in giving on all sides by tools and auxiliaries the greatest possible extension of our powers as if it added feet and hands and eyes and blood the length of the days and knowledge and good will wealth begins with these articles of necessity and here we must recite the iron law which nature thunders in these northern climates first she requires that each man should feed himself if happily his father has left him no inheritance he must go to work and by making his wants less or his gains more he must draw himself out of the state of pain and insult in which she forces the beggar to lie she gives him no rest until this is done she starves taunts and torments him takes away warmth laughter sleep friends and daylight until he has fought his way for his own loaf then less peremptorily and still with sting enough she urges him to the acquisition of such things as belong to him every warehouse and shop window every fruit tree and every thought of every hour opens a new want to him which it concerns his power and dignity to gratify it is of no use to argue the wants down the philosophers have laid the greatness of man in making his wants few but will a man content himself with a hut and a handful of dried peas? he is born to be rich he is thoroughly related and is tempted out by his appetites and fancies to the conquest of this or that piece of nature until he finds his well-being and the use of his planet and of more planets than his own wealth requires beside the crust of bread on the roof a freedom of the city a freedom of the earth traveling machinery the benefits of science music and fine arts the best culture and the best company he is the rich man who can avail himself of all men's faculties he is the richest who knows how to draw a benefit from the labors of the greatest number of men of men in distant countries and in past times the same correspondence that is between thirst and the stomach 
the water and the spring, exists between the whole man and the whole of nature. The elements offer their service to him. The sea, washing the equator and the poles, offers its perilous aid, and the power and the empire that follow it, day by day to his craft and audacity. Beware of me, it says, but if you can hold me, I am the key to all the lands. Fire offers, on its side, an equal power. Fire, steam, lightning, gravity, ledges of rock, mines of iron, lead, quicksilver, tin, and gold. Forests of all woods, fruits of all climates, animals of all habits, the power of tillage, the fabric of its chemical laboratory, the webs of its looms, the masculine draught of his locomotives, the talismans of his machine shop, all grand and subtle things, minerals, gases, ethers, passions, war, trade, government, are his natural playmates, and, according to the excellence of the machinery in each human being, is his attraction for the instruments he is to employ. The world is his tool chest, and he is successful, or his education is carried out in so far as the marriage of his faculties with nature, or the degree in which he takes up things into himself. The strong race is strong in these terms. The Saxons are the merchants of the world, now, for a thousand years, the leading race, and by nothing more than their quality of personal independence, and in its special modification, pecuniary independence. No reliance for bread and games on the government, no clanship, no patriarchal style of living by the revenues of chief, no marrying on, no system of clientship suits them, but every man must pay his scot. The English are prosperous and peaceable, with their habit of considering that every man must take care of himself, and he has himself to thank if he do not maintain and improve his position in society. The subject of economy mixes itself with morals, inasmuch as it is a peremptory point of virtue that a man's independence be secured. Poverty demoralizes. A man in debt is so far a slave, and Wall Street thinks it easy for a millionaire to be a man of his word, a man of honor, but that, in failing circumstance, no man can be relied on to keep up his integrity. And when one observes in the hotels and palaces of our Atlantic capitals the habit of expense, the riot of the senses, the absence of bonds, clanship, fellow feeling of any kind, he feels that, when a man or woman is driven to the wall, the chances of integrity are frightfully diminished, as if virtue were coming to a luxury which few could afford, or, as Burke said, at a market almost too high for humanity. He may fix his inventory of necessities and his enjoyments on what scale he pleases, but if he wishes the power and privilege of thought, the chalking out of his own career, and having society in his own terms, he must bring his wants within his proper power to satisfy. The manly part is to do with might and main what you can do. The world is full of fops who never did anything, and who have persuaded beauties and men of genius to wear their fop livery, and these will deliver the fop opinion that it is not respectable to be seen earning a living. It is much more respectable to spend without earning. And this doctrine of the snake will come also from the elect sons of light, for wise men are not wise at all hours, and will speak five times from their taste or their humor to one of their reason. The brave workman, who might betray his feelings of in his manners, if he did not succumb in his practice, must replace the grace or elegance fortified by the merit of the work done, no matter whether he makes shoes or statutes or laws. It is the privilege of any human work which is well done to invest the doer with a certain haughtiness. He can well afford not to conciliate, whose faithful work will answer for him. The mechanic at his bench carries a quiet heart and assured manners, and deals on even terms with men of any condition. The artist has made his picture so true that it disconcerts criticism. The statue is so beautiful that it contracts no stain from the market, and makes the market a silent gallery for itself. The case of the young lawyer was pitiful to discuss, a paltry matter of buttons and tweezer cases, but the determined youth saw in it an aperture to insert his dangerous wedges, made the insignificance of the thing forgotten, and gave fame by a sense of energy to the name and affairs of the Tilton snuff-box factory. Society in large towns is babyish, and wealth is made a toy. The life of pleasure is so ostentatious that a shallow observer must believe that this is the agreed best use of wealth, and whatever is pretended, it ends in cosseting. But if this were the main use of surplus capital, it would bring us to the barricades, burned towns, and tomahawks presently. Men of sense esteem wealth to be the assimilation of nature to themselves, the converting of the sap and juices of the planet to the incarnation and nutriment of their design. Power is what they want, not candy. Power to execute their design. Power to give legs and feet. Form and actuality to their thought, which, to a clear-sighted man, appears to the end for which the universe exists, and all its resources might be well applied. Columbus thinks that the sphere is a problem for practical navigation, as well as for closet geometry, and looks on all kings and peoples as cowardly landsmen until they dare fit him out. Few men on the planet have more truly belonged to it, but he was forced to leave much of his map blank. His successors inherited his map, and inherited his fury to complete it. So the men of the mine, telegraph, mill, map, and survey, the monomaniacs who talk of their projects in marts and offices and entreat men to subscribe, how did their factories get built? 
how did North America get netted with iron rails, except by the importunity of these orators, who dragged all the prudent men in? Is party the madness of many for the gain of the few? This speculative genius is the madness of the few for the gain of the world. The projectors are sacrificed, but the public is the gainer. Each of these idealists, working after his thought, would make it tyrannical if he could. He is met and antagonized by other speculators, as hot as he. The equilibrium is preserved by their counteractions, so one tree keeps down another in the forest, that it may not absorb all the sap in the ground. In the supply and nature of railroad presidents, copper miners, grand junctioners, smoke burners, fire annihilators, etc., is limited by the same law which keeps the proportion in the law of carbon, of alum, and of hydrogen. To be rich is to have a ticket of admission to the master works and chief men of each race. It is to have the sea by voyaging, to visit the mountains, Niagara, the Nile, the desert, Rome, Paris, Constantinople, to see galleries, libraries, arsenals, manufactories. The reader of Humboldt's Cosmos follows the marches of man whose eyes, ears, and mind are armed by all of science, arts, and implements, which mankind have anywhere accumulated, and who is using these to add to the stock. So it is with Dunnan, Beckford, Belzoni, Wilkinson, Laird, Kane, Lepsius, and Livingston. The rich man, said Saadi, is everywhere expected and at home. The rich take up something more of the world into man's life. They include the country as well as the town, the ocean side, the white hills, the far west, and the old European homesteads of man, and the notion of available material. The world is his, who has money to go over it. He arrives at the seashore, and the sumptuous ship has floored and carpeted for him the stormy Atlantic, and made it a luxurious hotel amid the horrors and tempests. The Persians say, "'Tis the same to him who wears a shoe as if the whole world were covered in leather." Kings are said to have long arms, but every man should have long arms, and should pluck his living, his instruments, his power, and his knowing from the sun, moon, and stars. Is not then the demand for it to be rich legitimate? Yet I have never seen a rich man. I have never seen a man as rich as all men ought to be, or with an adequate command of nature. The pulpit and the press have many commonplaces denouncing the thirst for wealth. But if men should take these moralists at the world, and leave off aiming to be rich, the moralists would rush to rekindle at all hazards this love of power in the people, lest civilization should be undone. Men are urged by their ideas to acquire the command over nature. Ages derive a culture from the wealth of Roman Caesars, Leal Tents, magnificent kings of France, grand dukes of Tuscany, dukes of Devonshire, Townleys, Vernons, and Peels in England, or whatever great proprietors. It is interest of all men that, sh that should be Vatican's and Louvre's, full of noble works of art. British museums and French gardens of plants, Philadelphia academies and natural history, Boldan, Ambrosian, Royal, Congressional Libraries, it is the interest of all who there should be exploring expeditions, Captain Cook's to voyage around the world, Ross's, Franklin's, Richardson's, and Kane's, to find the magnetic and the geographic poles. We are all richer for the measurement of a degree of latitude on the Earth's surface. Our navigation is safer for the chart. How intimately our knowledge of the system of the universe rests on that, and a true economy in a state or an individual will forget its frugality in behalf of claims like these. Whilst it is each man's interest that not only ease and convenience of living, but also wealth or surplus product should exist somewhere, it need not be in his hands, often it is very undesirable to him. Goethe said, Nobody should be rich who does not understand it. Some men are born to own, and can animate all their possessions. Others cannot. Their owning is not graceful. It seems to be a compromise to their character. They seem to steal their own dividends. They should own who can administer, not they who hoard and conceal, not they who, the great proprietors they are, are only the great beggars but whose work carves out work for more, opens the path for all. For he is a rich man in whom the people are rich, and he is a poor man in whom the people are poor. And how to give all access to the masterpieces of art and nature is the problem of civilization. The socialism of our day has done good service in setting men on thinking how certain civilization benefits, not only enjoyed by the opulent, can be enjoyed by all. For example, the providing of each man the means of apparatus of science and of the arts. There are many articles good for occasional use, which few men are able to own. Every man wishes to see the rings of Saturn, the satellites and belts of Jupiter and Mars, the mountains and craters of the moon, but how few can own a telescope, and of those scarcely one would like the trouble of keeping in order and exhibiting it. So of electrical and chemical apparatus, and many of the other things. Every man may have occasion to consult books which he does not care to possess, such as cyclopedias, dictionaries, tables, charts, maps, and public documents. Pictures also of birds, beasts, fishes, shells, trees, flowers, whose names he desires to know. 
There is a refining influence from the arts of design on a prepared man, which is as positive as that of music, not to be supplied from any other source, but pictures, engravings, statues, and casts, besides their first costs, entail expenses, as of galleries and keepers of the exhibition, and the uses which any man can make use of is rare, and their value, too, is much enhanced by the number of men who can share their enjoyment. In the Greek cities, it was reckoned profane that any person should pretend a property in a work of art which belonged to all who could behold it. I think sometimes, could I only have music on my own terms, could I live in the great city, and know where I could go whenever I wished the ablution and inundation of musical waves, that were a bath and a medicine. If properties of this kind were owned by states, towns, and lyceums, they would draw the bonds of neighborhood closer. A town would exist to an intellectual purpose. In Europe, where the feudal forms secure the permits of wealth in certain families, those families buy and preserve these things, and lay them open to the public. But in America, where democratic institutions divide every state into smaller portions, after a few years, the public should step into the place of these proprietors and provide this cultural inspiration for the citizen. Man was born to be rich, or inevitably grows rich by the use of his faculties, by the union of thought with nature. Property is an intellectual production. The game requires coolness, right reasoning, promptness, and patience in the player. Cultivated labor drives our brute labor. An infinite number of shrewd men, in infinite years, have arrived at certain best and shortest ways of doing, and these accumulated skills in art, cultures, harvesting, curings, manufactures, navigations, expenses, exchanges, constitute the worth of our world today. Commerce is a game of skill, which every man cannot play, which few men can play well. The right merchant is one who has the just average of faculties we call common sense, a man of a strong affinity for facts, who makes up his decision on what he has seen. He is thoroughly persuaded by the truth of arithmetic. There is always a reason in the man for his good or bad fortune, and so in making money. Men talk as if there were some magic about it, and believe in magic, in all parts of life. He knows that all goes on the old road, pound for pound, cent for cent, for every effect of perfect cause, and that good luck is another name for tenacity of purpose. He insures himself in every transaction, and likes small and sure gains. Probity and closeness of facts are the basis, but the masters of the arts add a certain long arithmetic. The problem is to combine many and remote operations, with the accuracy and adherence to the facts, which is easy in near and small transactions, so to arrive at gigantic results, without any compromise to safety. Napoleon was fond of telling the story of the Marseille banker, who said to the visitor, surprised at the contrast between the splendor of the banker's chateau and hospitality, and the meanness of the conning room in which he had seen him, Young man, you are too young to understand how masses are formed. The true and only power, whether composed of money, water, or men, is all alike. A mass is an immense center of motion, but it must be begun, and it must be kept up. And he might have added that the way in which it must be begun and kept up is by obedience to the laws of particles. Success consists in close appliance to the laws of the world, and, since those laws are intellectual and moral, an intellectual and moral obedience. Political economy is as good a book wherein to read the life of man, and the ascendancy of laws over all private and hostile influences, as any Bible, which has come down to us. Money is representative, and follows the nature and fortunes of its owner. The coin is a delicate meter of civil, social, and moral changes. The farmer is covetous of his dollar, and with reason. It is no waif to him. He knows how many strokes of labor it represents. His bones ache with the day's work that earned it. He knows how much land it represents, how much rain, frost, and sunshine. He knows that, in the dollar, he gives you so much discretion and patience, so much hoeing and threshing. Try to lift his dollar, you must lift all that weight. In the city, where money follows the skid of a pen, or a lucky rise in exchange, it comes to be looked at as light. I wish the farmer held it dear, and would spend it only for real bread, force for force. The farmer's dollar is heavy, and the clerk's is light and nimble, leaps out of his pocket, jumps on to cards and faro tables, but still more curious is its susceptibility to metaphysical changes. It is the finest barometer of social storms, and announces revolutions. Every step of civil advancement makes every man's dollar worth more. In California, the country where it grew, what would it buy? A few years since, it would buy a shanty, dysentery, hunger, bad company, and crime. There are wide countries, like Siberia, where it would buy little else today than some petty mitigation of suffering. In Rome, it will buy beauty and magnificence. Four years ago, a dollar would not buy much in Boston. Now it will buy a great deal more in our old town, thanks to railroad, telegraph, steamers, and the contemporaneous growth of New York and the whole country. Yet there are many goods appertaining to a capital city which are not yet purchasable there. No, not with a mountain of dollars. A dollar in Florida is not worth a dollar in Massachusetts. A dollar is not value, but representative value, and at last of moral values. A dollar is rated for the corn it will buy or, to speak strictly, not for the corn or house room, but for the Athenian corn and Roman house room, 
for the wit, probity, and power which we eat bread and dwell in houses to share and exert. Wealth is mental. Wealth is moral. The value of a dollar is to buy just things. A dollar goes on increasing in value with all the genius, all the virtues of the world. A dollar in a university is worth more than a dollar in jail. In a temperate school law buying community than in some sink of crime where dice, knives, and arsenic are in constant play. The banknote detector is a useful publication, but the current dollar, silver, or paper is itself the detector of the right and wrong where it circulates. Is it not instantly enhanced by the increase of equity? If a trader refuses to sell his vote or adheres to some odious right, he makes so much more equity in the Massachusetts, and every acre in the state is worth more in the house of his action. If you take out a state street, the ten honestest merchants, and put in ten roguish persons, controlling the same amount of capital, the rates of insurance will indicate it, the soundness of the bank will show it, the highways will be less secure, the school will feel it, the children will bring home their little dose of the poison, the judge will sit less firmly on his bench, and his decisions will be less upright. He has lost so much support and constraint, which all need, and the pulpit will betray it, and he lacks the rule of life. An apple tree, if you take out every day, for a number of days, a load of loam, and put in a loam of sand about its roots, will find it out. An apple tree is a stupid kind of creature, but if this treatment be pursued for a short time, I think it will begin to mistrust something. And if you should take out the powerful class engaged in trade a hundred good men, and put in a hundred bad, or, what is the same thing, introduce a demoralizing institution, would not the dollar, which is not much stupider than an apple tree, presently find it out? The value of a dollar is social, as it is created by society. Every man who removes into the city, with any perturbable talent or skill in him, gives to every man's labor in that city a new worth. If a talent is anywhere born into the world, the community of nations is enriched, and much more, with a new degree of probity. The expense of crime, one of the principal charges of every nation, is so far stopped. In Europe, crime is observed to increase or abate with the price of bread. If the Rothschilds at Paris do not accept bills, the people of Manchester at Paisley and Birmingham are forced into the highways, and landlords are shot in Ireland. The police records attest it. The vibrations are presently felt in New York, New Orleans, and Chicago. Not much otherwise, the economical power touches the masses through the political lords. Rothschild refuses the Russian loan, and there is peace, and the harvests are saved, and an agitation through the large portion of mankind, and every hideous result ending in revolution and a new order. Wealth brings with it its own checks and balances. The basis of political economy is not interference. The only safe rule is found in the self-adjusting meter of demand and supply. Do not legislate. Meddle, and you snap the sinews with your sumptuary laws. Give no bounties. Make equal laws. Secure life and property, and you do not give alms. Open the doors of opportunity to talent and virtue, and they will do themselves justice, and property will not be in bad hands. In a free and just commonwealth, property rushes to the idle and imbecile, to the industrious, brave, and persevering. The laws of nature play through trade, as a toy battery exhibits the effects of electricity. The level of the sea is not more surely kept than is the equilibrium of value in society, by the demands and supply, and the artifice of legislation punishes itself by reactions, gluts, and bankruptcies. The sublime laws play indifferently through atoms and galaxies. Whoever knows what happens in the getting and spending of a loaf of bread and a pint of beer, that no wishing will change the rigorous limits of pints and penny loaves, that for all that is consumed, so much less remain of the basket and pot. But what has gone out of these is not wasted, but well spent, if it nourish his body and enable him to finish his task, knows all of political economy that the budgets of empires can teach him. The interest of petty economy is the symbolization of the great economy, the way in which a house and a private man's methods tally with the solar system and the laws of give and take through nature, and however wary we are of the falsehoods and petty tricks of what we suicidally play off in each other, every man has a certain satisfaction whenever his dealings touches on the inevitable facts, when he sees that things dictate the price, as they always tend to do, and in large manufacturers are seen to do. Your paper is not fine or coarse enough. It is too heavy or too thin. The manufacturer says he will furnish you with that thickness or thinness you want. The pattern is quite indifferent to him. Here is the schedule. Any variety of paper, as cheaper or dearer, with the price it annexed. A pound of paper costs so much, and you may have it made up in any pattern you fancy. There is in all our dealings a self-regulation that supersedes chaffering. You will rent a house. You will have it cheap. The owner can reduce the rent, so he incapacitates himself from making proper repairs, and the tenant gets not the house he would have, but a worse one. Besides, that a relation a little injurious is establishing between landlord and tenant. You dismiss your laborer, saying, Patrick, I shall send you as soon as I cannot do without you. Patrick goes off contented, for he knows that the weeds will grow with the potatoes. The vines must be planted next year, and however unwilling you may be, the cantaloupes, crooknecks, and cucumbers will send for him. Who but must wish that all labor and value should stand on the same simple and surly market? If it is not the best of its kind, it will. 
We must have joiner, locksmith, planner, priest, poet, doctor, cook, weaver, ostler, each in turn throughout the year. If a St. Michael's pear sells for a shilling, it costs a shilling to raise it. If in Boston the best securities offer 12% for money, they have just 6% of the insecurity. You may not see that the fine pear costs you a shilling, but it costs the community so much. The shilling represents the number of enemies the pear has, and the amount of risk in ripening it. The price of coal shows the narrowness of the coal field, and a compulsory confinement to the miners to a certain district. All sellers are reckoned on contingent, as well as on actual services. If the winds were always southwest by west, said the skipper, women might take ships to sea. One might say that all things are of one price, that nothing is cheap or dear, and that the apparent disparities that strike us are only a shopman's trick of concealing the damage in your bargain. A youth coming into the city from his native New Hampshire harm, with his hard fare still fresh in his remembrance, boards at a first-class hotel and believes he must somehow have outwitted Dr. Franklin and Malthus, for luxuries are cheap. It pays for the one convenience of a better dinner by the loss of some of the richest social and educational advantages. He has lost what guards, what incentives. He will perhaps find by and by that he finds the muses at the door of the hotel and finds the furies inside. Money often costs too much, and power and pleasure are not cheap. The ancient poet said, The gods sell things at a fair price. There is an example of the compensations in the commercial history of the country. When the European wars threw the carrying trade of the world from 1800 to 1812 into American bottoms, a seizure was now and then made of an American ship. Of course the loss was serious to the owner, but the country was indemnified. We charged three pence a pound for carrying cotton, six pence for tobacco, and so on, which paid for the risks and loss, and brought into the country an immense prosperity, early marriages, private wealth, and the building of cities and of states. And after the war was over, we received compensation over and above by treaty for all the seizures. Well, the Americans grew rich and great, but the payday comes round. Britain, France, and Germany, which our extraordinary profits have impoverished, send out, attracted by the fame of our advantages, first their thousands, then their millions of poor people to share the crop. At first we employ them and increase our prosperity, but in the artificial system of society and of protected labor, which we also have adopted and enlarged, there comes presently checks and stoppages. Then we refuse to employ these poor men, but they will not be so answered. They go into the poor rates, and... Though we refuse wages, we must now pay the same amount in the form of taxes. Again, it turns out that the largest proportion of crimes are committed by foreigners. The costs of the crimes and the expenses of the courts and of prisons we must bear, and the standing army of preventative police we must pay. The cost of education of the posterity of this great colony I will not compute, but the gross amount of these costs will begin to pay back what we thought was a net gain from our transatlantic customers of 1800. It is vain to refuse this payment. We cannot get rid of these people, and we cannot get rid of their will to be supported. That has become an inevitable element of our politics, and for their votes, each of the dominant parties courts in a system to get it executed. Moreover, we have to pay not what have contented them at home, but what they have learned to think necessary here, so that opinion, fancy, and all manner of moral considerations complicate the problem. There are a few measures of economy which will bear to be named without disgust. For the subject is tender, we may easily have too much of it, and therein resembles the hideous animacules of which our bodies are built up, which, offensive in the particular, yet compose valuable and effective masses. Our nature and genius force us to respect ends, whilst we use means. We must use the means, and yet, in our most accurate using, somehow screen and cloak them, as we can only give them any beauty by reflection of the glory of the ends. That is the good head, which serves the end, and commands the means. The rabble are corrupted by their means. The means are too strong for them, and they desert their end. 1. The first of these measures is that each man's expense must proceed from his character. As long as your genius buys, the investment is safe, though you spend like a monarch. Nature arms each man with some faculty which enables him to do easily some feat impossible to any other, and thus makes him necessary to society. This native determination guides his labor and his spending. He wants an equipment of means and tools proper to his talent, and to save on this point were to neutralize the special strength and the helpfulness of his mind. Do your work, respecting the excellence of the work, and not its acceptableness. This is so much economy that, rightly read, it is the sum of economy. Profligacy consists not in spending years of time or chests of money, but in spending them off the line of your career. The crime which bankrupts men and states is job work, declining from your main design to serve a turn here or there. Nothing is beneath you if it is in the direction of your life. Nothing is great or desirable if it is off from that. I think we are entitled here to draw a straight line and say that society can never prosper, but must always be bankrupt, until every man does that which he was created to do. Spend for your expense, and retrench the expense which is not yours. 
Alston the painter was wont to say that he built a plain house and filled it with plain furniture because he would hold out no bribe for any to visit him who had not similar taste to his own. We are sympathetic and, like children, want everything we see. But it is a large stride to independence when a man, in his discovery of his proper talent, has sunk the necessity for false expenses. As a betrothed maiden, by one secured affection, is relieved from a system of slaveries, the daily inculcated necessity of pleasing all, so the man who has found what he can do can spend on that and leave all other spending. Montaigne said, When he was a younger brother, he went brave in dress and equipage, but afterwards his chateau and farms might answer for him. Let a man who belongs to the class of nobles, those namely who have found out that they can do something, relieve themselves of all vague squandering on objects not his. Let the realist not mind appearances. Let them delegate to others the costly courtesies and decorations of social life. The virtues are economists, but some of the vices are also. Thus, next to humility, I have noticed that pride is a pretty good husband. A good pride is, as I reckon it, worth from five hundred to fifteen hundred a year. Pride is handsome, economical. Pride eradicates so many vices, letting none subsist but itself, that it seems as if it were a great gain to exchange vanity for pride. Pride can go without domestics, without fine clothes, can live in a house with two rooms, can eat potato, purslane, beans, lied corn, can work on the soil, can travel afoot, can talk with poor men, or sit silent, well contented in fine saloons. But vanity costs money, labor, horses, men, women, health, and peace, and still is nothing at last, a long way leading nowhere. Only one drawback. Proud people are intolerably selfish, and the vain are gentle and giving. Art is a jealous mistress, and if a man have a genius for painting, poetry, music, architecture, or philosophy, he makes a bad husband, and an ill provider, and should be wise in season, not fetter himself with duties which will embitter his days and spoil him for his proper work. We had in this region, twenty years ago, among our educated men, a sort of Arcadian fanaticism, a passionate desire to go upon the land, and unite farming to the intellectual pursuits. Many effected their purpose, and made the experiment, and some became downright plowmen, but all were cured of their faith that scholarship and practical farming, I mean with one's own hands, could be united. With brow bent, with firm intent, the pale scholar leaves his desk to dry freer breath, and get a juster statement of his thoughts in a garden walk. He seems to pull at a purslane or a dock that is choking in the young corn, and finds there are two. Close behind the last is a third. He reaches out his hand to a fourth. Behind that there are four thousand and one. He is heated and untuned, and by and by wakes up from his idiot dream of chickweed and red root to remember his morning thought and to find that with his adamantine purposes he has been duped by a dandelion a garden is like those pernicious machineries we read of every month in the newspapers which catch a man's coat skirt or his hand and draw on his arm his leg and his whole body to irresistible destruction in an evil hour he has pulled down his wall and added a field to his homestead no land is bad but land is worse if a man own land the land owns him now let him leave home if he dare Every tree and graft, every hill of melons, row of corn, or quickest hedge, all he has done, and all he means to do, stand in the way, like duns, and he would go out of his gate. The devotion of these vines and trees he finds poisonous. Long free walks, a circuit of miles, free his brain and serve his body. Long marches are no hardship to him. He believes he composes easily on the hills, but this powdering in a few square yards of garden is dispiriting and driveling. The smell of the plants has drugged him, and robbed him of his energy. He finds a catalepsy in his bones. He grows peevish and poor-spirited. The genius of reading and gardening are antagonistic, like resinous and vitreous electricity. One is concentrative in sparks and shocks, the other is diffuse strength, so that each disqualifies its workman for the other's duties. An engraver, whose hands must be an exquisite delicacy of stroke, should not lay stone walls. Sir David Brewster gives exact instructions for microscopic observation. Lie down on your back, and hold the single lens and object over your eyes, etc., etc., how much more the seeker of abstract truth who needs periods of isolation, and rapt concentration, and almost a going out of body to think. 2. Spend after your genius, and by system. Nature goes by rule, not by sallies and saltations. There must be system in the economies. Saving and unexpensiveness will not keep the most pathetic family from ruin, nor will bigger incomes make the free spending safe. The secret of success is never in the amount of money, but in the relation of income to outgo. As if, after expense has been fixed at a certain point, then new and steadily rules of income, though never so small, being added, wealth begins. But in ordinary, as means increase, spending increases, faster so that large incomes in England and elsewhere are found not to help matters. The eating quality of debt does not relax its veracity. When the cholera is in the potato, what is the use of planting large crops? In England, the richest country in the world, I was assured by shrewd observers that the great lords and ladies have no more guineas to give away than other people, that liberality with money is as rare and as, and as immediately famous a virtue as it is here. Want is a growing giant, which the code of have was never large enough to cover. 
I remember in Warwickshire to have been shown a fair manor, still in the same name as in Shakespeare's time. The rent roll, I was told, is some fourteen thousand pounds a year, but when the second son of the late proprietor was born, the father was perplexed how to provide for him. The eldest son must inherit the manor, what to do with this supernumerary. He was advised to breed him for the church, and to settle him in the rectorship, which was in the gift of the family, which was done. It was a general rule in that country, the bigger the incomes do not help anybody. It is commonly observed that a sudden wealth, like a prize drawn on a lottery, or a large bequest to a poor family, does not permanently enrich. They have served no apprenticeship to wealth, and with the rapid wealth comes rapid claims, which they do not know how to deny, and the treasure is quickly dissipated. A system must be in every economy, or the best single expedients are of no avail. A farm is a good thing, when it begins and ends with itself, and does not need a salary, or a shop, to eke it out. Thus the cattle are a main link in the chain ring. If the nonconformist or ascetic farmer leaves out the cattle, and does not also leave out the want which the cattle must supply, he must fill in the gap by begging or stealing. When men now alive were born, the farm yielded everything that was consumed on it. The farm yielded no money, and the farmer got on without it. If he fell sick, his neighbors came to his aid. Each gave a day's work, or a half a day, or lent his yoke of oxen, or a horse or kept his work even, hoed his potato, mowed his hay, reaped his rye, well knowing that no man could afford to hire labor without selling his land. In autumn a farmer could sell an ox or a hog and get a little money to pay taxes withal. Now the farmer buys almost all he consumes, tinware, cloth, sugar, tea, coffee, fish, coal, railroad tickets, and newspapers. A master in each art is required, because the practice is never with still or dead subjects, but with change in your hands. You think farm buildings and broad acres a solid property, but its value is flowing like water. It requires as much watching as if you were decanting wine from a cask. The farmer knows what to do with it, stops every leak, turns all the steam loose into one reservoir, and decants wine. But a blunderhead comes out of Cornhill, tries his hand, and it all leaks away. So it is with granite sheets, or timber townships, or the fruit of flowers. Nor is any investment so permanent that it can be allowed to remain without incessant watching, as the history of each attempt to lock up an inheritance through two generations for an un unborn inheritor may show. When Mr. Cocaine takes a cottage in the country and will keep his cows, he thinks the cow is a creature that is fed on hay, and gives a pail of milk twice a day. But the cow that he buys gives milk for three months, then her bag dries up. What to do with a dry cow? Who will buy her? Perhaps he bought also a yoke of oxen to do his work, but they get blown and lame. What to do with a blown lame oxen? The farmer fats his, and after the spring work is done, he kills them in the fall. But how can Cocaine, who has no pastures, and leaves his cottage daily in the cars, at business hours, be bothered with fattening and killing oxen? He plants trees, but there must be crops, to keep the trees in ploughed land. What shall be the crops? He will have nothing to do with trees, but will have grass. After a year or two, the grass must be turned up and ploughed. Now what crops? Credulous Cocaine. 3. Help comes from the custom of the country, and the rules of impera parando. The rule is not to dictate, not to insist on carrying out each of your screens by ignorant willfulness, but to learn practically the secret spoken from all nature, that things themselves will refuse to be mismanaged, and will show to the watchful their own law. Nobody needs to hand or foot. The custom of the country will do it all. I know not how to build or a plant, neither how to buy wood, nor what to do with the house lot, the field, the wood lot, when bought. Never fear. It is all settled how it shall be, long beforehand, in the customs of the country. Whether to sand, or whether to clay it, when to plough, and how to dress, whether to grass, how to corn, and you cannot help or hinder it. Nature has her own best mode of doing each thing, and she has somewhere told it plainly, if we will keep our eyes and ears open. If not, she will not be slow in undeceiving us, when we prefer our own ways to hers. How often we must remember the art of the surgeon, which, in replacing a broken bone, contends itself with releasing the parts of from false position. They fall into their place by the action of the muscles. On this art of nature all the arts rely. Of the two eminent engineers in the recent construction of railroads in England, Mr. Bruno went straight from terminus to terminus, through mountains, over streams, crossing highways, cutting ducal estates in two, and shooting through this man's cellar and that man's attic window, and so arriving at his end at great pleasures to geometrists, but with cost to his company. Mr. Stevenson, on the contrary, believed that the river knows the way, followed his valley as implicitly as our western railroad follows the Westfield River, and turned out to be the safest and cheapest engineer. We say the cows laid out Boston. Well, there are worse of errors. Every pedestrian in our pastures has frequent occasion to thank the cows for cutting the best path through the thicket and over the hills, and travelers Indians know the valley of Buffalo Trail, which is sure to be the easiest possible pass through the ridge. When a citizen, fresh from Dockshire or Milk Street, comes out and buys land in this country, his first thought is to look at the outlook from his windows. His library must command a western view, a sunset every day, bathing his shoulder of blue hills, Wakasut, and the, and the peaks of Monadnock, 
and Enquinoc. What, thirty acres and all this magnificence for fifteen thousand dollars? It would be cheap at fifty thousand. He proceeds at once, his dim eyes with tears of joy, to fix the spot for his cornerstone. But the man who is to his level on the ground thinks it will take many hundred loads of gravel to fill the hollow of the road. The stonemason who should build the wells thinks he should have to dig forty feet. The baker doubts he shall never like to drive up to the door. The practical neighbor cavils at the position of the farm, and the citizen comes to know that his predecessor farmer built the house on the right spot for the sun and wind, the spring, the water drainage, and the convenience to the pasture, the garden, the field, and the road. So Dock Square yields the point, and things have their own way. Use has made the farmer wise, and the foolish citizen learns to take his counsel. From step to step he comes at last to surrender his discretion. The farmer affects to take his commands, but the citizen says, You may ask me as often as you will, and in what ingenious forms, for an opinion concerning the mode of building my wall, or sinking my well, or laying out my acre, but the ball will rebound to you. There are matters in which I neither know nor need to know anything. There are questions which you and not I shall answer. Not less, within doors, a system settles itself paramount, tyrannical, over masters and mistress, servant and child, cousin and acquaintance. Tis in vain that genius or virtue or energy or character strive to cry against it. This is fate. And tis very well that the poor husband reads in a book of a new way of living, and resolves to adapt it at home. Let him go home and try it, if he dare. 4. Another point of economy is to look for seed of the same kind that you sow, and not to hope to buy one kind with another. Friendship buys friendship justice justice military merit military success good husbandry finds wife children and household the good merchant large gains ships stocks and money the good poet fame and literary credit but not either or the other yet there is commonly a confusion of expectations on these points hotspur lives for the moment praises himself for it and despises furlong that he does not hotspur of course is poor and furlong a good provider the odd circumstance is that Hotspur thinks it a superiority in himself, this improvidence, which ought to be rewarded with Furlong's lands. I have not at all completed my design, but we shall not leave the topic without casting one glance at the interior recesses. It is a doctrine of philosophy that man is a being of degrees, that there is nothing in the world which is not repeated in his body, his body being a sort of miniature or summary of the world, then that there is nothing in his body which is not repeated in the celestial spheres in his mind then there is nothing in his brain which is not repeated in a higher sphere in his moral system. 5. Now these things are so in nature. All things ascend, and the royal rule of economy is that it should ascend also, or whatever we do must also have a higher aim. Thus it is a maxim, the money is another kind of blood, pecuniae alter sanguis, or the estate of man is only a larger kind of body, and admits of regimen analogous to his bodily circulations. So there is no maxim of the merchant, example given, best use of money is to pay debts, every business by itself, best time is the present time, the right investment is the tools for your trade, or the like which does not admit of an extended sense. The conning room maxims liberally expound our laws of the universe. The merchant's economy is a coarse symbol for the soul's economy. It is to spend for power and not for pleasure. It is to invest income, that is to say, to take up particulars into generals, days into integral eras, literary and motive practical of its life, and still to ascend in its investment. The merchant has but one rule, absorb and invest. He is to be a capitalist. The scraps and filings must be gathered back in the crucible. The gas and smoke must be burned. And earnings must not go to increase expense, but to capital again. Well, the man must be a capitalist. Will he spend his income or will he invest? His body and every organ is under the same law. His body is a jar in which the liquor of life is stored. Will he spend for pleasure? The way to ruin is short and facile. Will he not spend but hoard for power? It passes through the sacred fermentations by that law of nature whereby everything climbs to higher platforms. A bodily vigor becomes mental and moral vigor. The bread he eats is first strength in animal spirits. It becomes in high laboratories imagery and thought, and in still higher results courage and endurance. This is the right compound interest. This is capital double, quadrupled, centupled. Man raised to his highest power. The true thrift is always to spend on a higher plane, to invest, and invest with keener avarice that he may spend in spiritual creation, not in augmenting animal existence. Nor is the man enriched in repeating the old experiments of animal sensation. Nor, unless through the new powers of ascending pleasures, he knows himself by the actual experience of higher good to be already on his way to the highest. End of Wealth Recording by Daniel Christopher June You can visit my website at www.perfectideas.com It's perfectideus.com Culture.
Essay 4 of Conduct of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Christopher June. Culture. Can rules or tutors educate the semi-god whom we await? We must be musical, tremulous, impressional, alive to gentle influence of landscape and of sky, and tender to the spirit touch of man or maiden's eye. But to his native center fast shall into future fuse the past, and the world's flowing fates in his world mold recast. The word of ambition at the present day is culture. Whilst all the world is in pursuit of power, and of wealth as a means of power, culture corrects the theory of success. A man is the prisoner of his power. A topical memory makes him an almanac, a talent for debate a disputant. Skill to get money makes him a miser, that is, a beggar. Culture reduces these inflammations by invoking the aid of other powers against the dominant talent, and by appealing to the rank of powers. It watches success. For performance, nature has no mercy, and sacrifices the performer to get it done. It makes a dopsy or a tympany of him. If she wants a thumb, she makes one at the cost of arms and legs, and any excess of power in one part is usually paid for by some defect in a contiguous part. Our efficiency depends so much on our concentration that nature usually in the instances where a marked man is sent onto the world overloads him with a bias, sacrificing his symmetry to his working power. It is said, no man can write but one book, and if a man have a defect, it is apt to leave its impression on all its performances. If she creates a policeman like Fouché, he is made up of suspicions and of plots to circumvent them. The air, said Fouché, is full of poniards. The physician Sanctorius spent his life in a pair of scales weighing his food. Lord Coke valued Chaucer highly, because of the canon Yemen's tale that illustrates the statute Henry V, chapter 4, against alchemy. I saw a man who believed the principal mistress of the English state were derived from the devotion to musical concerts. A Freemason, not long since, set out to explain to this country that the principal cause of the success of General Washington was the aid he derived from the Freemasons. But worse than harping on one string, nature has secured individualism by giving the private person a high conceit of his way in the system. The pest of society is egotists. They are dull and bright, sacred and profane, coarse and fine egotists. Tis a disease like influenza falls on all constitutions. In the distemper known to physicians as chorea, the patient sometimes turns around and continues to spin slowly in one spot. Is egotism a metaphysical varioloid of this malady? The man runs round a ring formed by his own talent, falls into admiration of it, and loses relation to the world. It is a tendency in all minds. One of its knowing forms is a craving for sympathy. The sufferers parade their miseries, tear the lint from the bruises, reveal their indictable crimes, that you may pity them. They like sickness, because physical pain will extort some show of interest from the bystanders, as we have seen children who, finding themselves of no account when grown-ups come in, will cough till they choke to draw attention. This distemper is the scourge of talent, of artists, inventors, and philosophers. Eminent spiritualists shall have an incapacity of putting their act or word aloof from them, and seeing it bravely for the nothing it is. Beware of the man who says, I am on the eve of a revelation. It is speedily punished, inasmuch as this habit invites men to humor it, and by treating the patient tenderly, to shut him up in narrow selfism, and exclude him from the great works of God's cheerful, fallible men and women. Let's rather be insulted while we are insultable. Religious literature has eminent examples, and if we run over our private list of poets, critics, philanthropists, and philosophers, we shall find them infected with this dropsy and elephantiasis, which we ought to have tapped. This goiter of egotism is so frequent among notable persons that we must infer some strong necessity in nature which it subserves, such as we see in the sexual attraction. The preservation of the species was a point of such necessity that nature has secured it at all hazards by immensely overloading the passion, at the risk of perpetual crime and disorder. So egotism has its root in the cardinal necessity by which each individual persists to be what he is. This individuality is not only not inconsistent with culture, but is the basis of it. Every valuable nature is there in its own right, and the student we speak to must have a mother wit invincible by his culture, which uses all books, arts, facilities, and elegance of intercourse, but is never subdued and lost in them. He only is a well-made man who has a good determination, and the end of all culture is not to destroy this, God forbid, but to train away all impediment and mixture, and leave nothing but power. Our student must have a style and determination, and be a master of his own specialty. But having this, he must put it behind him. He must have a catholicity, a power to see with a free and disengaged look every object.
Yet is his private interest in self so overcharged that if a man seek a companion who can look at an object for their own sake and without affectation or self-reference, he will find the fewest who will give him that satisfaction. Whilst most men are afflicted with a coldness and curiosity as soon as any object does not connect with their self-love. Though they talk of the object before them, they are thinking of themselves, and their vanity is laying little traps for your admiration. But after a man has discovered that there are limits to the interest in which his private history has for mankind, he still converses with his family, or a few companions, perhaps with a half-dozen personalities that are famous in his neighborhood. In Boston, the question of life is the names of some eight or ten men. Have you seen Mr. Allison, Dr. Channing, Mr. Adams, Mr. Webster, and Mr. Greenbow? Have you heard Everett, Garrison, Father Taylor, Theodore Parker? Have you talked with Monsieur Turbinwheel, Summit Level, and La Crofopoe? Then you may as well die. In New York, the question is some eight or ten or twenty. Have you seen a few lawyers, merchants, and brokers? Two or three scholars? Two or three capitalists? Two or three editors of newspapers? New York is a sucked orange. All conversation is at an end when you have discharged ourselves of a dozen personalities, domestic or imported, which make up our American existence. Nor do we expect anybody to be other than a faint copy of these heroes. Life is very narrow. Bring any club or company of intelligent men together after ten years, and if the presence of some penetrating and calming genius could dispose them to frankness, what a confession of insanities would come up. The causes which we have sacrificed, terror for democracy, whiggism or abolition, temperance to socialism, would show like roots of bitterness and dragon's wrath. And our talents are as mischievous as if they had been seized upon by some bird of prey, which had whisked him away from fortune, from truth, from the dear society of the poets, some zeal, some bias, and only when he is now gray and nerveless, was it relaxing its claws, and he awakening to sober perceptions. Culture is the suggestion from certain best thoughts that a man has a range of affinities, through which he can modulate the violence of any master tones that have a droning preponderance on a scale, and succor him against himself. Culture redresses his balance, puts him among his equals and superiors, revives his delicious sense of sympathy, and warns him of the danger of solitude and repulsion. It is not a compliment but a disparagement to consult a man only on horses, or on steam, or on theatres, or on, on eating, or on books, and, whenever he appears, considerately to turn the conversation to the bantling he is known to fondle. In the Norse heaven of our forefathers, Thor's house had five hundred and forty floors. A man's house has five hundred and forty floors. His excellence is facility of adaption and of transition through many related points, to wide contrasts and extremes. Culture kills his exaggeration, his conceit of his village or his city. We must leave our pets at home when we go into the street and meet men on broad grounds of good meaning and good sense. No performance is worth loss of geniality. It is a cruel price we pay for certain fancy goods called fine art and philosophy. In the Norse legend, Alfader did not get a drink from Mimir's spring, the fountain of wisdom, until he left his iron pledge. And here is a pedant that cannot unfold his wrinkles, nor conceal his wrath at interruption by the best, if their conversation not fit his impertinency. Here is a he to afflict us with his personalities. Tis incident to scholars that each of them fancies he is pointedly odious in his community. Draw him out of his limbo of irritability. Cleanse with healthy blood his parchment skin. You restore to him the eye which he left in pledge of Mimir's spring. If you are the victim of your doing, who cares what you do? We can spare your opera, your gazetter, your chemic analysis, your history, your syllogisms. Your man of genius pays dear for his distinction. His head runs into a spire, and instead of a healthy man, merry and wise, he is some mad dominee. Nature is reckless of the individual. When she has points to carry, she carries them. To wait in marshes and sea margins is the destiny of certain birds, and they are so accurately made for this that they are imprisoned in those places. Each animal out of its habitat would starve. To the physician, each man, each woman, is an application of one organ. A soldier, a locksmith, a bank clerk, and a dancer could not exchange functions, and thus we are victims of our adaptation. The antidotes against this organic egotism are the range and variety of attractions, as gained by acquaintance with the world, with men of merit, with classes of society, with travel, with eminent persons, and with the high resources of philosophy, art, and religion. Books, travel, society, solitude. The hardiest skeptic who has ever seen a horse broken, a pointer trained, or has visited a menagerie, or the exhibition of the industrious fleas, will not deny the validity of education. A boy, said Plato, is the most vicious of all wild beasts. In the same spirit, the old English poet Gascon said, A boy is better unborn than untaught. The city breeds one kind of speech and manners, the back country a different style, the sea another, the army a fourth. We know that an army which can be confided in may be formed by discipline, that by systematic discipline all men may be made heroes. Marshal Lane said to the French officer, No, Colonel, that none but a poltroon would boast he never was afraid. A great part of courage is the courage of having done the thing before. 
and in all human action those faculties would be strong which are used robert owen said give me a tiger and i won't educate him tis inhuman to want faith in the power of education since to ameliorate is the law of nature and men are valued precisely as they exert onward or ameliorating force on the other hand poltroonery is the acknowledging of an inferiority to be incurable incapacity or amelioration is the only mortal distemper there are people who can never understand a trope or any second or expended sense given to your words or any humor but remain literalists after hearing the music and poetry and rhetoric and wit of seventy or eighty years they are past the help of surgeon or clergy but even these can understand pitchforks and the cry of fire i have noticed in some of this class a marked dislike of earthquakes let us make our education brave and preventative politics is an afterwork a poor patching we are always a little late the evil is done the law is passed we begin the uphill agitation for repeal of that which we ought to have prevented the enacting we shall one day learn to supersede politics by education what we call our root and branch reforms of slavery war gambling and temperance is only medicating the symptoms we must begin higher up namely in education arts and tools give to him who can handle them much the same advantage over the novice as if he extended his life ten fifty or a hundred years and i think it the part of every good sense to provide every fine soul with such culture that it shall not at thirty or forty years have to say this which i might do is made hopeless through my want of weapons but it is conceded that much of our training fails of effect that all success is hazardous and rare that a large part of our costs and pains is thrown away nature takes the matter into her own hands and but we must not omit any jot of our system we can seldom be sure that it has availed much or that as much good would have not have accrued from a different system books as containing the finest records of human wit must always enter into our notion of culture the best heads that ever existed pericles plato julius caesar shakespeare goethe milton were well-read universally educated men and quite too wise to undervalue letters their opinion has weight because they had means of knowing the opposite opinion we look that a great man should be a good reader or in proportion to the spontaneous power should be the assimilating power good criticism is very rare and always precious i am always happy to meet persons who perceive the transcendent superiority of shakespeare over all writers i like people who like plato because this love does not consist with self-conceit but books are good only as far as a boy is ready for them he sometimes gets ready very slowly you send your child to schoolmaster but to schoolboys who educate him you send him to the latin class but much of his tuition comes on his way to school from the shop windows you like the strict rules and long terms, but he finds his best leading in a byway of his own, and refuses any companions but of his choosing. He hates the grammar and greatest, and loves guns, fishing rods, horses, and boats. Well, the boy is right, and you are not fit to direct his upbringing, if your theory leaves out his gymnastic training. Archery, cricket, gun, and fishing rod, horse and boat are all educators, liberalizers, and so are dancing, dress, and street talk, and, provided only the boy has resources and is of noble and genius strain, these will not serve him less than the books he learns chess whist dancing and theatricals the father observes that another boy has learned algebra and geometry in the same time but the first boy has acquired much more than these poor games along with them he is infatuated for weeks with whist and chess but presently will find out as you did that when he rises from the game too long played he is vacant and forlorn and despises himself thenceforth it takes place among other things and has its due weight in its experience these minor skills and accomplishments for example dancing are tickets of admission to the dress circle of mankind and the being master of them enables the youth to judge intelligently of such on which otherwise he would have a pedantic squint lander said i have suffered more from my bad dancing than from all the misfortunes and miseries of my life put together provided always the boy is teachable for we are not proposing to make a statue out of punk football cricket archery swimming skating climbing fencing dancing are lessons of the art of power which it is his main business to learn riding specially of which lord herbert of cherbury said a good rider on a good horse is as much above himself and others as the world can make him besides the gun fishing rod boat and horse constitute among those who use them secret freemasonries they are as if they belong to one club there is also a negative value in these arts the chief use to the youth is not amusement but to be known for what they are and not to be remained to him occasions of heart burn we are full of superstitions each class fixes its eyes on the advantages it has not the refined on rude strength the democrat on birth and breeding one of the benefits of a college education is to show the boy of its little avail i knew a leading man in a leading city who having set his heart on education at the university and missed it could never quite feel himself the equal of his own brothers who had gone thither 
His easy superiority to multitudes of professional men could never quite countervail him of this imaginary defect. Balls, riding, wine parties, and billiards pass to a poor boy for something fine and romantic, which they are not, and a free admission to them on equal footing, if it were possible, only once or twice, would be worth ten times its cost by undeceiving him. I am not much an advocate for traveling, and I observe that men run away from their countries because they are not good in their own, or run back to their own because they pass for nothing in the new places. For the most part, only the light characters travel. Or you that have no task to keep you at home. I have been quoted as saying captious things about travel, but I mean to do justice. I think there is a restlessness in our people, which argues want of character. All educated Americans, first or last, go to Europe perhaps because it is their mental home, as the invalid habits of this country might suggest. An eminent teacher of girls said, the idea of a girl's education is whatever qualifies them for going to Europe. Can we never extract this tapeworm of Europe from the brain of our countrymen? One sees very well what their fate must be. He that does not fill a place at home cannot abroad. He only goes there to hide his insignificance in a larger crowd. You do not think you will find anything there you wish you not see at home. The stuff of all countries is just the same. Do you suppose there is any country where they do not scald milk pans and swaddle the infants and burn the brushwood and broil the fish? What is true anywhere is true everywhere. I let him go where he will. He can only find so much beauty or worth as he carries. Of course, for some men, travel may be useful. Naturalists, discoverers, and sailors are born. Some men are made for couriers, exchangers, envoys, missionaries, bearers of dispatches, as others are for farmers or working men. If the man is of light and social turn, and nature has aimed to make a leg and wigged creature framed for locomotion, then we must follow his hint, and furnish him with that breeding which gives currency, as sedulously as with that which gives worth. Let us not be pedantic, but allow it to travel its full effect. The boy grown up on the farm, which he has never left, is said in the country to have had no chance, and boys and men of that condition look upon work on a railroad or drudgery in a city as opportunity. Poor country boys of Vermont, Connecticut, formerly owed that knowledge they had to the peddling trips of the southern states. California on the Pacific coast is now a university of this class, as Virginia was in old times. To have some chance is their word, and the phrase to know the world or to travel is synonymous with all men's ideas of advantage and superiority. No doubt, to a man of sense, travel offers advantages. As many languages as he has, as many friends, as many arts and trades, as many times as he a man. A foreign country is a point of comparison wherefrom to judge his own. One use of travel is to recommend the books and works of home, who go to Europe to be Americanized, and another to find men. For as nature has put fruits apart in latitudes, a new fruit in every degree, so knowledge and fine moral qualities she lodges in distant men. And thus, of the six or seven teachers whom each man wants among his contemporaries, it often happens that one or two of them live on the other side of the world. Moreover, there is in every constitution a certain solstice, where the stars stand still in our inward firmament, and when there is required some foreign force, some diversion or alternative to prevent stagnation. And as a medical remedy, travel seems to be one of the best. Just as a man witnessing the admirable effect of ether to low pain, and meditating on the contingencies of wounds, cancers, lockjaws, rejoices in Dr. Jackson's benign discovery, so a man who looks at Paris, at Naples, at London, says, If I should be driven from my own home, here at least, my, my thoughts can be consoled by the most prodigal amusements and occupation which the human race and ages could contrive and accumulate. Akin to the benefit of foreign travel, the aesthetic value of railroads is to unite the advantages in town of country life, neither of which we can spare. A man should live in or near a large town, because, let his own genius be what it may, it will repel quite as much of agreeable and valuable talent as it draws, and, in a city, a total attraction of all citizens is sure to conquer, first or last, every repulsion, and drag the most improbable hermit within its walls some day of the year. In town he can find the swimming pool, the gymnasium, the dancing master, the shooting gallery, opera, theater, and panorama. The chemist shop, the museum of natural history, the gallery of fine arts, the national orators, in their turn, foreign travelers, the libraries, and his club. In the country he can find solitude in reading, manly labor, cheap living, and his old shoes, Wars for games, hills for geology, and groves for devotion. Aubrey writes, I have heard Thomas Hobbes say that, in the Earl of Devon's house in Derbyshire, there was a good library and books enough for him, and his lordship stored the library with what books he thought fit to be bought. But the want of good conversation was a great inconvenience, and though he conceived he could order his thinking as well as another, yet he found a great defect. In the country, in a long time, for want of good conversation, was understanding and invention contract a moss on them, like an old paling in an orchard. Cities give us collision. Tis said, London and New York take the nonsense out of a man. 
great part of our education is sympathetic and social. Boys and girls who have been brought up in well-informed and superior people show in their manners an inestimable grace. Fuller said that William Earl of Nasa won a subject for the King of Spain every time he put off his hat. You cannot have one well-bred man without a whole society of such. They keep each other up to any high point, especially women. It requires a great many cultivated women, saloons of bright, elegant, reading women, accustomed to ease and refinement, to spectacles, pictures, sculpture, poetry, and to elegant society, in order that you should have one Madame de Stael. The head of a commercial house or a leading lawyer or politician is brought into daily contact with troops of men for all parts of the country, and those too have the driving wheels, the businessmen of each section, and one can hardly suggest for a more apprehensive man a more searching culture. Besides, we must remember the high social possibilities of a million of men. The best bribe which luncheon offers today to the imagination is that, in such a vast variety of people and conditions, one can believe that there is room for persons of romantic character to exist, that the poet, the mystic, and the hero may hope to confront their counterparts. I wish cities could teach the best lesson of quiet manners. It is a foible, especially of American youth, pretension. The work of the man of the world is absence of pretension. He does not make a speech. He takes a low business tone, avoids all brag, as nobody, dresses plainly, promises not at all, performs much, speaks in monosyllables, hugs his facts. He calls his employment by his lowest name, and so takes from evil tongues their sharpest weapon. His conversation clings to weather in the news, yet he allows himself to be surprised in a thought, and the unlocking of his learning and philosophy. How the imagination is piqued by anecdotes of great men passing incognito as a king in gray clothes, of Napoleon affecting a plain suit at his glittering levy, of Burns, of Scott, of Beethoven, of Wellington, of Goethe, or any container of transcendent power passing for nobody of Apaminandas, who never says anything but will listen eternally, of Goethe, who preferred trifling subjects and common expressions in intercourse with strangers, worse rather than better clothes, and to appear a little more capricious than he was. There are advantages in the old hat and box coat. I have heard that, throughout this country, a certain respect is paid to good broadcloth, but dress makes a little restraint. Men will not commit themselves. But the box coat is like wine. It unlocks the tongue, and men say what they think. An old poet said, Go far and go sparing, and you'll find it certain. The poorer and the baser you appear, the more you look through still. Not much otherwise, Milnes writes, in the lay of the humble. To me, men are for what they are. They wear no masks with me. "'Tis odd that a people should have, not water on the brain, but a little gas there. A shrewd foreigner said of the Americans that, whatever they say has a little the air of a speech. Yet one of the traits down in the books as distinguishing the Anglo-Saxon is the trick of self-disparagement. To be sure, an old dense country is among a million of good coats. A fine coat comes to be of no distinction, and you find humorists. In an English party, a man with no marked manners for features, with a face like red dough, unexpectedly discloses wit, learning a wide range of topics, and personal familiarity with good men in all parts of the world, until you think you have fallen upon some illustrious personage. Can it be that the American forest has refreshed some weeds of old pietish barbarism just ready to die out? The love of the scarlet feather, of beads and tinsel? The Italians are fond of red clothes, peacock plumes, and embroidery. And I remember one rainy morning in the city of Palermo. The street was in a blaze with scarlet umbrellas. The English have a plain taste. The equipages of the grandees are plain. A gorgeous livery indicates new and awkward city wealth. Mr. Pitt, like Mr. Pym, thought the title of Mr. Good against any king in Europe. They have piqued themselves on governing the whole world in a poor, plain, dark committee room, which the House of Commons sat in before the fire. Whilst we want cities as the centers where the best things are found, cities degrade us by magnifying trifles. The countrymen find the town a chop house, a barber shop. He has lost the lines of grandeur of the horizon, hills and plains, and with them sobriety and elevation. He has come among a supple, glib-tongued tribe who live for show, servile to public opinion. Life is dragged down to a fracas of pitiful cares and disasters. You say the gods ought to respect a life whose objects are their own, but in cities they have betrayed you to a cloud of insignificant annoyances. Tis heavy odds against the gods when they will match with myrmidons. We spawning, spawning myrmidons, our turn today we take command. Jove gives the clove into the hand of Myrmidons of Myrmidons. What is odious but noise, and people who scream and bewail, people whose vein point always east, who live to dine, who send for the doctor, who coddle themselves, who toast their feet on the register, who intrigue to secure a padded chair and a corner out of the drought. Suffer them once to begin the enumeration of their infirmities, and the sun will not go down on an unfinished tale. Let these triflers put us out of conceit with petty comforts. To a man at work, the frost is but a color. The rain, the wind, he forgot them when he came in. Let us learn to live coarsely, dress plainly, and lie hard. 
the least habit of dominion over the palate has certain good effects not easily estimated neither will we be driven into a quiddling abstemiousness tis a superstition to insist on a special diet all is made at last of the same chemical atoms a man in pursuit of greatness feels no little wants how can he mind diet bed dress or salads of compliments or the figure you make in company or wealth or even the bringing things to pass when you think how paltry are the machinery of the workers Wordsworth was praised to me in a western moorland having afforded to his country neighbors an example of modest household where comfort and culture were secured without display and a tender boy who wears his rusty cap and outgrown coat that he may secure the coveted place in college and the right in the library is educated to some purpose there is a great deal of self-denial and manliness in poor and middle-class houses in town and country that has not got into literature and never will but that keeps the earth sweet that saves on superfluities and spends on essentials that goes rusty and educates the boy that sells the horse and builds the school works early and late takes two looms in the factory three looms six looms and pays off the mortgage on the paternal farm and then goes back cheerfully to work again we can ill spare the commanding social benefits of cities they must be used yet cautiously and haughtily and will yield their best values to him who best can do without them keep the town for occasions but the habit should be formed to retirement solitude the safeguard of mediocrity is to genius the stern friend the cold obscure shelter where molt the wings which will bear it farther than suns and stars who shall inspire and lead his race must be defended from travelling with the souls of other men from living breathing reading and writing in the daily time-worn yoke of their opinions in the morning solitude said pythagoras that nature may speak the imagination as she never does in company and that her favourite may make acquaintance with those divine strengths which disclose themselves to serious and abstracted thought tis very certain that plato plotinus archimedes hermes newton milton wordsworth did not live in a crowd but descended into it from time to time as benefactors and the wise instructor will press the point of securing to the young soul in the disposition of time and the arrangements of living periods and habits of solitude the high advantage of university life is often the mere mechanical one i may call it of a separate chamber and fire which parents will allow the boy without hesitation at cambridge but do not think needful at home we say solitude to mark the character of a tone of thought but it can be shared between two or more than two it is happier and not less noble we four wrote neander to his sacred friends will enjoy at hail the inward blessedness of civitas dia whose foundations are forever friendship the more i know you the more i dissatisfy and must satisfy all my wanted companions the very presence stupefies me the common understanding withdraws itself from one centre to all existence solitude takes off the pressure of present opportunities that more catholic and humane relations may appear the saint and poet seek privacy to ends the most public and universal and it is the secret of culture to interest the man more in his public than in his private quality here is a new poem which elicits a good many comments in the journals and in conversation from these it is easy at least to eliminate the verdict which readers pass upon it and that is in the main unfavourable the poet as a craftsman is only interested in the praise accorded to him and not in the censure though it be just and the poor little poet hearkens only to that and rejects the censure as proving incapacity in the critic but the poet cultivated becomes a stockholder in both companies say mr curfew in the curfew stock in, and in the humanity stock and the last time exalts as much in the demonstration of the unsoundness of curfew as his interest in the former gives him pleasure in the currency of curfew for the depreciation of his curfew stock only shows the immense value of the humanity stock as soon as he sides with this critic against himself with joy he is a cultivated man we must have an intellectual quality in all property and all action or they are not i must have children i must have events i must have a social state and history or my thinking and speaking want body or basis but to give these accessories any value i must know them as contingent and rather showy possessions which pass for more to the people than to me see this abstraction in scholars as a matter of course but what a charm it adds when observed in practical men bonaparte like caesar was intellectual he could look at every object for itself without affectation though an egotist a la tron, he would criticize a play a building a character on universal grounds and give a just opinion a man known to us only as a celebrity in politics or in trade gains largely in our esteem if we discover he has some intellectual taste or skill as when we learn of lord fairfax the long parliament's general his passion for antiquarian studies or of the french regicide charnot his sublime genius in mathematics or of a living banker his success in poetry or of a partisan journalist his devotion to ornithology so if in travelling in the dreary wilderness to arkansas or texas we should observe on the next seat a man reading horace or marshall or calderon we should wish to hug him 
In callings that require roughest energy, soldiers, sea captains, and civil engineers sometimes betray a fine insight, if only through a certain gentleness when off duty, a good-natured admission that there are illusions, and who shall say that there is not their sport? We only vary the phrase, not the doctrine, when we say that culture opens the sense of beauty. A man is a beggar who only lives to the useful, and, however he may serve as a pin or rivet in the social machine, cannot be said to have arrived at self-possession. I suffer every day from the want of perception of beauty in people. They do not know the charm with which all moments and objects can be embellished, the charm of manners, the self-command of benevolence. Repose and cheerfulness are the badge of the gentleman. Repose and energy. The Greek battle pieces are calm. The heroes, in whatever violent action engaged, retain a serene aspect, as we say of Niagara, that it falls without speed. A cheerful, intelligent face is the end of culture, and success enough, for it indicates that the purpose of nature and wisdom attained. When our higher faculties are in activity, we are domesticated, and awkwardness and discomfort give place to natural and agreeable movements. It is noticed that the consideration of the great periods of space and of astronomy induces a dignity of man and indifference to death. The influence of fine scenery, the presence of mountains, appease our irritations and elevates our friendship. Even a high dome and the expansive interior of a cathedral have a sensible effect on manners. I have heard that stiff people will lose something of their awkwardness under high ceilings and in spacious halls. I think sculpture and painting have an effect to teach us manners and abolish hurry. But overall, culture must reinforce from higher influx the empirical skills of eloquence, or of politics, or of trade, and the useful arts. There is a certain loftiness of thought, power to marshal and adjust particulars, which can only come from an insight of their whole connection. The orator who has once seen things in a divine order will never quite lose sight of this, and will come to affairs as from a higher ground. And though he will say nothing of philosophy, he will have a certain mastery in dealing with them, and an incapableness of being dazzled or frightened, which will distinguish his handling from that of attorneys and factors. A man who stands on a good footing with the head of parties at Washington, reads the rumors of the newspapers and the guesses of provincial politicians, with the key to the right and the wrong in each statement, and sees well enough where all this will end. Our committees will look through your Connecticut machine at a glance and judge of its fitness. And much more, a wise man who knows not only what Plato, but of St. John can show him, can easily raise the affairs he deals with to a certain majesty. Plato says, Pericles owed his elevation to the lessons of Anaxagoras. Brooke descended from a higher sphere than he would influence human affairs. Franklin, Adams, Jefferson, and Washington stood on a fine humanity, before which the brawls of modern senates are but pothouse politics. But there are higher secrets of culture, which are not for the apprentices, but for the proficients. They are lessons only for the brave. We must know our friends under ugly masks. The calamities are our friends. Ben Johnson specifies in his address to the muse. Get him the time's long grudge, the court's ill will, and reconcile, keep him suspected still, make him lose all his friends, and what is worse, almost always, to any better course. With me thou leavest a better muse than thee, and which thou brought me, blessed poverty. I wish to learn philosophy by rote, and play at heroism. But the wiser God said, Take shame, the poverty, and the penal solitude, and belong to true speaking. Try the rough water as well as the smooth. Rough water can teach lessons worth knowing. When the state is unquiet, personal qualities are more than ever decisive. Fear not a revolution which will constrain you to live five years in one. Don't be so tender at making an enemy now and then. Be willing to go to Coventry sometimes, and let the populace bestow on you their coldest contempts. The finished man of the world must eat of every apple once. He must hold his hatred also at arm's length, and not remember spite. He has neither friends nor enemies, but values men only as channels of power. He who aims high must dread an easy home and popular manners. Heaven sometimes hedges a rare character about with ungainliness and odium, as a burr that protects the fruit. If there is any great and good thing in store for you, it will not come at the first or the second call, but in the shape of fashion, ease, and city drawing rooms. Popularity is for dolls. Steep and craggy, said Porphyry, is the path of the gods. Open your Marcus Antonius. In the opinion of the ancients, he was a great man who scorned to shine, and who contested the frowns of fortune. They preferred the noble vessel too late for the tide, contending with winds and waves, dismantled and unrigged, to her companions borne into harbor with colors flying and guns firing. There is none of the social goods that may not be purchased too dear, and mere amiableness must not take rank with high aims and self-subsistency. Betine replies to Gerda's mother, who chides her disregard of dress, If I cannot do as I have in mind, in our poor Frankfurt, I shall not carry things far. And the youth must rate at its true rank the inconceivable levity of local opinion. The longer we live, the more we must endure the elementary existence of men and women. Every brave heart must treat society as a child, and never allow it to dictate. 
All that class of the severe and restrictive virtues, said Burke, are almost too costly for humanity. Who wishes to be severe? Who wishes to resist the eminent and polite, in behalf of the poor and low and impolite? And who that dares do it, and can keep his temper sweet, is frolic spirits. The high virtues are not debonair, but have their redress in being illustrious at last. What forest of laurel we bring, and the tears of mankind to those who stood firm against the opinion of their contemporaries. The measure of a master is his success in bringing all men round to his opinion twenty years later. Let me say here that culture cannot begin too early. In talking with scholars, I observed that they lost on ruder companions those years of boyhood which alone could give imaginative literary religious and infinite quality in their esteem. I find, too, that the chance for appreciation is much increased by being the son of an appreciator, and that these boys who now grow up are caught not only years too late, but two or three births too late, to make the best scholars of. And I think it is presentable motive of a scholar that, as in an old community, a well-born proprietor is usually found, after the first heats of youth, to be a careful husband, and to feel a habitual desire that the estate shall suffer no harm by his administration, but shall be delivered down to the next heir, in a good condition as he received it, so a considerate man will reckon himself a subject to that secular amelioration by which mankind is mollified, cured, and refined and will shun every expenditure of his forces on pleasure or gain, which will jeopardize the social and secular accumulation. The fossil strata show us that nature began with rudimentary forms, and rose to the more complex, as fast as the earth was fit for their dwelling place, and that the lower perish as the higher appear. Very few of our race can be said to be yet finished men. We still carry sticking in us some of the remains of the preceding inferior quadruped organization. We call these millions men, but they are not yet men half engaged in the soil planning to get free man needs all the music that can be brought to disengage him if love red love with tears and joy if want with his scourge if war with his cannonade if christianity with his charity if trade with its money if art with his portfolios if science with the telegraphs through the depths of space and time can set his dull nerves throbbing and by loud taps on the tough chrysalis break its walls and let the new creature emerge erect and free make way and sing pan the age of the quadruped is to go out the age of the brain and the heart is to come in the time will come when the evil forms we have known can no more be organized man's culture can spare nothing wants all the material he is to convert all impediments into instruments all enemies into power the formidable mischief we only make the more useful slave and if one shall read the future of the race hinted in the organic effort of nature to mount and ameliorate and the corresponding impulse to the better in the human being we shall dare affirm that there is nothing he will not overcome and convert but alas culture shall absorb the chaos and gehenna he will convert the furies into muses and the hells into benefit end of culture recording by daniel christopher june Visit my website at perfectidius.com. It's perfect, I D I U S dot com. Essay five of Conduct of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Christopher June. Conduct of Life by Ralph Waldo Emerson Behavior Grace, beauty, and caprice Build this golden portal Graceful women, chosen men Dazzle every mortal Their sweet and lofty continents His enchanting food He need not go to them Their forms beset his solitude He looketh seldom in their face His eyes explore the ground The green grass is a looking glass Whereon their traits are found Little he says to them So dances his heart in his breast the tranquil mien bereaveth him of wit, words, and rest. Too weak to win, too fond to shun, the tyrants of his doom. The much deceived endymium slips behind a tomb. The soul which animates nature is not less significantly published in the figure, movement, and gestures of animated bodies than in its last vehicle of articulate speech. The silent, subtle language is manners, not what, but how. Life expresses. A statue has no tongue, and needs none. Good tableau do not need declamation. Nature tells every secret once. Yes, but in man she tells it all the time, by form, attitude, gesture, mien, face, and parts of the face, and by the whole action of the machine. The visible carriage or action of the individual, as resulting from its organization and his will, combined we call manners. What are they but thought entering the hands and feet, controlling the movements of the body, the speech, and behavior? There is always the best way of doing everything, if it be to boil an egg. 
Manners are the happy ways of doing things, each one a stroke of genius or of love, now repeated and hardened into usage. They form at last a rich varnish with which the routine of life is washed and its details adorned. If they are superficial, so are the dewdrops, which give such a depth to the morning meadows. Manners are very communicable. Men catch them from each other. Consuelo in the romance boasts of the lessons she had given to the nobles and manners on the stage. In real life, Tom will taught Napoleon the arts of behavior. Genius invents fine manners, which the baron and the baroness copy very fast, by the advantage of a palace, better the instruction. They stereotype the lessons they have learned into a mode. The power of manners is incessant, an element as unconcealable as fire. The nobility cannot in any country be disguised, and no more in a republic or a democracy than in a kingdom. No man can resist their influence. There are certain manners which are learned in good society, of that force that, if a man have them, he or she may be considered, and is everywhere welcome, though without beauty or wealth or genius. Give a boy address and accomplishments, and you give him the mastery of palaces and fortunes where he goes. He has not the trouble of earning or owning them. They solicit him to enter and possess. We send girls of a timid, retreating disposition to the boarding school, to the riding school, to the ballroom, or wheresoever they can come into acquaintance with the nearness of leading persons of their own sex, where they might learn a dress and see it near at hand. The power of a woman of fashion to lead, and also to daunt and repel, derives from their belief that she knows resources and behaviors not known to them, and when these have mastered her secret, they learn to confront her and recover their self-possession. Every day bears witness to their gentle rule. People who would obtrude now do not obtrude. The mediocre circle learns to demand that which belongs to a high state of nature or of culture. Your manners are always under examination, and by committees little suspected. A police and citizens close, but are awarding or denying you very high prizes when you least think it. We talk much of utilities, but tis our manners that associate us. In hours of business we go to him who knows, or has, or does this or that which we want, and we do not let our taste or feelings stand in the way. But this activity over, we return to our indolent state, and wish for those we can be at ease with. Those who will go where we go, whose manners do not offend us, whose social tone chimes with ours. We reflect on the persuasive and cheering force, how they recommend, prepare, and draw people together, how in all clubs manners make the members, how manners make the fortune of the ambitious youth, that, for the most part, his manners marry him, and, for the most part, he marries manners. We think what keys they are, and to what secrets what high lessons and inspiring tokens of character they convey, and what divination is required in us for the reading of this fine telegraph, we see what range the subject has, and what relations to convenience, power, and beauty. Their first service is very low, when they are the minor morals, but tis the beginning of civility to make us, I mean, endurable to each other. We prize them for their rough plastic, abstergent force. We get people out of the quadruped stage, get them washed, clothed, and set up on end, to sloth their animal husks and habits, Convell them to be clean, over all their spite and meanness. Teach them to stifle the base, and choose the generous expression, and make them know how much happier the generous behaviors are. Bad behavior the law cannot reach. Society is infested with rude, cynical, restless, and frivolous persons who prey upon the rest, and whom a public opinion concerned into good manners, forms accepted by the sense of all, can reach. The contradictors and railers at publics and private tables, who are like terriers, who conceive it the duty of a dog of honor to growl at any passer-by, and do the honors of the house by barking him out of sight. I have seen men who neigh like a horse when you contradict them, or say something which they do not understand. Then the overbold, who make their own invitation to your hearth, the persevering talker, who gives you his society in large, saturating doses, the pitiers of themselves, a perilous class, the frivolous Asmodeus, who relies on you to find him in ropes of sand to twist the monotones, in short, every stripe of absurdity, these are social inflictions which the magistrate cannot cure or defend you from, and which must be entrusted to the restraining force of customs and proverbs, and familiar rules of behavior impressed on young people in their school days. In the hotels on the banks of the Mississippi they print, or used to print, among the rules of the house that no gentleman can be permitted to come to the public table without his coat. In the same country, in the pews of the churches, little placards plead with worshippers against the fury of expectoration. Charles Dickens self-sacrificingly undertook the reformation of American manners in unspeakable particulars. I think the lesson was not quite lost, that it held bad manners up, so the churls could see the deformity. Unhappily, the book had its own deformities. It ought not to need to print in a reading room a caution of strangers not to speak loud, nor to persons who look over fine engravings that they should be handled like cobwebs and butterflies' wings. 
nor to persons who look at marble statues that they shall not smite them with canes but even in the perfect civilization of this city such cautions are not quite needless in the athenaeum and city library manners are factitious and grow out of circumstances as well as out of character if you look at the pictures of patricians and of peasants of different periods and countries you will see how well they match the same class in our towns the modern aristocrat not only is well drawn in titian's venetian dodges and in roman coins and statues but also in the pictures which commodore perry brought home of dignitaries in japan broad lands and great interests not only arrive to such heads as can manage them but form manners of power a keen eye too will see nice gradations of rank or see in the manners of the degree of homage the party is wont to receive a prince who is accustomed every day to be courted and deferred to by the highest grandees acquires a corresponding expectation and a becoming mode of receiving and replying to this homage there are always exceptional people and modes english grandees affect to be farmers clever house is a fop and under the finish of dress the levity of behavior hides the terror of his war but nature and destiny are honest and never fail to leave their mark to hang out a sign for each and every quality it is much to conquer one's face and perhaps the ambitious youth thinks he got the whole secret when he has learned that disengaged manners are commanding don't be deceived by a facile exterior tender men sometimes have strong wills we had in massachusetts an old statesman who had sat all his life in courts and in chairs of state without overcoming an extreme irritability of face voice and bearing when he spoke his voice would not serve him it cracked it broke it wheezed it piped little cared he knew that it had got to pipe or wheeze or, sc or screech his argument and his indignation when he sat down after speaking he seemed in a sort of fit held on to his chair with both hands but underneath all his irritability was a puissant will firm and advancing and a memory in which lay in order and method like geologic strata every fact of his history and under the control of his will matters are partly factitious but mainly there must be capacity for culture in the blood else all culture is vain the obstinate prejudice in favor of blood which lies at the base of the feudal and monarchical fabrics of the old world has some reason in common experience every man mathematician artist soldier and merchant looks with confidence for some traits and talents in his own child which he would not dare to presume in the child of a stranger the orientalists are very orthodox on this point take a thorn bush says the emir abdel kader and sprinkle it for a whole year with water it will yield nothing but thorn take a date tree leave it without culture and it will always produce dates nobility is the date tree and the arab populace is a bush of thorns a main fact in the history of manners is the wonderful expressiveness of the human body if it were made of glass or of air and the thoughts were written on steel tablets within it could not publish more truly its meaning than now wise men read very sharply all your private history and your look and gait and behavior the whole economy of nature is bent on expression the tell-tale body has all tongues men are like geneva watches with crystal faces which expose the whole movement they carry the liqueur of life flowing up and down in those beautiful bottles and announcing to the curious how it is with them the face and eyes reveal that the spirit is doing how old it is what aims it has the eyes indicate the antiquity of the soul or through how many forms it has already ascended it almost violates the proprieties if we say above the breath here that the confessing eye does not hesitate to utter to every street passenger man cannot fix his eye on the sun and so far seems imperfect in siberia a late traveler found men who could see the satellites of jupiter with their unarmed eye in some respects the animals excel us the birds have a longer sight beside the advantage of their wings of a higher observatory a cow can bid her calf by secret signal probably the eye to run away or to lie down and hide itself the jockeys say of certain horses that they look over the whole ground the outdoor life the hunting the labor give equal vigor to the human eye the farmer looks out at you as strong as a horse his eye beam is like the stroke of a staff and i can threaten like a loaded and leveled gun or can insult like hissing or kicking or in its altered mood by beams of kindness it can make the heart dance with joy the eye obeys exactly the action of the mind when a thought strikes us the eyes fix us and remain gazing at a distance in enumerating the names of persons or of countries as france germany spain turkey the eyes wink at each new name there is no nicety of learning sought by the mind which the eyes do not vie in acquiring an artist said michelangelo must have his measuring tools not in the hand but in the eye there is no end to the catalogue of its performances whether in indolent vision that of the health and beauty or in strained vision that of art and labour eyes are bold as lions roving running leaping here and there far and near they speak all languages they wait for no introduction they are no englishmen ask no leave of age or rank they respect neither poverty nor riches neither learning nor power 
nor virtue, nor sex, but intrude and come again, and go through and through you in a moment of time. What inundation of life and thought is discharged from one soul into another through them? The glance is natural magic. The mysterious communication established across a house between two entire strangers moves all the springs of wonder. The communication by the glance is in the greatest part not subject to the control of the will. It is the bodily symbol of identity of nature. We look into the eyes to know if this other form is another self, and the eyes will not lie, but make a faithful confession what inhabitant it is there. The revelations are sometimes terrific. The confession of a low, usurping devil is there made, and the observer shall seem to feel the stirring of owls and bats and horned hooves, where he looked for innocence and simplicity. Tis remarkable, too, that the spirit that appears at the windows of the house does not at once invest himself a new form of his own to the mind of the beholder. The eyes of men converse as much as their tongues, with the advantage that the ocular dialect needs no dictionary, but is understood all the world over. When the eyes say one thing and the tongue another, a practiced man relies on the language of the first. If the man is off his center, the eyes show it. You can read in his eyes of your companion, whether your argument hits him, though his tongue will not confess it. There is a look by which a man shows he is going to say a good thing, a look when he has said it. Vain and forgotten are all the fine offers and offices of hospitality, if there is no holiday in the eye. How many furtive inclinations avowed by the eye, though dissembled by the lips. One comes away from a company in which, it may easily happen, he has said nothing, and no important remark has been addressed to him, and yet, if in sympathy with the society, he shall not have a sense of this fact, such a stream of life has been flowing into him, and out from him through the eyes. There are eyes, to be sure, that give no admission into the man than blueberries. Others are liquid and deep, wells that a man might fall into. Others are aggressive and devouring, seem to call out to the police, take all too much notice, and, and require crowded broadways, and security of millions to protect individuals against them. The military eye I meet, now darkly sparkling under clerical and under rustic brows. Tis a city of Lacedaemon, tis a stack of bayonets. There are asking eyes, asserting eyes, prowling eyes, the eyes full of fate, some of good, some of sinister omen. The alleged power to charm down insanity, or ferocity and beasts, is a power behind the eye. It must be a victory achieved in the will, before it can be signified in the eye. It is very certain that each man carries in his eye the exact indication of his rank and the immense scale of men. We are always learning to read it. A complete man should need no auxiliaries to his personal presence. Whoever looked on him would consent to his will, being certified that his aims were generous and universal. The reason why men do not obey us is because they see the mud at the bottom of our eye. If the organ of sight is such a vehicle of power, the other features have their own. A man finds room in the few square inches of the face for the traits of all his ancestors, for the expression of all his history and his wants. The sculptor and Wickelman and Lavater will tell you how significant a feature is the nose, how its forms express strength or weakness of will and good or bad temper. The nose of Julius Caesar, of Dante, of Pitt, suggests the terror of the beak, what refinement and what limitations the teeth betray. Beware you don't laugh, said the wise mother, for then you show all your faults. Baljac left in manuscript a chapter which he called Theory de la Démarche, in which he says the look, the voice, the respiration, and the attitude or walk are identical. But as it has not been given to man the power to stand guard at once over these four different simultaneous expressions of his thought, watch that one which speaks out the truth, and you will know the whole man. Palaces interest us mainly in the exhibition of manners, which, in the idle and expansive society dwelling in them, are raised to a high art. The maxim, of course, is the manner is power. A calm and resolute bearing, a polished speech, an embellishment of trifles, and the art of hiding all uncomfortable feeling are essential to the courtier. In St. Simon, and Cardinal de Retz, and Rutterer, and an encyclopedia of memoirs will instruct you, if you wish, in these potent secrets. Thus it is a point of pride with kings to remember faces and names. It is reported of one prince that his head had the air of leaning downwards, in order not to humble the crowd. There are people who come in ever like a child with a piece of good news. It was said of the late Lord Holland that he always came down to breakfast with the air of a man who had just met with some signal good fortune. In Notre Dame, the grandee took his place in the dais with the look of one who was thinking of something else, but we must not peep and eavesdrop at palace doors. Fine manners need the support of fine manners in others. A scholar may be a well-bred man, or he may not. The enthusiast is introduced to polished scholars in society, and is chilled and silenced by finding himself not in their element. They all have somewhat which he has not, and it seems ought to have. But if he finds the scholar apart from his companions, it is then the enthusiast's turn, and the scholar has no defense, but must deal on his terms. Now they must fight the battle out on their private strengths. 
Was the talent of that character so common, the successful man of the world, in all of Mart's senates and drawing rooms, manners, manners of power, sense to see his advantage, and manners up to it? See him approach his man. He knows the troops behave as they are handled at first. That is a cheap secret. Just what happens to every two persons who meet on any affair. One instantly perceives that he has the key to the situation, that his will comprehends the other's will as the cat does the mouse and he has only to use courtesy and furnish good-natured reasons to his victim to cover up his chain lest he be shamed into resistance the theatre in which the science of manners is a formal importance is not with us a court but dress circles wherein after the close of the day's business men and women meet at leisure for mutual entertainment in ornamental drawing-rooms of course there is every variety of attraction and merit but to earnest persons to youths or maidens who have great object to the heart we can extol it highly a well-dressed, talkative company, where each is bent to amuse the other, yet the high-born Turk who came hither fancied that every woman seemed to be suffering for a chair, that all the talkers were brained and exhausted by the deoxygenated air. It spoiled the best persons, it put all on stilts, yet here are the secret biographies written and read. The aspect of that man is repulsive, I do not wish to deal with him, the other is irritable, shy, and on his guard. The youth looks humble and manly, I choose him. Look on this woman, there is not beauty, nor brilliant sayings, nor distinguished power to serve you, but all see her gladly, her whole air and impression are healthful. Here comes the sentimentalists and the invalids. Here is Elise, who caught cold coming in the world, and has always increased it since. There are creep mouse manners, and thievish manners. Look at Northcote, said Fuseli. He looks like a rat who has seen a cat. In the shallow company, easily excited, easily tired, here is the columnar Bernard, the Alleghanies do not express more repose than his behavior. Here are the sweet following eyes of Cecile. It seems always that she demanded the heart. Nothing can be more excellent and kind than the Corinthian grace of Gertrude's manners, and yet Blanche, who has no manners, has better manners than she, for the movements of Blanche are the sallies of a spirit which is sufficient for the moment, and she can afford to express every thought by instant action. Manners have been somewhat cynically defined as a contrivance of wise men to keep fools at a distance. Fashion is shrewd to detect those who do not belong to her train, and seldom waste her attentions. Society is very swift in its instincts, and, if you do not belong to it, resistance sneers at you, or quietly drops you. The first weapon enrages the party attacked, the second is still more effective, but is not to be resisted, as the date of the transaction is not easily found. People grow up and grow old under this infliction, and never suspect the truth, ascribing the solitude which acts on them very injuriously to any cause but the right one. The basis of good manners is self-reliance. Necessity is a law of all who are not self-possessed. Those who are not self-possessed obtrude and pain us. Some men appear to feel that they belong to a pariah class. They fear to offend. They bend and apologize, and walk through life with a timid step. As we sometimes dream that we are in a well-dressed company without any coat, so Godfrey acts ever as if he suffered from some mortifying circumstance. The hero should find himself at home wherever he is, should impart comfort by his own security and good nature to all beholders. The hero is suffered to be himself. A person of strong mind comes to perceive that for him an immunity is secured so long as he renders to society that service which is native and proper to him, an immunity from all the observances, yea, and duties, which society so tyrannically imposes on the rank and file of its members. Euripides, says Hespasia, has not the fine manners of Sophocles, but, she adds good-humouredly, the movers and masters of our soul have surely a right to throw out their limbs as carelessly as they pleased, on the world that belongs to them, and therefore the creatures they have animated. Manners require time, as nothing is more vulgar than haste. Friendship should be surrounded by ceremonies and respects, and not crushed into corners. Friendship requires more time than poor busy men can usually command. Here comes to me Roland, with a delicacy of sentiment, leading and wrapping him like a divine cloud or holy ghost. It is a great destitution to both that this should not be entertained with large leisures, but contrariwise should be balked by importune affairs. But through this lustrous varnish, the reality is ever shrinking. It is hard to keep the what from breaking through this pretty painting of the how. The core will come to the surface. Strong will and keen perception overpower old manners and create new. The thought of the present moment has a greater value than all the past. In persons of character, we do not remark manners because of their instantaneousness. We are surprised by the thing done, out of all power to watch the way of it, and nothing is more charming than to recognize the great style that which runs through the actions of such. People masquerade before us in their fortunes, titles, offices, and connections, as economic and civil presidents, or senators, or professors, or great lawyers, and impose on us the frivolous, and a good deal on each other, by these fames. At least it is a point of prudent good manners to treat these reputations tenderly, as if they were merited. 
but the sad realist knows these fellows at a glance, and they know him, as when in Paris the chief of police enters the ballroom, so many diamond pretenders shrink and make themselves as inconspicuous as they can, or give him a supplicating look as they pass. I had received, said I Sybil, I had received at birth the fatal gift of penetration, and these Cassandras are always born. Manners impress as they indicate real power. A man who is sure of his point carries a broad and contented expression, which everybody reads. And you cannot rightly train one to an air and manner except by making him the kind of man of whom the manner is the natural expression. Nature forever puts a premium on reality. What is done for effect is seen to be done for effect. What is done for love is felt to be done for love. A man inspires affection and honor because he was not lying in wait for these. The things of a man for which we visit him were done in the dark and in the cold. A little integrity is better than any career. So deep are the sources of this surface action that even the size of your companion seems to vary with his freedom of thought. Not only is he larger when at ease, and his thoughts generous, but everything around him becomes variable with expression. No carpenter's rule, no rod and chain will measure the dimensions of any house or house lot. Go into the house. If the proprietor is constrained and deferring, it is of no importance how large his house, how beautiful his grounds. You quickly come to the end of it all. But if the man is self-possessed and happy, and at home, his house is deep-founded, indefinitely large and interesting the roof and dome buoyant as the sky. Under the humblest roof the commonest person in plain clothes sits there massive, cheerful, yet formidable like the Egyptian colossi. Neither Aristotle, nor Leibniz, nor Junius, nor Champollion has set down the grammar rules of this dialect, older than Sanskrit, but they who cannot yet read English can read this. Men take each other's measure when they meet for the first time, and every time they meet. How do they get this rapid knowledge, even before they speak, of each other's power and dispositions? One would say that the persuasion of their speech is not in what they say, or that men do not convince by their argument, but by their personality, by who they are, and what they said and did with heretofore. A man already strong is listened to, and everything he says is applauded. Another opposes him with sound argument, but the argument is scouted, until by and by it gets into the mind of some weighty person, then it begins to tell on the community. Self-reliance is the basis of behavior, as it is the guarantee that the powers are not squandered in too much demonstration. In this country, where school education is universal, we have a superficial culture and a profusion of reading and writing and expression. We parade our nobilities in poems and orations, instead of working them up into happiness. There is a whisper out of the ages to him who can understand it. Whatever is known to thyself alone has always very great value. There is some reason to believe that, when a man does not write his poetry, it escapes by other vents through him, instead of the one vent of writing, clings to his forms and manners, whilst poets often have nothing poetical about them except their verses. Jacobi said that when a man has fully expressed his thought, he has somewhat less possession of it. One would say the rule is this, what a man is irresistibly urged to say helps him and us. In explaining his thought to others, he explains it to himself, but when he opens it for show, it corrupts him. Society is the stage in which manners are shown. Novels are their literature. Novels are the journal or record of manners, and the new importance of these books derives from the fact that the novelist begins to penetrate the surface and treat this part of life more worthily. The novels used to be all alike and had a quite vulgar tone. The novels used to lead us on to a foolish interest in the fortunes of the boy and the girl they described. The boy was to be raised from a humble to a high position. He was in want of a wife and a castle, and the object of the story was to supply him with one or of both. We watch sympathetically, step by step, his climbing until, at the last, the point is gained, the wedding day is fixed, and follow the gala procession home to the castle, when the doors are slammed in our face, and the poor reader is left outside in the cold, not enriched by so much as an idea or a virtuous impulse. But the victories of the characters are instant, and victories for all, its greatness enlarges all. We are fortified by every heroic anecdote. The novels are as useful as Bibles, if they teach you the secret, that the best of life is conversation and the greatest success is confidence, or perfect understanding between sincere people. There's a French definition of friendship. Roqua centra. Good understanding. The highest compact we can make with our fellow is, let there be truth between us two forevermore. That is the charm of all good novels, as is the charm of all good histories. The heroes mutually understand from the first, and deal loyally, and with a profound trust in each other. It is sublime to feel and say of another, I need never meet or speak or write to him. We need not reinforce ourselves, or send tokens of remembrance. I rely on him as on myself. If he did thus or thus, I know it was right. In all the superior people I have met, I noticed directness, truth spoken more truly, as if everything of obstruction, of malformation, had been trained away. What have they to conceal? 
What have they to exhibit? Between simple and noble persons, there is always a quick intelligence. They recognize at sight, and meet on a better ground than the talent and skills they may chance to possess, namely on sincerity and uprightness. For it is not what talents or genius a man has, but how he is to his talents, that constitute friendship and character. The man that stands by himself, the universe stands by him also. It is related of the monk Basil. Being excommunicated by the Pope, he was, at his death, sent in charge of an angel to find a fit place of suffering in hell. But such was the eloquence and good humor of the monk, that whenever he went he was received gladly, and civilly treated, even by the most uncivil angels. When he came to discourse with them, instead of contradicting or forcing him, they took his part and adopted his manners, and even good angels came from afar to see him, and take up their abode with him. The angel that was sent to find a place to, of torment for him attempted to remove him to a worse pit, but with no better success. For such was the contented spirit of the monk, that he found something to praise in every place and company, though in hell, and made a kind of heaven of it. At last the escorting angel returned with his prisoner to them that sent him, saying that no phlegathon could be found who would burn him. For that, in whatever condition, Basil remained incorrigibly Basil. The legend says his sentence was remitted, that he was allowed to go into heaven, and was canonized a saint. There was a stroke of magnanimity in the correspondence of Bonaparte with his brother Joseph, when the latter was king of Spain, and complained that he missed in Napoleon's letters the affectionate tone which had marked his childish correspondence. "'I'm sorry,' replied Napoleon. "'You think you shall find your brother again only in the Elysian fields. It is natural that at forty he should not feel towards you as he did at twelve. But his feelings towards you have greater truth and strength. His friendship has the features of his mind. How much we forgive to those who yield us the rarest spectacle of heroic manners!' We will pardon them the want of books, of arts, and even of the gentler virtues. How tenaciously we remember them. Here is a lesson which I brought along with me in boyhood from the Latin school, and which ranks with the best of Roman anecdotes. Marcus Scorus was accused by Quintus Varius Hispanus, and he was excited the allies to take arms against the Republic. But he, full of firmness and gravity, defended himself in this manner. Quintus Varius Hispanus alleges that Marcus Scorus, president of the Senate, excited the allies to arms. Marcus Scorius, president of the Senate, denies it. There is no witness. Which do you believe, Romans? O tri creditas caritas? When he had said these words, he was absolved by the assembly of the people. I have seen manners that make a similar impression with personal beauty, that give the likes exhilaration, and redefine us like that, and in memorable experiences they are suddenly better than beauty, and make that superfluous and ugly but they must be marked by fine perception, the acquaintance with real beauty. They must always show self control. You shall not be facile, apologetic or leaky, but keen over your word, and every gesture and action shall indicate power at rest. But then they must be inspired by the good heart. There is no beautifier of complexion, or form, or behavior, like the wish to scatter joy and not pain around us. Tis good to give a stranger a meal, or a night's lodging. Tis better to be hospitable to his good meaning and thought, and give courage to a companion. We must be as courteous to a man as we are to a picture, which we are willing to give the advantage of good light. Special precepts are not to be thought of. The talent of well-doing contains them all. Every hour will show you a duty as paramount as that of my whim just now, yet I will write it, and there is one topic peremptorily forbidden to all well-bred, to all rational mortals, namely the distempers. If you have not slept, or if you have slept, or if you have headache, or sciatica, or leprosy, or thunderstroke, I beseech you by all angels to hold your peace, and do not flute the morning, to which the housemates bring serene and pleasant thoughts by corruptions and groans. Come out of the azure. Love the day. Do not leave the sky out of your landscape. The oldest and most deserving person should come very modestly into any newly awakened company, respecting the divine communications, out of which all must be resumed to have newly come. The old man who added an elevating culture to our large experience of life said to me, When you come into the room, I think I will study how to make humanity beautiful to you. As respects the delicate question of culture, I do not think that any other than negative rules can be laid down. For positive rules, for suggestion, nature alone inspires it. Who dare assume a guide of youth, a maid, to perfect manners? The golden mean is still delicate, difficult, say frankly, unattainable. What finest hands would not be clumsy to sketch the genial precepts of the young girl's demeanor? The chances seem infinite against success, and yet success is continually attained. There must not be secondariness and tis a thousand to one that her air and manners will at once betray that she is not primary, and that there is some other one or many of her class to whom she habitually postpones herself. But nature lifts her easily, and without knowing it, over these impossibilities, and we are continually surprised with graces and felicities, not only unteachable, but undescribable. End of Behavior 
Recording by Daniel Christopher June. You can visit my website at www.perfectidius.com. That's perfect, I D I U S dot com. Essay 6 of Conduct of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Christopher June. Conduct of Life by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Worship. This is he who, felled by foes, sprung harmless up, refreshed by blows. He to captivity was sold, but him no prison bars would hold. Though they sealed him in a rock, mountain chains he can unlock. Thrown to lions for their meat, the crouching lions kissed his feet. Bound to the stake, no flames appalled, but arched o'er him an honoring vault. This is he men miscall fate, threading dark ways, arriving late, but ever coming in time to crown the truth and hurl wrongdoers down. He is the oldest, the best known. More near than aught thou callst thy own. Yet greeted in another's eyes, disconcerts with glad surprise. This is Jove, who, deaf to prayers, floods with blessings unawares. Draw, if thou canst, the mystic line, severing rightly his from thine, which is human, which divine. Worship Some of my friends have complained, when the preceding papers were read, that we discussed fate, power, and wealth on too low a platform, gave too much line to the evil spirits of the times, too many cakes to Cerberus, and we ran Cudworth's worth of making, by excessive candor, the argument of atheism so strong that he could not answer it. I have no fear of being forced in my own despite to play, as we say, the devil's attorney. I have no infirmity of faith, no belief that it is of much importance what I or any man say. I am sure that a certain truth will be said through me, though I should be dumb, or though I should try to say the reverse, nor do I fear skepticism for any good soul. A just thinker will allow a full swing to a skepticism. I dip my pen in the blackest ink, because I am not afraid of falling into my ink-pot. I have no sympathy with a man who I knew, who, when suicides abounded, told me he dared not look at his razor. We are different of opinions at different hours, but we always may be said to be at heart on the side of truth." I see not why we should give ourselves such sanctified airs. If the divine providence has hid from men neither disease, nor deformity, nor corrupt society, but has stated itself out in passions, in war and trade, in the love of power and pleasure, in hunger and need, in tyrannies, literatures, and arts, let us not be so nice, that we cannot write these facts down coarsely as they stand, or doubt but where there is a counter-statement as ponderous, which we can arrive at, and which, being put, will make all square." The solar system has no anxiety about its reputation, and the credit of truth and honesty is as safe, nor have I any fear that a skeptical bias can be given by leaning hard on the side of fate, of practical power, or of trade, which the doctrine of faith cannot downweigh. The strength of that principle is not measured in ounces and pounds, it tyrannizes at the center of nature. We may well give skepticism as much line as we can, the spirit will return, and fill us. It drives the drivers. It counterbalances any accumulations of power. Heaven kindly gave our blood a moral flow. We are born loyal. The whole creation is made of hooks and eyes, of bitumen, of sticking plaster. And whether your community is made in Jerusalem or in California, of saints or of wreckers, it coheres in a perfect ball. Men as naturally make a state or a church as a caterpillar is a web. If they were more refined, it would be less formal. It would be nervous, like that of the Shakers, who, from long habit of thinking and feeling together, it is said, are affected in the same way, at the same time, to work and to play, as they go with perfect sympathy to their tasks in the field or shop, so they are inclined for a ride or a journey at the same instant, and the horses come up with the family carriage unbespoken to the door. We are born believing. A man bears beliefs, as a tree bears apples. A self-poise belongs to every particle an erectitude to every mind, and is the nemesis and protector of every society. I and my neighbors have been bred in the notion that, unless we come soon to some good church, Calvinism, or Behemanism, or Romanism, or Mormonism, there would be a universal thaw and dissolution. No Isaiah or Jeremiah has arrived. 
nothing can exceed the anarchy that has followed in our skies. The stern old faiths have been pulverized. Tis a whole population of gentlemen and ladies out in search of religions. Tis as flat anarchy in our ecclesiastical realms as that which existed in Massachusetts in the Revolution, which prevails now on the slope of the Rocky Mountains or Pikes Peak. Yet we make shift to live. Men are loyal. Nature has self poised in all her works. Certain proportions in which oxygen and azote combine, and, not less a harmony of faculties, a fitness in the spring and then in the regulator. A declining influence of Calvin, of Fenelon, of Wesley, or Channing need give us no uneasiness. The builder of heaven has not so ill constructed his creature as that the religion, that is, the public nature, should fall out. The public and the private element, like north and south, like inside and outside, like centrifugal and centripetal, adhere to every soul, and cannot be subdued, except the soul is dissipated. God builds his temple in the heart on the ruins of churches and religions. In the last chapters, we treated some particulars of the question of culture. But the whole state of man is a state of culture, and its flowering and completion may be described as religion, or worship. There is always some religion, some hope and fear extended into the invisible. From the blind boating which nails a horseshoe to the mass or the threshold, up to the song of the elders of the apocalypse. But the religion cannot rise above the state of the votary. Heaven always bears some proportion to earth. The god of the cannibals will be a cannibal, of the crusaders a crusader, of the merchants a merchant, in all ages, souls out of time, extraordinary, prophetic, are born, who are rather related to the system of the world than to their particular age and locality. These announce absolute truths, which, with whatever reverence are received, are speedily dragged down into a savage interpretation. The interior tribes of our Indians, and some of the Pacific Islanders, flog their gods, when things take an unfortunate turn. The Greek poets did not hesitate to let loose their petulant wists on the deities also. Laomedon, in his anger at Neptune and Apollo, who had built Troy for him, and demanded their price, does not hesitate to menace them that he will cut off their ears. Among our Norse forefathers, King Olaf's mode of converting Ivan to Christianity was to put a pan of glowing coals on his belly, which burst asunder. Wilt thou now, Ivan, believe in Christ, asked Olaf, in excellent faith? Another argument was an adder put into the mouth of the reluctant disciple Rand, who refused to believe. Christianity in the Romantic Ages signifies European culture, the grafted or meliorated tree in a crab forest, and to marry a pagan wife or husband was to marry a beast, and voluntary to take a step backwards towards the baboon. Hengus had Veramant, a daughter both fair and gent, but she was heathen Sarazine, and Terragorn for love fine, her took to fear and to wife, and was cursed in all his life, for he let Christian wed heathen, and mixed our blood as flesh and maiden. What Gothic mixtures the Christian creed drew from the pagan sources, Richard of Devise's chronicle of Richard I's crusade in the 12th century may show, King Richard taunts God with forsaking him. Oh, fie, how unwilling should I be to forsake thee in so forlorn and dreadful a position, were I thy lord and advocate, as thou art mine. In sooth, my standards will in future be despised, not through my fault, but through thine. In sooth, not through my cowardice and my warfare, art thou my thyself, my king and my god conquered this day, and not Richard thy vassal. The religion of the early English is anomalous, so devout and so blasphemous in the same breath. Such is Chaucer's extraordinary confusion of heaven and earth in the picture of Dido. She was so fair, so young, so lusty, and her eyes glad, that if that god that heaven and earth made would have a love for beauty and goodness and womanhood, truth and seemliness, whom should he love in but this lady sweet, wherein no woman to himself half so meet? With these grossnesses we complacently compare our own taste and decorum. We think and speak with more temperance and gradation. But is not indifferentism as bad as superstition? We live in a transition period, when the old faith which comforted nations, and not only so, but made nations, seem to have spent their force. I do not find the religions of men at this moment very creditable to them, but either childish and insignificant, or unmanly and effeminating. The fatal trait is the divorce between religion and morality. Here are no-nothing religions, or churches that prescribe intellect, scordatory religions, slave-holding and slave-trading religions, and even in our decent populations, idolatries wherein the whiteness of the ritual covers scarlet indulgence. The lover of the old religion complains that our contemporaries, scholars as well as merchants, succumb to a great despair. 
have corrupted into a timorous conservatism and believe in nothing. In our large cities, the population is godless, materialized, no bond, no fellow feeling, no enthusiasm. These are not men, but hungers, thirsts, fevers, and appetites of walking. How is it people manage to live on, so aimless as they are? After their peppercorn aims are gained, it seems as if the lime in their bones alone held them together. And not any worthy purpose. There is no faith in the intellectual, none in the moral universe. There is faith in chemistry, in meat, in wine, in wealth, in machinery, in the steam engine, galvanic battery, turbine wheels, sewing machines, and in public opinion, but not in divine causes. A silent revolution has loosed the tensions of the old religious sects, and in place of the gravity and permanence of those societies of opinion, they run into freak and extravagance. In creeds never was such levity. Witness the heathenism in Christianity, the periodic revivals, the millennial mathematics, the peacock ritualism, the retrogression into popery, the maundering of Mormons, the squalor of mesmerism, the deliration of wrappings, the rat and mouse revelations, thumps and table drawers, the black arts, the architecture, the music, the prayer, partake of the madness. The arts sink into shifts and make-believe. Not knowing what to do, we ape our ancestors. The churches stagger backwards the mummeries of the dark ages. But the irresistible maturing of the general mind, the Christian tradition has lost their hold. The dogma of the mystic offices of Christ being dropped, and the standing of his genius as a moral teacher, it is impossible to maintain the old emphasis of his personality, and it recedes, as all persons must, before the sublimity of the moral laws. From this change, and in the momentary absence of any religious genius that could offset the immense material activity, there is a feeling that religion is gone. When Paul Leroux offered his article, Dieu, to the conductor of the leading French journal, he replied, La question de dia manque d'actualité. In Italy, Mr. Gladstone said of the late King of Naples, it has been a proverb, that he has erected the negation of God into a system of government. In this country, the like stupefaction was in the air, and the phrase, higher law, became a political jibe. What proof of infidelity, like the toleration of propagandism of slavery? What, like the direction of education? What, the faculty of conversation? What, like the facility of conversion? What, like the externality of churches, that once sucked the roots of right and wrong, and now have perished away till they are a speck of whitewash on the wall? What proof of skepticism, like the base rate at which the highest mental and moral gifts are held? Let a man attain the highest and broadest culture that any American has possessed. Then let him die by sea storm, railroad collision, or other accident, and all America will acquiesce that the best thing has happened to him, that after the education has gone far, such is the expensiveness of America, that the best use to put a fine person is to drown him to save his board. Another scar of his skepticism is the distrust in human virtue. It is believed by well-dressed proprietors that there is no more virtue than they possess, that the solid portion of society exists for the arts of comfort, that life is an affair to put somewhat between the upper and lower mandibles. How prompt the suggestion of a low motive! Certain patriots in England devoted themselves for years to creating a public opinion that should break down the corn laws and establish free trade. Well, says the man on the street, Cobden got a stripend out of it. Kossuth fled hither across the ocean to try if he could arouse the new world to a sympathy with European liberty. I said the New York. He made a handsome thing of it, enough to make him comfortable for life. See what allowance vice finds in a respectable and well-conditioned class. If a pickpocket intrude into the society of gentlemen, they exert what moral force they have, and he finds himself uncomfortable and glad to get away. But if an adventurer go through all the forms, procure himself to be elected to be post of trust, as of a senator or president, though by the same arts as we detest in the house thief, the same gentlemen who agree to discountenance in the private rogue will be forward to show civilities and marks of respect to the public one, and no amount of evidence of his crimes will prevent them from giving him ovations, complimentary dinners, opening their houses to him, and priding themselves on his acquaintance. We were not deceived by the professions of the private adventurer. The louder he talked of his honor, the faster we counted our spoons. But we appealed to the sanctified preamble of the messages and proclamations of the public sinner as a proof of sincerity. It must be that they who pay this homage have said to themselves, On the whole, we don't know about this that you call honesty. A bird in the hand is better. Even well disposed, good sort of people are touched with the same infidelity, and for brave, straightforward action, use half-measures and compromises. 
forgetful that a little measure is a great error, forgetful that a wise mechanic uses a sharp tool. They go on choosing the dead men of routine. But the official men can in no wise help you in any question of today, they depriving entirely from the old dead things. Only those who can help in counsel or conduct, who did not make a party pledge to defend this or that, but who are appointed by God Almighty, before they came into the world, to stand for this which they uphold. It has been charged that a want of sincerity in leading men is a vice general throughout American society, but the multitude of the sick shall not make us deny the existence of health. In spite of our imbecility and terrors, the universal decay of religion, etc., etc., the moral sense reappears today with the same morning newness that has been from of old the fountain of beauty and strength. You say there is no religion now. It is like saying in rainy weather there is no sun, when at that moment we are witnessing one of his superlative effects. The religion of the cultivated class now, to be sure, consists in an avoidance of acts and engagements which it was once their religion to assume. But this avoidance will yield spontaneous forms in their due hour. There is a principle which is the basis of things, which all speech aims to say, and all action to evolve, a simple, quiet, undescribed, undescribable presence, dwelling very peacefully in us, our rightful Lord. We are not to do, we are to let do, not to work, but to be worked upon. And to this homage there is a consent of all thoughtful and just men in all ages and conditions. To this sentiment belong vast and sudden enlargements of power. "'Tis remarkable that our faith in ecstasy consists with total inexperience of it. it. Is the order of the world to educate with accuracy the senses and the understanding, and the engineer to work to draw out these powers in propriety, no doubt, has its office. But we are never without a hint that these powers are mediate and servile, and that we are one day to deal with real being, essences with essences. Even the fury of material activity has some results, friendly to moral health. The energetic actions of the times develops individualism, and the religious appear isolated. I see this as a step in the right direction. Heaven deals with us on no representative system. Souls are not saved in bundles. The Spirit saith to them, How is it with thee, thee personally? Is it well? Is it ill? For great nature, it is happiness to escape a religious training. Religion of character is so apt to be invaded. Religion must always be a crab fruit. It cannot be crafted and keep its wild beauty. I have seen, said a traveler, who had known the extremes of society, I have seen human nature in all its forms. It is everywhere the same, but the wilder it is, the more virtuous. We say, the old forms of religion decay, and that a skepticism devastates the community. I do not think it can be cured or stayed by any modification of theological creeds, much less by theological discipline. The cure for false theology is mother wit. Forget your books and traditions, and obey your moral perceptions at this hour. That which is signified by the words moral and spiritual is a lasting essence, and with whatever illusions we have loaded them, will certainly bring back the words, age after age, to their ancient meaning. I know no words but that mean so much. In our definitions, we grope after the spiritual by describing it as invisible. The true meaning of spiritual is real. That law which executes itself, which works without means, and which cannot be conceived of as not existing. Men talk of mere morality which is much as if one should say, Poor God, with nobody to help him. I find the omnipresence and the almightiness in the reaction of every atom in nature. I can best indicate by examples those reactions by which every part of nature replies to the purpose of the actor, beneficently to the good, penally to the bad. Let us replace sentimentalism by realism, and dare to uncover those simple and terrible laws, which, be they seen or unseen, pervade and govern. Every man takes care that his neighbor shall not cheat him. But a day comes when he begins to care that he do not cheat his neighbor. Then all goes well. He has changed his market cart into a chariot of the sun. What a day dawns when we have taken to heart the doctrine of faith, to prefer, as a better investment, being to doing, being to seeming. Logic to rhythm and to display. The year to the day. The life to the year. Character to performance. I have come to know that justice will be done us, and, if our genius is slow, the term will be long. It is certain that worship stands in some commanding relation to the health of man, and to his highest powers, so as to be in some manner the source of intellect. All the great ages have been ages of belief. I mean, when there was any extraordinary power of performance, when great national movements began, when arts appeared, when heroes existed, when poems were made, the human soul was in earnest, and had fixed its thought on spiritual verities, with as strict a grasp as that of the hands of the sword, or the pencil, or the trowel. 
it is true that genius takes its rise out of the mountains of rectitude and all beauty and power which men covet are somehow born out of the alpine district which any extraordinary degree of beauty in man or woman involves moral charm thus i think we very slowly admit in another man a higher degree of moral sentiment than our own a finer conscience more impressionable or which marks minuter degrees an ear to hear acuter notes of right or wrong than we can i think we listen suspiciously and very slowly to any evidence to that point but once satisfied of such superiority we set no limit on our expectations of his genius for such persons are nearer to the secret of god than others are bathed in sweeter waters they hear notices they see visions where others are vacant we believe the holiness confers a certain insight because not by our private by our public force can we share and know the nature of things there is an intimate interdependence of intellect and morals given the equality of two intellects which will form the most reliable judgment the good or the bad-hearted the heart has its arguments which the understanding is not acquainted for the heart is at once aware of the state of health or disease which is the controlling state that is of sanity or of insanity prior of course to all question of the ingenuity of arguments the amount of facts or the elegance of rhetoric so intimate is the alliance of mind and heart that talent uniformly sinks with character the bias of errors of principle carries away men into perilous courses as soon as their will does not control their passions or talent hence the extraordinary blunders and final wrong head into which men spoiled by ambition usually fall hence the remedy for all blunders the cure of blindness the cure of crime is love as much love so much mind said the latin proverb superiority that has no superior the redeemer instructor of the souls as it is their primal essence is love the moral must be the measure of health if your eye is on the eternal your intellect will grow and your opinions and your actions will have a beauty which no learning or combined advantages of other men can rival the moment of your loss of faith the acceptance of the lucrative standard will be marked in the pause or solstice of genius the sequent retrogression and the inevitable loss of attraction to other minds the vulgar are sensible of the change in you and of your descent and they clap you on your back and congratulate you your increased common sense our recent culture has been in natural science we have learned the manners of the sun and the moon of the rivers and the rains of the minerals and elemental kingdoms of plants and animals man has learned to weigh the sun and its weight neither loses nor gains the path of the star at the moment of an eclipse can be determined to the fraction of the second while well, to him the book of history the book of love the lures of passion and the commandments of duty are opened and the next lesson taught is the continuation of the inflexible law of matter into the subtle kingdom of will and of thought that if in sidereal ages gravity and projection keep their craft and the ball never loses its way in its wild path through space a secret of gravitation a secret of projection will not less tyrannically in human history and keep the balance of power from age to age unbroken for though the new element of freedom in an individual has been admitted yet the primordial atoms are prefigured and determined by moral issues are in search of justice and ultimate right is done religion or worship is the attitude of those who see this unity intimacy and sincerity who see that against all appearances the nature of things work for the truth and right forever tis a short sight to limit our faith in laws to those of gravity of chemistry of botany and so forth those laws do not stop where our eyes lose them but push the same geometry and chemistry up in the invisible plane of social and rational life so that look where we will in a boy's game or in the strifes of races a perfect reaction or perpetual judgment keeps watch and ward and this appears in a class of facts which concerns all men within and above their creeds shallow men believe in luck believe in circumstances it was somebody's name or he happened to be there at the time or it was so then and another day it would have been otherwise strong men believe in cause and effect the man was born to do it and his father was born to be the father of him and of his deed and by looking narrowly you shall see that there is no luck in the matter but it was all a problem in arithmetic or an experiment in chemistry the curve of the flight of the moth is preordained and all things go by number rule and weight skepticism is unbelief in cause and effect a man does not see that as he eats so he thinks as he deals so he is and so he appears he does not see that his son is the son of his thoughts and of his actions that fortunes are not expectations but fruits that relation and connection are not somewhere and sometimes but everywhere and always no miscellany no exemption no anomaly but method and an even web and that comes out what was put in 
As we are, so we do, and as we do, so it is done to us. We are the builders of our fortunes. Can't and lying in the attempt to secure a good which does not belong to us are, once for all, balked in vain. But in the human mind, this tie of fate is made alive. The law is the basis of the human mind. In us, it is inspiration. Out there in nature, we see its fatal strength. We call it the moral sentiment. We owe to the Hindu scriptures a definition of law, which compares well with any of our Western books. Law it is which is without name, or color, or hands, or feet, which is smallest of the least, and largest of the large. All, and knowing all things, which hears without ears, sees without eyes, moves without feet, and seizes without hands. If any reader tax me with using vague and traditional phrases, let me suggest to him, by a few examples, what kind of trust this is, and how real. Let me show him that the dice are loaded, that the colors are fast, because they are the native colors of the fleece, that the globe is a battery, because every atom is a magnet, that the fleece and sincerity of the universe are secured by God's delegating his divinity to every particle. There is no room for hypocrisy, no margin for choice. The countryman leaving his native village for the first time and going abroad finds all his habits broken up. In a few nations and languages his sect, as Quaker, as Lutheran, is lost. What? Is not that necessary to the order of existence of society? He misses this and the commanding eye of his neighborhood, which held him to decorum. This is the peril of New York, of New Orleans, of London, of Paris, to young men. But after a little experience he makes the discovery that there are no large cities, none large enough to hide in that the censors of action are as numerous and as near as Paris, as in Littleton or Portland, that the gossip is as prompt and vengeful, there is no concealment, and for each offense a several vengeance, that reaction, or nothing for nothing, or things are as broad as they are long, is the rule for Littleton as Portland, but for the universe. We cannot spare the coarsest muniment of virtue. We are disgusted by gossip, yet it is of importance to keep the angels in the proprieties. The smallest fly will draw blood and gossip is a weapon impossible to exclude from the privatest, highest, selectest. Nature created a police of many ranks. God was delegated himself to a million deputies. From these low external penalties the scale ascends. Next comes the resentments, the fears which injustice calls out, then the false relations in which the offender is put to other men, and the reaction of his faults on himself in the solitude and devastation of his mind. You cannot hide any secret. If the artist secures flagging spirits with opium or wine, his work will characterize itself as the effect of opium or wine. If you make a picture or a statue, it sets the beholder in the state of mind you had when you made it. If you spend for show on building or gardening or pictures or on equipages, so it will appear. We are all physiognomists and penetrators of character, and things themselves are detective. If you follow the suburban fashion in building a sumptuous-looking house for a little money, it will appear to all eyes as a cheap dear house. There is no privacy that cannot be penetrated. No secret can be kept in the civilized world. Society is a masked ball, where every one hides his real character and reveals it by hiding. If a man wish to conceal anything he carries, those whom he meets know that he conceals somewhat, and usually know what he conceals. Is it otherwise if there be some belief or some purpose he would bury in his breast? Tis as hard to hide as fire. He is a strong man who can hold down his opinion. A man cannot utter two or three sentences without disclosing to intelligent ears precisely where he stands in life and thought, namely, whether in the kingdom of the senses and the understanding, or in that of ideas and imagination, the realm of intuitions and duty. People seem not to see that their opinions of the world is also a confession of character. We can only see what we are, and if we misbehave, we suspect others. The fame of Shakespeare, or of Voltaire, or of Thomas a Kempis, or Bonaparte, characterizes those who give it. As gaslight is found to be the best nocturnal police, so the universe protects itself by pitiless publicity. Each must be armed, not necessarily with musket or pike. Happy, if seeing these, he can feel that he has better muskets and pikes in his energy and constancy. To every creature is his own weapon, however skillfully concealed from himself a good while. His work is sword and shield. Let him accuse none. Let him injure none. The way to mend the bad world is to create the right world. Here is a low political economy plotting to cut the throat of foreign competition and establish our own, excluding others by force or making war on them, or by cunning tariffs, giving the preferences to the worst wares of ours. But the real and lasting victories are those of peace and not of war. The way to conquer the foreign artisan is not to kill him, but to beat his work. 
and the crystal palaces and world fairs with their committees and prizes and all kinds of industry are the results of this feeling the american workman who strikes ten blows with his hammer whilst the foreign workman only strikes one is as really vanquishing that foreigner as if the blows were aimed at and told on his person i look on that man as happy who when there is a question of success looks into his work for reply and not into the market not into opinion not into patronage in every variety of human employment in the mechanical and the fine arts in navigation in farming and legislating there is among the numbers who do their tasks perfunctorily as we say or just to pass as badly as they dare there are the working men on whom the burden of the business falls those who love work and love to see it rightly done who finish their task for its own sake and the state in the world is happy that has the most of such finishers the world will always do justice at last to such finishers it cannot otherwise he who has acquired the ability may wait securely the occasion of making it felt and appreciated and know that it will not loiter men talk as if victory were something fortunate work is victory wherever work is done victory is obtained there is no chance and no blanks you want but one verdict if you have your own you are secure of the rest and yet if witnesses are wanted witnesses are near there was never a man born so wise or good but one or more companions came to the world with him who delight in his faculty and report it i cannot see without awe that no man thinks alone that no man acts alone but the divine assessors who came up with him into life now under one disguise now under another like the police and citizens clothes walk with him step for step through all the kingdom of time his reaction this sincerity is the property of all things to make our word or act sublime we must make it real it is our system that counts not a single word or unsupported action use what language you will you can never say anything but what you are what i am and what i think is conveyed to you in spite of my efforts to hold it back what i am has been secretly conveyed from me to another whilst i was vainly making up my mind to tell him it he has heard from me what i never spoke as men get on in life they acquire a love for sincerity and somewhat less solicitude to be lulled or amused in the progress of the character there is an increasing faith in the moral sentiment and a decreasing faith in propositions young people admire talents and particular excellences as we grow older we value total powers and effects as a spirit or quality of the man we have another sight and a new standard an insight which disregards what is done for the eye and pierces to the doer an ear which hears not for what men say but hears what they do not say there was a wise devout man who was called in the catholic church saint philip neri of whom many anecdotes touching his discernment and benevolence are told at naples and rome among the nuns in a convent not far from rome one had appeared who laid claim to certain rare gifts of inspiration and prophecy and the abbess advised the holy father at rome of the wonderful power shown by her novice the pope did not well know what to make of these new claims and philip coming in from a journey one day he consulted him philip undertook to visit the distant convent he told the abbess the wishes of the holiness and begged her to summon the nun without delay the nun was sent for and as soon as she came into the apartment philip stretched out his leg all besatted with mud and desired her to draw off his boots the young nun who had become the object of much attention and respect drew back with anger and refused the office philip ran out the door mounted his mule and returned instantly to the pope give yourself no uneasiness holy father any longer here is no miracle for there is no humility we need not much mind what people have to say but what they must say what their natures say though their busy artful yankee understanding tried to hold back and choke that word and to articulate something different if we will sit quietly what they ought to say is said with their will or against their will we do not care for you let us pretend that what we will we are always looking through you to the dim dictator behind you whilst your habit or whim chatters we civilly and patiently wait until the wise superior shall speak again even children are not deceived by the false reasons which their parents give in answer to their questions whether touching natural facts or religion or persons when the parent instead of thinking how it really is puts them off with a traditional or hypocritical answer the children perceive that it is a traditional or hypocritical answer to a sound constitution the defect of another is at once manifest and the marks of it are only concealed from us by our own dislocation an anatomical observer remarks with the sympathies of the chest abdomen and pelvis tell at least on the face and on all its features not only does our beauty waste but it leaves word how it went to waste 
Physiognomy and phrenology are not new sciences, but declarations of the soul that is aware of certain new sources of information. And now sciences of broader scope are starting up behind these. And so for ourselves, it is really of little importance what blunders and statement we make. So only we make no willful departures from the truth. How a man's truth comes to mind long after we have forgotten all his words. How it comes to us in silent hours that truth is our only armor in all passages of life and death. Wit is cheap, and anger is cheap. But if you cannot argue or explain yourself to the other party, cleave to the truth against me, against thee, and you gain a station from which you cannot be dislodged. The other party will forget the words that you spoke, but the part you took continues to plead for you. Why should I hasten to solve every riddle which life offers me? I am well assured that the questioner, who brings me so many problems, will bring the answers also in due time. Very rich, very potent, very cheerful giver that he is, he shall have it all his own way, for me. Why should I give up my thought, because I cannot answer an objection to it? Consider only whether it remains in my life the same it was. That only which we have within can we see without. If we meet no gods, it is because we harbor none. If there is grandeur in you, you will find grandeur in porters and sweeps. He only is rightly immortal, to whom all things are immortal. I have read somewhere that none is accomplished, so long as any are incomplete that the happiness of one cannot consist with the misery of any other. The Buddhists say, no seed will die. Every seed will grow. Where is the service which can escape its remuneration? What is vulgar, and the essence of all vulgarity, but the avarice of reward? Tis the difference of artisan and artist, of talent and genius, of sinner and saint. The man whose eyes are nailed not on the nature of his act, but on the wages, whether it be money or office or fame, is almost equally low. He is great, whose eyes are open to see that the reward of action cannot be escaped, because he is transformed into his action, and taketh his nature, which bears its own fruit like every other tree. A great man cannot be hindered from the effort of his act, because it is immediate. The genius of life is friendly to the noble, and the dark brings them friends from afar. Fear God, and where you go, men shall think they walk in hallowed cathedrals. And so I look on those sentiments which make the glory of the human being, love, humility, faith, as being also the intimacy of divinity in the atoms, and that as soon as the man is right, assurances and provisions emanate from the interior of his body and his mind, as when flowers reach the ripeness, incense exhales from them, and, as a beautiful atmosphere is generated from the planet by the average emanation from all its rocks and soils. Thus man is made equal to every event. He can face danger for the right. A poor, tender, painful body, he can run into flame or bullets or pestilence with duty for his guide. He feels the insurance of a just employment. I am not afraid of accident, as long as I am in my place. It is strange that superior persons should not feel that they have some better resistance in cholera than avoiding green peas and salads. Life is hardly respectable, is it? If it has no generous, guaranteeing tasks, no duties or affections, that constitute a necessity of existing. Every man's task is his life preserver. The conviction that his work is dear to God and cannot be spared defends him. The lightning rod that disarms the cloud of its threat is his body and his duty. The high aim reacts on the means, on the days, on the organs of the body. A high aim is curative, as well as arnica. Napoleon, says Goethe, visited those sick of the plague in order to prove that the man who could vanquish fear could vanquish the plague as also. And he was right. Tis incredible what force the will has in such cases. It penetrates the body. It puts it in a state of activity, which repels all hurtful influences, whilst fear invites them. It is related of William of Orange that, whilst he was beseeching a town on the continent, a gentleman sent to him, and a public business came to the camp, and learning that the king was before the walls, ventured to go where he was. He found him directing the operations of his gunners, and, having explained his errand, and received his answer, the king said, do you not know, sir, that every moment you spend here is at the risk of your life? I run no more risk, replied the gentleman, than your majesty. Yes, said the king, but my duty brings me here, and yours does not. In a few minutes the cannonball fell on the spot, and the gentleman was killed. Thus can the faithful student reverse all the warnings of his early instinct, under the guidance of a deeper instinct. He learns to welcome misfortune, learns that adversity is the prosperity of the great. He learns the greatness of humility. He shall work in the dark, work against failure, pain, and ill will. If he is insulted, he can be insulted. 
All is affair is not to insult. Hafiz writes, At the last day men shall wear on their heads the dust, as ensign, and as ornament, of their lowly trust. The moral equalizes all, and riches and power is all. It is the coin which buys all, and which all find in their pocket. Under the whip of the driver, the slave shall feel his equality with saints and heroes. In the greatest destitution and calamity, it surprises man with a feeling of elasticity which makes nothing of loss. I recall some traits of a remarkable person whose life and discourse betrayed many inspirations of his sentiment. Benedict was always great in the present time. He had hoarded nothing from the past, neither in his cabinets, neither in his memory. He had no designs on the future, neither for what he should do to men, nor for what men should do for him. He said, I am never beaten until I know I am beaten. I meet powerful, brutal people to whom I have no skill to reply. They think they have defeated me. It is so published in society in the journals. I am defeated in this fashion, in all men's sight, perhaps a dozen different lines. My leisure shows that I am in debt, cannot yet make my ends meet, and vanquish the enemy so. My race may not be prospering. We are sick, ugly, obscure, and popular. My children may be worsted. I seem to fail, and my friends and clients too. That is to say, in all the encounters that have yet to chance. I have not been weaponed for that particular occasion and have been historically beaten, and yet I know all the time that I have never been beaten, have never yet fought, shall certainly fight when my hour comes, and shall beat. A man, says the Vishnu Sarma, who having well compared his own strength or weakness with that of others, after all doth not know the difference, is easily overcome by his enemies. I spent, he said, ten months in the country, Thick-starred Orion was my only companion. Wherever a squirrel or a bee can go with security, I can go. I ate whatever was set before me. I touched ivy and dogwood. When I went abroad, I kept company with every man on the road, for I knew that my evil and my good did not come from these, but from the spirit whose servant I was. For I could not stoop to be a circumstance as they did, who put their life into the fortune and their company. I would not degrade myself by casting about in my memory for a thought, nor by waiting for one. If the thought came, I will give it entertainment. It should, as it ought, go into my hands and feet. But if it came not spontaneously, it comes not rightly at all. If it can spare me, I am sure I can spare it. It shall be the same with my friends. I never woo the loveliest. I will not ask my friendship or favor. When I come to my own, we shall both be known. Nothing will be asked or to be granted. Benedict went out to seek his friend and met him on the way, but he expressed no surprise at any coincidences. On the other hand, if he called at the door of his friend, and he was not at home, he did not go again, concluding that he had misinterpreted the intimations. He had the whim not to make an apology to the same individual whom he had wronged, for this, he said, was a piece of personal vanity. But he would correct his conduct in that respect in which he had faulted to the next person he should meet. Thus, he said, universal justice was satisfied. Myra came to ask what she should do with the poor Genesee woman who had hired herself to work for her at a shilling a day, and now sickening, was like to be bedridden on her hands. Should she keep her, or should she dismiss her? But Benedict said, Why ask? One thing will clear itself as a thing to be done, and not another, when the hour comes. Is it a question whether to put her into the street? Just as much whether to thrust the little Jenny in your arms into the street. The milk and meal you give to the beggar will fatten Jenny. Thrust the woman out, and you thrust your babe out of doors, whether it so seem to you or not. In the Shakers, so called, I find one piece of belief, in the doctrine in which they faithfully hold, that encourages them to open their doors to every wayfaring man who proposes to come among them. For, they say, the spirit will presently manifest to the man himself, and to the society, what manner of person he is, and whether he belongs among them. They do not receive him, they do not reject him, and not in vain have they worn their clay coat, and drudged in the fields, and shuffled in their Bruin dance from year to year, if they have truly learned this much wisdom. Honor him whose life is perpetual victory, him who, by sympathy with the invisible and real, finds support in labor, instead of praise, who does not shine and would rather not. His eyes open, he makes the choice of virtue, which outrages the virtuous, of religion, which churches stop their discords to burn and exterminate, for the highest virtue is always against the law. Miracle comes to the miraculous, not to the arithmetician. Talent and success interest me but moderately. 
the great class, they who affect our imagination, the men who could not make their hands meet around their object, the rapt, the lost, the fools of ideas, they suggest what they cannot execute. They speak to the ages, and are heard from afar. The spirit does not love cripples and malformations. If there ever was a good man, be certain, there was another, and will be more. And so in relation to the future hour, that spectre clothed with beauty at our curtain by night, at our table by day, the apprehension, the assurance of a coming change. The race of mankind have always offered at least these implied thanks for the gifts of existence, namely, the terror of its being taken away, the insatiable curiosity and appetite for its continuation. The whole revelation which is vouchsafed us, is the gentle trust which in our experience we find will cover over with flowers and slopes of this chasm of immortality the soul when well employed is incurious it is so well that it is sure it will be well it asks no questions of the supreme power the son of antiochus asked his father when he should join battle dost thou fear replied the king that thou only in all the army will not hear the trumpet tis a higher thing to confide that if it is best we should live, we shall live. Tis higher to have this conviction than to have the lease of indefinite centuries and millenniums and eons. Higher than the question of our duration is the question of our deserving. Immortality will come to such as are fit for it, and he who would be a great soul in future must be a great soul now. It is a doctrine too great to rest on any legend, that is, on any man's experience but our own. It must be proved if at all, from our own activity and designs, which imply an interminable future for their play. What is called religion effeminates and demoralizes. Such as you are, the gods themselves could not help you. Men are too often unfit to live, from the obvious inequality to their own necessities, or they suffer from politics, or bad neighbors, or from sickness. They would gladly know that they were to be dismissed from the duties of life. But the wise instinct asks, how will death help them? These are not dismissed when they die. You shall not wish for death out of pusillanimity. The weight of the universe is pressed down on the shoulders of each moral agent to hold him to his task. The only path of escape known in all the world of God is performance. You must do your work before you shall be released. And as far as the question of fact respecting the government of the universe, Marcus Antoninus summed the whole in a word. It is pleasant to die if there be gods, and sad to live if there be none. So I think that the last lesson of life, the choral song which rises from the elements of all angels, is a voluntary obedience, a necessitated freedom. Man is made of the same atoms as the world. He shares the same impressions, dispositions, and destiny. When his mind is illuminated, when the heart is kind, he throws himself joyfully into the sublime order, and does with knowledge what the stones do by structure. The religion which is to guide and fulfill the present and coming ages, whatever else it be, must be intellectual. The scientific mind must have a faith which is science. There are two things, said Muhammad, which I abhor, the learned in his infidelities and the fool in his devotions. Our times are impatient of both, and especially the last. Let us have nothing now which is not its own evidence. There is surely enough for the heart and imagination in the religion itself. Let us not be pestered with assertions and half-truths, with emotions and snuffle. There will be a new church, founded on moral science, at first cold and naked, a babe in a manger again, the algebra and mathematics of ethical law, the church of men to come, without shams or psaltery or sackbut but it will have heaven and earth for its beams and raptors, science for symbol and illustration. It will fast enough gather beauty, music, picture, poetry. Was never stoicism so stern and exigent as this shall be. It shall send man home to a central solitude, shame these social supplicating manners, and make him know that much of the time he must have himself to his friend. He shall expect no cooperation. He shall walk with no companion. The nameless thought, the nameless power, the superpersonal heart, he shall repose alone in that. He needs only his own verdict. No good fame can help, no bad fame can hurt. The laws are his consolers. The good laws themselves are alive. They know if he have kept them. They animate him with the leading of great duty, 
and an endless horizon. Honor and fortune exist to him who always recognizes the neighborhood of the great, always feels himself in the presence of high causes. End of Worship Recording by Daniel Christopher June Essay number seven of Conduct of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Conduct of Life by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Essay seven. Considerations by the way. Hear what British Merlin sung, of keenest eye and truest tongue. Say not the chiefs who first arrive usurp the seats for which all strive. The forefathers this land who found failed to plant the vantage ground. Ever from one who comes to morrow, men wait their good and truth to borrow. But wilt thou measure all thy road, see thou lift the lightest load. Who has little to him who has less can spare. And thou, sindolent son, beware ponderous gold and stuffs to bear. To falter ere thou task, fulfill only the light-armed climb the hill the richest of all lords is youth and ruddy health the loftiest muse live in the sunshine swim the sea drink the wild air's salubrity where the star canopy shines in may shepherds are thankful and nations gay the music that can deepest reach and cure all ill is cordial speech mask thy wisdom with the light Toy with the bow, yet hit the white. Of all wit's uses, the main one is to live well with who has none. Cleave to thine acre, the round year will fetch all fruits and virtues here. Fool and foe may harmless roam, loved and lovers bide at home. A day for toil, an hour for sport, but for a friend is life too short. Considerations by the way. Although this garrulity of advising is born with us, I confess that life is rather a subject of wonder than of didactics. So much fate, so much irresistible dictation from temperament and unknown inspiration enters into it, that we doubt we can say anything out of our own experience whereby to help each other. All the professions are timid and expectant agencies. The priest is glad if his prayers or his sermon meet the condition of any soul if of two, if of ten, tis a signal success. But he walked to the church without any assurance that he knew the distemper or could heal it. The physician prescribes hesitatingly, out of his few resources, the same tonic or sedative to this new and peculiar constitution which he has applied with various success to a hundred men before. If the patient mends, he is glad and surprised, the lawyer advises the client, and tells his story to the jury, and leaves it with them, and is as gay and as much relieved as the client if it turns out that he has a verdict. The judge weighs the arguments, and puts a brave face on the matter, and, since there must be a decision, decides as he can, and hopes he has done justice, and given satisfaction to the community, but is only an advocate, after all. And so is all life a timid and unskilful spectator. We do what we must, and call it by the best names. We like very well to be praised for our action, but our conscience says, not unto us. There's little we can do for each other. We accompany the youth with sympathy, and manifold old sayings of the wise, to the gate of the arena, but is certain that not by strength of ours, or of the old sayings, but only on strength of his own, unknown to us or to any, he must stand or fall. That by which a man conquers in any passage is a profound secret to every other being in the world, and it is only as he turns his back on us and on all men, and draws on this most private wisdom, that any good can come to him. What we have, therefore, to say of life is rather description, or, if you please, celebration, than available rules. Yet vigour is contagious and whatever makes us either think or feel strongly adds to our power, and enlarges our field of action. We have a debt to every great heart, 
to every fine genius, to those who have put life and fortune on the cast of an act of justice, to those who have added new sciences, to those who have refined life by elegant pursuits. It is the fine souls who serve us, and not what is called fine society. Fine society is only a self-protection against the vulgarities of the street and the tavern. Fine society, in the common acceptation, has neither ideas nor aims. It renders the service of perfumery or a laundry, not of a farm or factory. It is an exclusion and a precinct. Sidney Smith said, quote, A few yards in London cement or dissolve friendship. End quote. It is an unprincipled decorum, an affair of clean linen and coaches, of gloves, cards, and elegance in trifles. There are other measures of self-respect for a man than the number of clean shirts he puts on every day. Society wishes to be amused. I do not wish to be amused. I wish that life should not be cheap but sacred. I wish the days to be as centuries, loaded, fragrant. Now we reckon them as bank days by some debt which is to be paid us, or which we are to pay, or some pleasure we are to taste. Is all we have to do to draw the breath in and blow it out again? Porphyry's definition is better. Quote, Life is that which holds matter together. End quote. The babe in arms is a channel through which the energies we call fate, love, and reason visibly stream. See what a cometary train of auxiliaries man carries with him, of animals, plants, stones, gases, and imponderable elements. Let us infer his ends from this pomp of means. Mirabeau said, quote, Why should we feel ourselves to be men, unless it be to succeed in everything, everywhere? You must say of nothing, that is beneath me, nor feel that anything can be out of your power. Nothing is impossible to the man who can will. Is that necessary? That shall be. This is the only law of success. End quote. Whoever said it, this is in the right key. But this is not the tone and genius of the man in the street. In the streets we grow cynical. The men we meet are coarse and torpid. The finest wits have their sediment. What quantities of fribbles, paupers, invalids, epicures, antiquaries, politicians, thieves, and triflers of both sexes might be advantageously spared. Mankind divides itself into two classes, benefactors and malefactors. The second class is vast, the first a handful. A person seldom falls sick, but the bystanders are animated with a faint hope that he will die. Quantities of poor lives, of distressing invalids, of cases for a gun. Franklin said, quote, Mankind are very superficial and dastardly. They begin upon a thing, but, meeting with a difficulty, they fly from it discouraged. But they have capacities if they would employ them. End quote. Shall we then judge a country by the majority or by the minority? By the minority, surely. Tis pedantry to estimate nations by the census or by square miles of land or other than by their importance to the mind of the time. Leave this hypocritical prating about the masses. Masses are rude, lame, unmade, pernicious in their demands and influence, and need not to be flattered, but to be schooled. I wish not to concede anything to them, but to tame, drill, divide, and break them up, and draw individuals out of them. The worst of charity is that the lives you are asked to preserve are not worth preserving. Masses! The calamity is the masses. I do not wish any mass at all, but honest men only, lovely, sweet, accomplished women only, and no shovel-handed, narrow-brained, gin-drinking, million-stockingers or lazzaroni at all. If government knew how, I should like to see it check, not multiply the population." When it reaches its true law of action, every man that is born will be hailed as essential. Away with this hurrah of masses, and let us have the considerate vote of single men, spoken on their honour and their conscience. In old Egypt it was established law that the vote of a prophet 
be reckoned equal to a hundred hands. I think it was much underestimated. Clay and clay differ in dignity, as we discover by our preferences every day. What a vicious practice is this of our politicians at Washington pairing off! As if one man who votes wrong going away could excuse you who mean to vote right for going away, or as if your presence did not tell in more ways than in your vote. Suppose the three hundred heroes at Thermopylae had paired off with three hundred Persians. Would it have been all the same to Greece and to history? Napoleon was called by his men sans mille. Add honesty to him, and they might have called him hundred million. Nature makes fifty poor melons for one that is good, and shakes down a tree full of gnarled, wormy, unripe crabs before you can find a dozen dessert apples and she scatters nations of naked Indians and nations of clothed Christians with two or three good heads among them. Nature works very hard, and only hits the white once in a million throws. In mankind she is contented if she yields one master in a century. The more difficulty there is in creating good men, the more they are used when they come. I once counted in a little neighborhood, and found that every able-bodied man had say from twelve to fifteen persons dependent on him for material aid, to whom he is to be for spoon and jug, for backer and sponsor, for nursery and hospital, and many functions beside. Nor does it seem to make much difference whether he is bachelor or patriarch. If he do not violently decline the duties that fall to him, this amount of helpfulness will in one way or another be brought home to him. This is the tax which his abilities pay." The good men are employed for private centres of use and for larger influence. All revelations, whether of mechanical or intellectual or moral science, are made not to communities but to single persons. All the marked events of our day, all the cities, all the colonizations, may be traced back to their origin in a private brain. All the feats which make our civility were the thoughts of a few good heads. Meantime, this spawning productivity is not noxious or needless. You would say, this rabble of nations might be spared. But no, they are all counted and depended on. Fate keeps everything alive so long as the smallest thread of public necessity holds it on to the tree. The coxcomb and bully and thief class are allowed as proletaries, every one of their vices being the excess or acridity of a virtue. The mass are animal in pupillage, and near chimpanzee, but the units whereof this mass is composed are neuters, every one of which may be grown to a queen bee. The rule is, we are used as brood atoms, until we think, then we use all the rest. Nature turns all malfeasance to good. Nature provided for real needs. No sane man at last distrusts himself. His existence is a perfect answer to all sentimental cavils. If he is, he is wanted, and has the precise properties that are required. That we are here is proof we ought to be here. We have as good right, and the same sort of right, to be here as Cape Cod or Sandy Hook have to be there. To say, then, the majority are wicked means no malice, no bad heart in the observer, but simply that the majority are unripe, and have not yet come to themselves, do not yet know their opinion. That, if they knew it, is an oracle for them and for all. But in the passing moment the quadruped interest is very prone to prevail, and this beast force, whilst it makes the discipline of the world, the school of heroes, the glory of martyrs, has provoked, in every age, the satire of wits and the tears of good men. They find the journals, the clubs, the governments, the churches, to be in the interest and the pay of the devil. And wise men have met this obstruction in their times, like Socrates, with his famous irony, like Bacon, with lifelong dissimulation, like Erasmus, with its the praise of folly, like Rabelais, with his satire rending the nations. Quote, they were the fools who cried against me, you will say, end quote wrote the Chevalier de Boufflet to Grimm. 
Quote, I, but the fools have the advantage of numbers, and tis that which decides. Tis of no use for us to make war with them. We shall not weaken them. They will always be the masters. There will not be a practice or a usage introduced of which they are not the authors. End quote. In front of these sinister facts, the first lesson of history is the good of evil. Good is a good doctor, but bad is sometimes a better. Tis the oppressions of William the Norman, savage forest laws, and crushing despotism that made possible the inspirations of Magna Carta under John. Edward I wanted money, armies, castles, and as much as he could get. It was necessary to call the people together by shorter, swifter ways, and the House of Commons arose. To obtain subsidies, he paid him privileges. In the twenty-fourth year of his reign, he decreed, quote, that no tax should be levied without consent of lords and commons, end quote, which is the basis of the English constitution. Plutarch affirms that the cruel wars which followed the march of Alexander introduced the civility, language, and arts of Greece into the savage East, introduced marriage, built seventy cities, and united hostile nations under one government. The barbarians who broke up the Roman Empire did not arrive a day too soon. Schiller says the Thirty Years' War made Germany a nation. Rough, selfish despots serve men immensely, as Henry VIII in the contest with the Pope, as the infatuations, no less than the wisdom, of Cromwell, as the ferocity of the Russian Tsars, as the fanaticism of the French regicides of 1789. The frost which kills the harvest of a year saves the harvests of a century by destroying the weevil or the locust. Wars, fires, plagues break up immovable routine, clear the ground of rotten races and dens of distemper, and open a fair field to new men. There is a tendency in things to right themselves, and the war or revolution or bankruptcy that shatters a rotten system allows things to take a new and natural order. The sharpest evils are bent into that periodicity which makes the errors of planets and the fevers and distempers of men self-limiting. Nature is upheld by antagonism. Passions, resistance, danger are educators. We acquire the strength we have overcome. Without war, no soldier. Without enemies, no hero. The sun were insipid if the universe were not opaque. And the glory of character is in affronting the horrors of depravity, to draw thence new nobilities of power. As art lives and thrills in new use and combining of contrasts, and mining into the dark evermore for blacker pits of night, what would painter do, or what would poet or saint, but for crucifixions and hells? And evermore in the world is this marvellous balance of beauty and disgust, magnificence and rats. No Antoninus but a poor washerwoman said, quote, The more trouble, the more lion. That's my principle. End quote. I do not think very respectfully of the designs or the doings of the people who went to California in 1849. It was a rush and a scramble of needy adventurers, and, in the western country, a general jail delivery of all the rowdies of the rivers. Some of them went with honest purposes, some with very bad ones, and all of them with the very commonplace wish to find a short way to wealth. But nature watches over all, and turns this malfeasance to good. California gets peopled and subdued, civilized in this immoral way, and, on this fiction, a real prosperity is rooted and grown. Tis a decoy duck, tis tubs thrown to amuse the whale, but real ducks, and whales that yield oil, are caught. And, out of Sabine rapes, and out of robbers' forays, real Romes and their heroisms come in fullness of time. In America, the geography is sublime, but the men are not. The inventions are excellent, but the inventors one is sometimes ashamed of. The agencies by which events so grand as the opening of California, of Texas, of Oregon, and the junction of the two oceans are affected 
are paltry, coarse selfishness, fraud and conspiracy, and most of the great results of history are brought about by discreditable means. The benefaction derived in Illinois and the Great West from railroads is inestimable, and vastly exceeding any intentional philanthropy on record. What is the benefit done by a good King Alfred, or by a Howard, or Pestalozzi, or Elizabeth Fry, or Florence Nightingale, or any lover, less or larger, compared with the involuntary blessing wrought on nations by the selfish capitalists who build the Illinois-Michigan and the network of the Mississippi Valley roads, which have evoked not only all the wealth of the soil, but the energy of millions of men. Tis a sentence of ancient wisdom, quote, that God hangs the greatest weights on the smallest wires, end quote. What happens thus to nations befalls every day in private houses. When the friends of a gentleman brought to his notice the follies of his sons, with many hints of their danger, he replied that he knew so much mischief when he was a boy, and had turned out on the whole so successfully, that he was not alarmed by the dissipation of boys. It was dangerous water, but he thought they would soon touch bottom, and then swim to the top. This is bold practice, and there are many failures to a good escape. Yet one would say that a good understanding would suffice as well as moral sensibility to keep one erect. The gratifications of the passions are so quickly seen to be damaging, and, what men like least, seriously lowering them in social rank. Then all talent sinks with character. Quote, Croyez-moi, l'erreur aussi a son mérite, end quote, said Voltaire. We see those who surmount, by dint of some egotism or infatuation, obstacles from which the prudent recoil. The right partisan is a heady, narrow man who, because he does not see many things, sees some one thing with heat and exaggeration, and, if he falls among other narrow men, or on objects which have a brief importance, as some trade or politics of the hour, he prefers it to the universe, and seems inspired and a godsend to those who wish to magnify the matter and carry a point. Better, certainly, if we could secure the strength and fire which rude, passionate men bring into society quite clear of their vices. But who dares draw out the linchpin from the wagon-wheel? Tis so manifest that there is no moral deformity, but is a good passion out of place, that there is no man who is not indebted to his foibles, that, according to the old oracle, Quote, the furies are the bonds of men, end quote. that the poisons are our principal medicines, which kill the disease and save the life. In the high prophetic phrase, he causes the wrath of men to praise him, and twists and wrenches our evil to our good. Shakespeare wrote, quote, "'Tis said, best men are moulded of their faults, end quote and great educators and lawgivers, and especially generals and leaders of colonies, mainly rely on this stuff and esteem men of irregular and passional force the best timber. A man of sense and energy, the late head of the farm school in Boston Harbor, said to me, quote, I want none of your good boys, give me the bad ones, End quote. And this is the reason, I suppose, why, as soon as the children are good, the mothers are scared and think they are going to die. Mirabeau said, quote, There are none but men of strong passions capable of going to greatness, none but such capable of meriting the public gratitude. End quote. Passion, though a bad regulator, is a powerful spring. Any absorbing passion has the effect to deliver from the little coils and cares of every day. It is the heat which sets our human atoms spinning, overcomes the friction of crossing thresholds and first addresses in society, and gives us a good start and speed, easy to continue, when once it is begun. In short, there is no man who is not at some time indebted to his vices, as no plant that is not fed for manures. We only insist that the man meliorate, and that the plant grow upward, and convert the base into the better nature. The wise workman will not regret the poverty or the solitude which brought out his working talents. The youth is charmed with the fine air and accomplishments of the children of fortune. But all great men come out of the middle classes. 
"'Tis better for the head, "'tis better for the heart. Marcus Antoninus says that Fronto told him, quote, "'that the so-called high-born "'are for the most part heartless, end quote. "'Whilst nothing is so indicative "'of deepest culture "'as a tender consideration of the ignorant. "'Charles James Fox said of England, quote, "'The history of this country proves "'that we are not to expect from men "'in affluent circumstances "'the vigilance, energy, and exertion "'without which the House of Commons "'would lose its greatest force and weight. "'Human nature is prone to indulgence, "'and the most meritorious public services "'have always been performed "'by persons in a condition of life "'removed from opulence.' "'And yet what we ask daily "'is to be conventional. "'Supply, most kind gods, "'this defect in my address, "'in my form, in my fortunes, "'which puts me a little out of the ring. "'Supply it, and let me be like the rest whom I admire, and on good terms with them. But the wise gods say, No, we have better things for thee. By humiliations, by defeats, by loss of sympathy, by gulfs of disparity, learn a wider truth and humanity than that of a fine gentleman. A Fifth Avenue landlord, a West End householder, is not the highest style of man. And though good hearts and sound minds are of no condition, yet he who is to be wise for many must not be protected. He must know the huts where poor men lie, and the chores which poor men do. The first-class minds, Aesop, Socrates, Cervantes, Shakespeare, Franklin, had the poor man's feeling and mortification. A rich man was never insulted in his life, but this man must be stung. A rich man was never in danger from cold or hunger or war, or ruffians, and you can see he was not from the moderation of his ideas. It is a fatal disadvantage to be cockered and to eat too much cake. What tests of manhood could he stand? Take him out of his protections. He is a good bookkeeper, or he is a shrewd adviser in the insurance office. Perhaps he could pass a college examination and take his degrees. Perhaps he can give wise counsel in a court of law. Now plant him down among farmers, firemen, Indians, and emigrants. Set a dog on him. Set a highwayman on him. Try him with a cause of mobs. Send him to Kansas, to Pike's Peak, to Oregon. And, if he have true faculty, this may be the element he wants, and he will come out of it with broader wisdom and manly power. Aesop, Sadie, Cervantes, Regnard, have been taken by corsairs, left for dead, sold for slaves, and know the realities of human life. Bad times have a scientific value. These are occasions a good learner would not miss, as we go gladly to Fennel Hall to be played upon by the stormy winds and strong fingers of enraged patriotism, so is a fanatical persecution, civil war, national bankruptcy, a revolution, more rich in the central tones than languid years of prosperity. What had been, ever since our memory, solid continent, yawns apart and discloses its composition and genesis. We learn geology the morning after the earthquake, on ghastly diagrams of cloven mountains, upheaved plains, and the dry bed of the sea. In our life and culture everything is worked up and comes in use. Passion, war, revolt, bankruptcy, and not less folly and blunders, insult, ennui, and bad company. Nature is a rag merchant who works up every shred and ought and end into new creations, like a good chemist whom I found the other day in his laboratory converting his old shirts into pure white sugar. Life is a boundless privilege, and when you pay for your ticket and get into the car, you have no guess what good company you shall find there you buy much that is not rendered in the bill. Men achieve a certain greatness unawares when working to another aim. If now in this connection of discourse we should venture on laying down the first obvious rules of life, I will not here repeat the first rule of economy, already propounded once and again, that every man shall maintain himself. But I will say, get health. No labour, pains, temperance, poverty, nor exercise that can gain it must be grudged, for sickness is a cannibal 
which eats up all the life and youth it can lay hold of, and absorbs its own sons and daughters. I figure it as a pale, wailing, distracted phantom, absolutely selfish, heedless of what is good and great, attentive to its sensations, losing its soul, and afflicting other souls with meanness and mopings, and with ministration to its veracity of trifles. Dr. Johnson said severely, quote, Every man is a rascal as soon as he is sick. End quote. Drop the cant and treat it sanely. In dealing with the drunken, we do not affect to be drunk. We must treat the sick with the same firmness, giving them, of course, every aid, but withholding ourselves. I once asked a clergyman in a retired town who were his companions, what man of ability he saw. He replied that he spent his time with the sick and the dying. I said he seemed to me to need quite other company, and all the more that he had this, for if people were sick and dying to any purpose, we would leave all and go to them. But, as far as I had observed, they were as frivolous as the rest, and sometimes much more frivolous. Let us engage our companions not to spare us. I knew a wise woman who said to her friends, quote, When I am old, rule me, end quote and the best part of health is fine disposition. It is more essential than talent, even in the works of talent. Nothing will supply the want of sunshine to peaches, and, to make knowledge valuable, you must have the cheerfulness of wisdom. Whenever you are sincerely pleased, you are nourished. The joy of the spirit indicates its strength. All healthy things are sweet-tempered. Genius works in sport, and goodness smiles to the last and, for the reason that whoever sees the law which distributes things does not despond, but is animated to great desires and endeavours. He who desponds betrays that he has not seen it. Tis a Dutch proverb that, quote, pain costs nothing, end quote. Such are its preserving qualities in damp climates. Well, sunshine costs less, yet is finer pigment. And so of cheerfulness, or a good temper, the more it is spent, the more of it remains. The latent heat of an ounce of wood or stone is inexhaustible. You may rub the same chip of pine to the point of kindling a hundred times, and the power of happiness of any soul is not to be computed or drained. It is observed that the depression of spirits develops the germs of a plague in individuals and nations. It is an old commendation of right behaviour, Aliis letus, sapiens sibi, which our English proverb translates, be merry and wise. I know how easy it is to men of the world to look grave and sneer at your sanguine youth and its glittering dreams, but I find the gayest castles in the air that were ever piled far better for comfort and for use than the dungeons in the air that are daily dug and caverned out by grumbling, discontented people. I know those miserable fellows, and I hate them, who see a black star always riding through the light, and coloured clouds in the sky overhead. Waves of light pass over and hide it for a moment, but the black star keeps fast in the zenith. But power dwells with cheerfulness, hope puts us in a working mood, whilst despair is no muse and untunes the active powers. A man should make life and nature happier to us, or he had better never been born." When the political economist reckons up the unproductive classes, he should put at the head this class of pitiers of themselves, cravers of sympathy, bewailing imaginary disasters. An old French verse runs in my translation, Some of your griefs you have cured, and the sharpest you still have survived, but what torments of pain you endured from evils that never arrived. There are three wants which never can be satisfied that of the rich, who wants something more, that of the sick, who wants something different, and that of the traveller, who says, anywhere but here. The Turkish Kadi said to Layard, quote, After the fashion of thy people, thou hast wandered from one place to another, until thou art happy and content in none. End quote. My countrymen are not less infatuated with the Rococo toy of Italy. All America seems on the point of embarking for Europe but we shall not always traverse seas and lands with light purposes, and for pleasure, as we say. 
One day we shall cast out the passion for Europe by the passion for America. Culture will give gravity and domestic rest to those who now travel only as not knowing how else to spend money. Already, who provoked pity like that excellent family party just arriving in their well-appointed carriage, as far from home and any honest end as ever? Each nation has asked successively, what are they here for? Until at last the party are shamefaced and anticipate the question at the gates of each town. Genial manners are good, and power of accommodation to any circumstance, but the high price of life, the crowning fortune of a man, is to be born with a bias to some pursuit, which finds him in employment and happiness, whether it be to make baskets, or broadswords, or canals, or statutes, or songs. I doubt not this was the meaning of Socrates when he pronounced artists the only truly wise as being actually not apparently so. In childhood we fancied ourselves walled in by the horizon, as by a glass bell, and doubted not by distant travel we should reach the baths of the descending sun and stars. On experiment the horizon flies before us, and leaves us on an endless common, sheltered by no glass bell. Yet it is strange how tenaciously we cling to that bell astronomy of a protecting domestic horizon. I find the same illusion in the search after happiness, which I observe every summer recommenced in this neighbourhood, soon after the pairing of the birds. The young people do not like the town, do not like the seashore. They will go inland, find a dear cottage deep in the mountains, secret as their hearts. They set forth on their travels in search of a home. They reach Berkshire, they reach Vermont, they look at the farms, good farms, high mountain sides, but where is the seclusion? The farm is near this, tis near that. They have got far from Boston, but tis near Albany, or near Burlington, or near Montreal. They explore a farm, but the house is small, old, thin. Discontented people live there, and are gone. There's too much sky, too much outdoors, too public. The youth aches for solitude. When he comes to the house, he passes through the house. That does not make the deep recess he sought. Ah, now I perceive, he says, it must be deep with persons. Friends only can give death. Yes, but there is a great dearth this year of friends, hard to find and hard to have when found. They are just going away. They too are in the whirl of the flitting world and have engagements and necessities. They are just starting for Wisconsin, have letters from Bremen. See you again soon. Slow slow to learn the lesson that there is but one death, but one interior, and that is his purpose. When joy or calamity or genius shall show him it, then woods, then farms, then city shopmen and cab drivers, indifferently with profit or friend, will mirror back to him its unfathomable heaven, its populous solitude. The uses of travel are occasional and short, but the best fruit it finds when it finds it, is conversation, and this is a main function of life. What a difference in the hospitality of minds! Inestimable is he to whom we can say what we cannot say to ourselves. Others are involuntarily hurtful to us, and bereave us of the power of thought, impound and imprison us. As, when there is sympathy, there needs but one wise man in a company, and all are wise. So a blockhead makes a blockhead of his companion." Wonderful power to be numb possesses this brother. When he comes into the office or public room, the society dissolves. One after another slips out, and the apartment is at his disposal. What is incurable but a frivolous habit? A fly is as untamable as a hyena. Yet folly in the sense of fun, fooling or dawdling, can easily be born. As Tyran said, quote, I find nonsense singularly refreshing. End quote. But a virulent, aggressive fool taints the reason of a household. I have seen a whole family of quiet, sensible people, unhinged and beside themselves, victims of such a rogue. For the steady wrong-headedness of one perverse person irritates the best, since we must withstand absurdity. But resistance only exasperates the acrid fool, who believes that nature and gravitation are quite wrong, and he only is right. 
Hence, all the dozen inmates are soon perverted, with whatever virtues and industries they have, into contradictors, accusers, explainers, and repairers of this one malefactor, like a boat about to be overset, or a carriage run away with. Not only the foolish pilot or driver, but everybody on board is forced to assume strange and ridiculous attitudes, to balance the vehicle and prevent the upsetting. For remedy, whilst the case is yet mild, I recommend phlegm and truth. Let all the truth that is spoken or done be at the zero of indifferency, or truth itself will be folly. But when the case is seated and malignant, the only safety is an amputation. As seamen say, you shall cut and run. How to live with unfit companions? For, with such, life is for the most part spent. And experience teaches little better than our earliest instinct of self-defense, namely, not to engage, not to mix yourself in any manner with them, but let their madness spend itself unopposed. You are you, and I am I. Conversation is an art in which a man has all mankind for his competitors, for it is that which all are practicing every day while they live. Our habit of thought, take men as they rise, is not satisfying. In the common experience, I fear, it is poor and squalid. The success which will content them is a bargain, a lucrative employment, an advantage gained over a competitor, a marriage, a patrimony, a legacy and the like. With these objects, their conversation deals with services, politics, trade, personal defects, exaggerated bad news, and the rain. This is forlorn, and they feel sore and sensitive. Now, if one comes who can illuminate this dark house with thoughts, show them their native riches, what gifts they have, how indispensable each is, what magical powers over nature and men, what access to poetry, religion, and the powers which constitute character. He wakes in them the feeling of worth. His suggestions require new ways of living, new books, new men, new arts and sciences. Then we come out of our eggshell existence into the great dome, and see the zenith over and the nadir under us. Instead of the tanks and buckets of knowledge to which we are daily confined, we come down to the shore of the sea and dip our hands in its miraculous waves. It is wonderful the effect on the company. They are not the men they were. They have all been to California, and all have come back millionaires. There is no book and no pleasure in life comparable to it. Ask what is best in our experience, and we shall say, a few pieces of plain dealing with wise people. Our conversation once and again has apprised us that we belong to better circles than we have yet beheld that a mental power invites us, whose generalizations are more worth for joy and for effect than anything that is now called philosophy or literature. In excited conversation we have glimpses of the universe, hints of power native to the soul, far-darting lights and shadows of an Andes landscape such as we can hardly attain in lone meditation. Here are oracles sometimes profusely given, to which the memory goes back in barren hours." add the consent of will and temperament, and there exists the covenant of friendship. Our chief want in life is somebody who shall make us do what we can. This is the service of a friend. With him we are easily great. There is a sublime attraction in him to whatever virtue is in us. How he flings wide the doors of existence! What questions we ask of him! What an understanding we have! How few words are needed! It is the only real society. An Eastern poet, Ali ben Abu Talib, writes with sad truth, quote, He who has a thousand friends has not a friend to spare, and he who has one enemy shall meet him everywhere. End quote. But few writers have said anything better to this point than Hafiz, who indicates this relation as the test of mental health. Quote, Thou learnest no secret until thou knowest friendship, since to the unsound no heavenly knowledge enters. End quote. Neither is life long enough for friendship. That is a serious and majestic affair, like a royal presence or a religion, and not a postillion's dinner to be eaten on the run. There is a pudency about friendship as about love, and though fine souls never lose sight of it, 
yet they do not name it. With the first class of men, our friendship or good understanding goes quite behind all accidents of estrangement, of condition, of reputation. And yet we do not provide for the greatest good of life. We take care of our health, we lay up money, we make our roof tight and our clothing sufficient. But who provides wisely that he shall not be wanting in the best property of all? Friends. We know that all our training is to fit us for this, and we do not take the step towards it. How long shall we sit and wait for these benefactors? It makes no difference in looking back five years how you have been dieted or dressed, whether you have been lodged on the first floor or the attic, whether you have had gardens and baths, good cattle and horses, have been carried in a neat equipage or in a ridiculous truck. These things are forgotten so quickly and leave no effect. But it counts much whether we have had good companions in that time, almost as much as what we have been doing. And see the overpowering importance of neighbourhood in all association. As it is marriage, fit or unfit, that makes our home, so it is who lives near us of equal social degree. A few people at convenient distance, no matter how bad company. These and these only shall be your life's companions, and all those who are native, congenial, and by many an oath of the heart, sacramented to you, are gradually and totally lost. You cannot deal systematically with this fine element of society, and one may take a good deal of pains to bring people together and to organize clubs and debating societies, and yet no result come of it. But it is certain that there is a great deal of good in us that does not know itself, and that a habit of union and competition brings people up and keeps them up to their highest point. That life would be twice or ten times life if spent with wise and fruitful companions. The obvious inference is a little useful deliberation and preconcert when one goes to buy house and land. But we live with people on other platforms. We live with dependents, not only with the young whom we are to teach all we know and clothe with the advantages we have earned, but also with those who serve us directly and for money. Yet the old rules hold good. Let not the tie be mercenary, though the service is measured by money. Make yourself necessary to somebody. Do not make life hard to any. This point is acquiring new importance in American social life. Our domestic service is usually a foolish fracas of unreasonable demand on one side and shirking on the other. A man of wit was asked in the train what was his errand in the city. He replied, I've been sent to procure an angel to do cooking. A lady complained to me that, of her two maidens, one was absent-minded and the other was absent-bodied. And the evil increases from the ignorance and hostility of every shipload of the immigrant population swarming into houses and farms. Few people discern that it rests with the master or the mistress what service comes from the man or the maid, that this identical hussy was a tutelar spirit in one house and a harridan in the other. All sensible people are selfish, and nature is tugging at every contract to make the terms of it fair. If you are proposing only your own, the other party must deal a little hardly by you. If you deal generously, the other, though selfish and unjust, will make an exception in your favour and deal truly with you. When I asked an ironmaster about the slag and cinder in railroad iron, Oh, he said, there's always good iron to be had. If there's cinder in the iron, tis because there was cinder in the pay. But why multiply these topics and their illustrations, which are endless? Life brings to each his task, and whatever art you select, algebra, planting, architecture, poems, commerce, politics, all are attainable, even to the miraculous triumphs, on the same terms, of selecting that for which you are apt. Begin at the beginning, proceed in order, step by step. Tis as easy to twist iron anchors and braid cannons as to braid straw, to boil granite as to boil water, if you take all the steps in order. Wherever there is failure, there is some giddiness, some superstition about luck, some step omitted, which nature never pardons. 
the happy conditions of life may be had on the same terms. Their attraction for you is the pledge that they are within your reach. Our prayers are prophets. There must be fidelity, and there must be adherence. How respectable the life that clings to its objects! Youthful aspirations are fine things. Your theories and plans of life are fair and commendable. But will you stick? Not one, I fear, in that common full of people, or in a thousand but one. And when you tax them with treachery and remind them of their high resolutions, they have forgotten that they made a vow. The individuals are fugitive and in the act of becoming something else and irresponsible. The race is great the ideal fair, but the men whiffling and unsure. The hero is he who is immovably centred. The main difference between people seems to be that one man can come under obligations on which you can rely, is obligeable, and another is not. As he has not a law within him, there is nothing to tie him to. Tis inevitable to name particulars of virtue and of condition and to exaggerate them, but all rests at last on that integrity which dwarfs talent and can spare it. Sanity consists in not being subdued by your means. Fancy prices are paid for position and for the culture of talent, but to the grand interests, superficial success is of no account. The man, it is his attitude, not feats but forces, not on set days and public occasions, but at all hours, and in repose alike as in energy, still formidable and not to be disposed of. The populace says, with Horn Took, quote, If you would be powerful, pretend to be powerful. End quote. I prefer to say, with the old prophet, quote, Seekest thou great things, seek them not. End quote. Or what was said of a Spanish prince, quote, The more you took from him, the greater he looked. End quote. Plus on lui haute, plus il est grand. The secret of culture is to learn that a few great points steadily reappear, alike in the poverty of the obscurest farm and in the miscellany of metropolitan life, and that these few are alone to be regarded, the escape from all false ties, courage to be what we are, and love of what is simple and beautiful, independence and cheerful relation. These are the essentials, these and the wish to serve, to add somewhat to the well-being of men. End of Essay 7 Considerations Essay 8 of Conduct of Life by Ralph Waldo Emerson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Essay 8. Beauty. Was never form and never face so sweet to say it as only grace, which did not slumber like a stone but hovered gleaming and was gone. Beauty chased he everywhere, in flame, in storm, in clouds of air. He smote the lake to feed his eye with the barrel beam of the broken wave, he flung in pebbles well to hear the moment's music which they gave. Oft pealed for him a lofty tone from nodding pole and belting zone. He heard a voice none else could hear, from centred and from errant sphere. The quaking earth did quake in rhyme, seas ebbed and flowed in epic chime. In dens of passion and pits of woe, he saw strong eros struggling through to send the dark and solve the curse, and beam to the bounds of the universe, while thus to love he gave his days, in loyal worship, scorning praise, how spread their lures for him, in vain, thieving ambition and paltering gain. He thought it happier to be dead, to die for beauty, than live for bread. Beauty The spiral tendency of vegetation infects education also. Our books approach very slowly the things we most wish to know. What a parade we make of our science, and how far off and at arm's length it is from its objects. Our botany is all names, not powers. 
poets and romancers talk of herbs of grace and healing but what does the botanist know of the virtues of his weeds the geologist lays bare the strata and can tell them all on his fingers but does he know what effect passes into the man who builds his house in them what effect on the race that inhabits a granite shelf what on the inhabitants of marl and of alluvium we should go to the ornithologist with a new feeling if he could teach us what the social birds say when they sit in the autumn council talking together in the trees the want of sympathy makes his record a dull dictionary his result is a dead bird the bird is not in its ounces and inches but in its relations to nature and the skin or skeleton you show me is no more a heron than a heap of ashes or a bottle of gases into which his body has been reduced is dante or washington the naturalist is led from the road by the whole distance of his fancied advance the boy had juster views when he gazed at the shells on the beach or the flowers in the meadow unable to call them by their names than the man in the pride of his nomenclature astrology interested us for it tied man to the system instead of an isolated beggar the farthest star felt him and he felt the star however rash and however falsified by pretenders and traders in it the hint was true and divine the soul's avowal of its large relations and that climate century remote natures as well as near are part of its biography chemistry takes to pieces but it does not construct alchemy which sought to transmute one element into another to prolong life to arm with power that was in the right direction all our science lacks a human side the tenant is more than the house bugs and stamens and spores on which we lavish so many years are not finalities and man when his powers unfold in order will take nature along with him and emit light into all her recesses the human heart concerns us more than the pouring into microscopes and is larger than can be measured by the pompous figures of the astronomer we are just so frivolous and sceptical men hold themselves cheap and vile and yet a man is a faggot of thunderbolts all the elements pour through his system he is the flood of the flood and fire of the fire he feels the antipodes and the pole as drops of his blood they are the extension of his personality his duties are measured by that instrument he is and a right and perfect man would be felt to the centre of the copernican system it is curious that we only believe as deep as we live we do not think heroes can exert any more awful power than that surface play which amuses us a deep man believes in miracles waits for them believes in magic believes that the orator will decompose his adversary believes that the evil eye can wither that the heart's blessing can heal that love can exalt talent can overcome all odds from a great heart secret magnetisms flow incessantly to draw great events but we prize very humble utilities a prudent husband a good son a voter a citizen and deprecate any romance of character and perhaps reckon only his money value his intellect his affection as a sort of bill of exchange easily convertible into fine chambers pictures music and wine the motive of science was the extension of man on all sides into nature till his hands should touch the stars his eyes see through the earth his ears understand the language of beast and bird and the sense of the wind and through his sympathy heaven and earth should talk with him but that is not our science these geologies chemistries astronomies seem to make wise but they leave us where they found us the invention is of use to the inventor of questionable help to any other the formulas of science are like the papers in your pocket-book of no value to any but the owner science in england in america is jealous of theory hates the name of love and moral purpose there's a revenge for this inhumanity what manner of man does science make the boy is not attracted 
He says, I do not wish to be such a kind of man as my professor is. The collector has dried all the plants in his herbal, but he's lost weight and humour. He has got all snakes and lizards in his files, but science has done for him also, and has put the man into a bottle. Our reliance on the physician is a kind of despair of ourselves. The clergy have bronchitis, which does not seem a certificate of spiritual health. MacReady thought it came of the falsetto of their voicing. An Indian prince, Tisso, one day riding in the forest, saw a herd of elk sporting. See how happy, he said, these browsing elks are. Why should not priests, lodged and fed comfortably in the temples, also amuse themselves? Returning home, he imparted this reflection to the king. The king, on the next day, conferred the sovereignty on him, saying, Prince, administer this empire for seven days. At the termination of that period, I shall put thee to death. At the end of the seventh day, the king inquired, From what cause hast thou become so emaciated? He answered, From the horror of death. The monarch rejoined, Live, my child, and be wise. Thou hast ceased to take recreation, saying to thyself, in seven days I shall be put to death. These priests in the temple incessantly meditate on death. How can they enter into healthful diversions? But the men of science, or the doctors, or the clergy, are not victims of their pursuits more than others. The miller, the lawyer, and the merchant dedicate themselves to their own details, and do not come out men of more force. Have they divination, grand aims, hospitality of soul, and the equality to any event which we demand in man, or only the reactions of the mill, of the wares, of the chicane. No object really interests us but man, and in man only his superiorities, and, though we are aware of a perfect law in nature, it has fascination for us only through its relation to him, or as it is rooted in the mind. At the birth of Winkleman, more than a hundred years ago, Side by side with his arid, departmental, post-mortem science, rose an enthusiasm in the study of beauty, and perhaps some sparks from it may yet light a conflagration in the other. Knowledge of men, knowledge of manners, the power of form, and our sensibility to personal influence never go out of fashion. These are facts of a science which we study without book, whose teachers and subjects are always near us. So inveterate is our habit of criticism that much of our knowledge in this direction belongs to the chapter of pathology. The crowd in the street oftener furnishes degradations than angels or redeemers. But they all prove the transparency. Every spirit makes its house, and we can give a shrewd guess from the house to the inhabitant. But not less does nature furnish us with every sign of grace and goodness. The delicious faces of children the beauty of schoolgirls, the sweet seriousness of sixteen, the lofty air of well-born, well-bred boys, the passionate histories in the looks and manners of youth and early manhood, and the varied power in all that well-known company that escorts us through life. We know how these forms thrill, paralyze, provoke, inspire, and enlarge us. Beauty is the form under which the intellect prefers to study the world. All privilege is that of beauty, for there are many beauties, as of general nature, of the human face and form, of manners, of brain, or method, moral beauty, or beauty of the soul. The ancients believed that a genius or demon took possession at birth of each mortal to guide him, that these genii, were sometimes seen as a flame of fire partly immersed in the bodies which they governed, on an evil man resting on his head, in a good man mixed with his substance. They thought the same genius, at the death of its ward, entered a newborn child, and they pretended to guess the pilot by the sailing of the ship. We recognize obscurely the same fact, though we give it our own names. We say that every man is entitled to be valued by his best moment, we measure our friends so. We know they have intervals of folly, whereof we take no heed, but wait the reappearance of the genius, which are sure and beautiful. On the other side, everybody knows people who appear to be ridden, and who, with all degrees of ability, never impress us with the air of free agency. 
They know it too, and peep with their eyes to see if you detect their sad plight. We fancy, could we pronounce the solving word and disenchant them, the cloud would roll up, the little rider would be discovered and unseated, and they would regain their freedom. The remedy seems never to be far off, since the first step into thought lifts this mountain of necessity. Thought is the pent air-ball which can rive the planet, and the beauty which certain objects have for him is the friendly fire which expands the thought and acquaints the prisoner that liberty and power await him. The question of beauty takes us, out of surfaces, to thinking of the foundations of things. Goethe said, quote, The beautiful is a manifestation of secret laws of nature, which, but for this appearance, had been forever concealed from us. End quote. And the working of this deep instinct makes all the excitement, much of it superficial and absurd enough, about works of art, which leads armies of vain travellers every year to Italy, Greece, and Egypt. Every man values every acquisition he makes in the science of beauty above his possessions. The most useful man in the most useful world, so long as only commodity was served, would remain unsatisfied. But, as fast as he sees beauty, life acquires a very high value. I am warned by the ill fate of many philosophers not to attempt a definition of beauty. I will rather enumerate a few of its qualities. We ascribe beauty to that which is simple, which has no superfluous parts, which exactly answers its end, which stands related to all things, which is the mean of many extremes. It is the most enduring quality and the most ascending quality. We say love is blind, and the figure of Cupid is drawn with a bandage round his eyes. Blind, yes, because he does not see what he does not like, but the sharpest sighted hunter in the universe is love, for finding what he seeks and only that. And the mythologists tell us that Vulcan was painted lame, and Cupid blind, to call attention to the fact that one was all limbs and the other all eyes. In the true mythology, love is an immortal child, and beauty leads him as a guide. Nor can we express a deeper sense than when we say, beauty is the pilot of the young soul. Beyond their sensuous delight, the forms and colors of nature have a new charm for us in our perception, that not one ornament was added for ornament, but is a sign of some better health or more excellent action. Elegance of form in bird or beast or in the human figure marks some excellence of structure, or beauty is only an invitation from what belongs to us. Tis a law of botany that in plants the same virtues follow the same forms. It is a rule of largest application, true in a plant, true in a loaf of bread, that in the construction of any fabric or organism, any real increase of fitness to its end is an increase of beauty. The lesson taught by the study of Greek and of Gothic art of antique and of pre-Raphaelite painting, was worth all the research, namely that all beauty must be organic, that outside embellishment is deformity. It is the soundness of the bones that ultimates itself in a peach-bloom complexion, health of constitution that makes the sparkle and the power of the eye. It is the adjustment of the size and of the joining of the sockets of the skeleton that gives grace of outline and the finer grace of movement. The cat and the deer cannot move or sit inelegantly. The dancing-master can never teach a badly built man to walk well. The tint of the flower proceeds from its root, and the lustres of the seashell begin with its existence. Hence our taste in building rejects paint, and all shifts, and shows the original grain of the wood, refuses pilasters and columns that support nothing, and allows the real supporters of the house honestly to show themselves. Every necessary or organic action pleases the beholder. A man leading a horse to water, a farmer sowing seed, the labors of haymakers in the field, the carpenter building a ship, the smith at his forge, or whatever useful labor is becoming to the wise eye. But if it is done to be seen, it is mean. How beautiful are ships on the sea, but ships in the theatre, 
or ships kept for picturesque effect on virginia water by george the fourth and men hired to stand in fitting costumes at a penny an hour what a difference in effect between a battalion of troops marching to action and one of our independent companies on a holiday in the midst of a military show and a festal procession gay with banners i saw a boy seize an old tin pan that lay rusting under a wall and poising it on the top of a stick he set it turning and made it describe the most elegant imaginable curves and drew away attention from the decorated procession by this startling beauty another text from the mythologists the greeks fabled that venus was born of the foam of the sea nothing interests us which is stark or bounded but only what streams with life what is an act or endeavour to reach somewhat beyond the pleasure a palace or a temple gives the eye is that an order and method has been communicated to stones so that they speak and geometrize become tender or sublime with expression beauty is the moment of transition as if the form were just ready to flow into other forms any fixedness heaping or concentration on one feature a long nose a sharp chin a humpback is the reverse of the flowing and therefore deformed beautiful as is the symmetry of any form if the form can move we seek a more excellent symmetry the interruption of equilibrium stimulates the eye to desire the restoration of symmetry and to watch the steps through which it is attained this is the charm of running water sea waves the flight of birds and the locomotion of animals this is the theory of dancing to recover continually in changes the lost equilibrium not by abrupt and angular but by gradual and curving movements i have been told by persons of experience in matters of taste that the fashions follow a law of gradation and are never arbitrary the new mode is always only a step onward in the same direction as the last mode and a cultivated eye is prepared for and predicts the new fashion this fact suggests the reason of all mistakes and offence in our own modes it is necessary in music when you strike a discord to let down the ear by an intermediate note or two to the accord again and many a good experiment born of good sense and destined to succeed fails only because it is offensively sudden i suppose the parisian milliner who dresses the world from her imperious boudoir will know how to reconcile the bloomer costume to the eye of mankind and make it triumphant over punch himself by interposing the just gradations i need not say how wide the same law ranges and how much it can be hoped to effect all that is a little harshly claimed by progressive parties may easily come to be conceded without question if this rule be observed thus the circumstances may be easily imagined in which woman may speak vote argue causes legislate and drive a coach and all the most naturally in the world if only it comes by degrees to this streaming or flowing belongs the beauty that all circular movement has as the circulation of waters the circulation of the blood the periodical motion of planets the annual wave of vegetation the action and reaction of nature and if we follow it out this demand in our thought for an ever onward action is the argument for the immortality one more text from the mythologists is to the same purpose beauty rides on a lion beauty rests on necessities the line of beauty is the result of perfect economy the cell of the bee is built at that angle which gives the most strength with the least wax the bone or the quill of the bird gives the most ailer's strength with the least weight it's the purgation of superfluities said michelangelo there is not a particle to spare in natural structures there is a compelling reason in the uses of the plant for every novelty of colour or form and our art saves material by more skilful arrangement and reaches beauty by taking every superfluous ounce that can be spared from a wall and keeping all its strength in the poetry of columns in rhetoric this art of omission is its chief secret of power and in general it is proof of high culture to say the greatest matters in the simplest way 
veracity first of all and for ever. Rien de beau qui le vrai. In all design, art lies in making your object prominent, but there is a prior art in choosing objects that are prominent. The fine arts have nothing casual, but spring from the instincts of the nations that created them. Beauty is the quality which makes to endure. In a house that I know, I have noticed a block of spermaceti lying about closets and mantelpieces for twenty years together, simply because the tallow man gave it the form of a rabbit, and, I suppose, it may continue to be lugged about unchanged for a century. Let an artist scroll a few lines or figures on the back of a letter, and that scrap of paper is rescued from danger, is put in portfolio, is framed and glazed, and, in proportion to the beauty of the lines drawn, will be kept for centuries. Burns writes a copy of verses and sends them to a newspaper, and the human race take charge of them that they shall not perish. As the flute is heard farther than the cart, see how surely a beautiful form strikes the fancy of men and is copied and reproduced without end. How many copies are there of the Belvedere Apollo, the Venus, the Psyche, the Warwick Vase, the Parthenon, and the Temple of Vesta? These are objects of tenderness to all. In our cities, an ugly building is soon removed and is never repeated, but any beautiful building is copied and improved upon, so that all masons and carpenters work to repeat and preserve the agreeable forms whilst the ugly ones die out. The felicities of design in art or in works of nature are shadows or forerunners of that beauty which reaches its perfection in the human form. All men are its lovers. Wherever it goes, it creates joy and hilarity, and everything is permitted to it. It reaches its height in woman. To Eve, say the Mohammedans, God gave two-thirds of all beauty. A beautiful woman is a practical poet, taming her savage mate, planting tenderness, hope, and eloquence in all whom she approaches. Some favors of condition must go with it, since a certain serenity is essential but we love its reproofs and superiorities. Nature wishes that woman should attract man, yet she often cunningly moulds into her face a little sarcasm, which seems to say, yes, I am willing to attract, but to attract a little better kind of a man than any I yet behold. French memoirs of the fifteenth century celebrate the name of Pauline de Viguère, a virtuous and accomplished maiden, who so fired the enthusiasm of her contemporaries by her enchanting form, the citizens of her native city of Toulouse obtained the aid of the civil authorities to compel her to appear publicly on the balcony at least twice a week, and, as often as she showed herself, the crowd was dangerous to life. Not less in England, in the last century, was the fame of the Gunnings, of whom Elizabeth married the Duke of Hamilton, and Maria, the Earl of Coventry. Walpole says, quote, the concourse was so great when the Duchess of Hamilton was presented at court on Friday that even the noble crowd in the drawing-room clambered on chairs and tables to look at her. There are mobs at their doors to see them get into their chairs, and people go early to get places at the theatres when it is known they will be there. End quote. Such crowds, he adds elsewhere, quote, flock to see the Duchess of Hamilton, that seven hundred people sat up all night in and about an inn in Yorkshire, to see her get into her post-chaise next morning. End quote. But why need we console ourselves with the fames of Helen of Argus, or Corinna, or Pauline of Toulouse, or the Duchess of Hamilton? We all know this magic very well, or can divine it. It does not hurt weak eyes to look into beautiful eyes never so long. Women stand related to beautiful nature around us, and the enamoured youth mixes their form with moon and stars, with woods and waters, and the pomp of summer. They heal us of awkwardness by their words and looks. We observe their intellectual influence on the most serious student. They refine and clear his mind, teach him to put a pleasing method into what is dry and difficult. We talk to them, and wish to be listened to. We fear to fatigue them, and acquire a facility of expression which passes from conversation into habit of style." That beauty is the normal state, is shown by the perpetual effort of nature to attain it. 
Mirabeau had an ugly face on a handsome ground, and we see faces every day which have a good type, but have been marred in the casting. A proof that we are all entitled to beauty should have been beautiful if our ancestors had kept the laws, as every lily and every rose is well. But our bodies do not fit us, but caricature and satirize us. Thus, short legs, which constrain us to short, mincing steps, are a kind of personal insult and contumely to the owner. And long stilts, again, put him at perpetual disadvantage and force him to stoop to the general level of mankind. Marshall ridicules a gentleman of his day whose countenance resembled the face of a swimmer seen under water. Sadi describes a schoolmaster, quote, so ugly and crabbed that a sight of him would derange the ecstasies of the orthodox, end quote. Faces are rarely true to any ideal type, but are a record in sculpture of a thousand anecdotes of whim and folly. Portrait painters say that most faces and forms are irregular and unsymmetrical, have one eye blue and one grey, the nose not straight, and one shoulder higher than another, the hair unequally distributed, etc. The man is physically as well as metaphysically a thing of shreds and patches, borrowed unequally from good and bad ancestors, and a misfit from the start. A beautiful person among the Greeks was thought to betray by this sign some secret favour of the immortal gods, and we can pardon pride when a woman possesses such a vigour, that wherever she stands or moves or leaves a shadow on the wall, or sits for a portrait to the artist, she confers a favour on the world. And yet, it is not beauty that inspires the deepest passion. Beauty without grace is the hook without the bait. Beauty without expression tires. Abbe Ménage said of the President La Bayeux, quote, that he was fit for nothing but to sit for his portrait, end quote. A Greek epigram intimates that the force of love is not shown by the courting of beauty, but when the like desire is inflamed for one who is ill-favoured. And petulant old gentlemen who have chanced to suffer some intolerable weariness from pretty people, or who have seen cut flowers to some profusion, or who see, after a world of pains have been successfully taken for the costume, how the least mistake in sentiment takes all the beauty out of your clothes affirm that the secret of ugliness consists not in irregularity, but in being uninteresting. We love any forms, however ugly, from which great qualities shine. If command, eloquence, art or invention exist in the most deformed person, all the accidents that usually displease, please and raise esteem and wonder higher. The great orator was an emaciated, insignificant person, but he was all brain, Cardinal de Retz said of de Bouillon, quote, With the physiognomy of an ox, he had the perspicacity of an eagle. End quote. It was said of Hook, the friend of Newton, quote, He is the most and promises the least of any man in England. End quote. Since I am so ugly, said Du Guesclin, quote, It behooves that I be bold. End quote. Sir Philip Sidney, the darling of mankind, Ben Jonson tells us, Quote, was no pleasant man in countenance, his face being spoiled with pimples and of high blood and long. End quote. Those who have ruled human destinies like planets for thousands of years were not handsome men. If a man can raise a small city to be a great kingdom, can make bread cheap, can irrigate deserts, can join oceans by canals, can subdue steam, can organize victory, can lead the opinions of mankind can enlarge knowledge. It is no matter whether his nose is parallel to his spine, as it ought to be, or whether he has the nose at all, whether his legs are straight or whether his legs are amputated. His deformities will come to be reckoned ornamental and advantageous on the whole. This is a triumph of expression, degrading beauty, charming us with a power so fine and friendly and intoxicating that it makes admired persons insipid, and the thought of passing our lives with them unsupportable. There are faces so fluid of expression, so flushed and rippled by the play of thought, that we can hardly find what the mere features really are. When the delicious beauty of liniments loses its power, it is because a more delicious beauty has appeared, that an interior and durable form has been disclosed. 
Still, beauty rides on her lion as before. Still, quote, it was for beauty that the world was made, end quote. The lives of the Italian artists, who established a despotism of genius amidst the dukes and kings and mobs of their stormy epoch, prove how loyal men in all times are to a finer brain, a finer method than their own. If a man can cut such a head on his stone gatepost as shall draw and keep a crowd about it all day by its beauty, good nature, and inscrutable meaning, if a man can build a plain cottage with such symmetry as to make all the fine palaces look cheap and vulgar, can take such advantage of nature that all her powers serve him, making use of geometry instead of expense, tapping a mountain for his water-jet, causing the sun and moon to seem only the decorations of his estate. This is still the legitimate dominion of beauty. The radiance of the human form, though sometimes astonishing, is only a burst of beauty for a few years, or a few months, at the perfection of youth, and in most rapidly declines. But we remain lovers of it, only transferring our interest to interior excellence. And it is not only admirable in singular and salient talents, but also in the world of manners. But the sovereign attribute remains to be noted. Things are pretty, graceful, rich, elegant, handsome, but, until they speak to the imagination, not yet beautiful. This is the reason why beauty is still escaping out of all analysis. It is not yet possessed. It cannot be handled. Proclus says, quote, It swims on the light of forms. End quote. It is properly not in the form, but in the mind. It instantly deserts possession and flies to an object in the horizon. If I could put my hand on the North Star, would it be as beautiful? The sea is lovely, but when we bathe in it, the beauty forsakes all the near water. For the imagination and senses cannot be gratified at the same time. Wordsworth rightly speaks of, quote, a light that never was on sea or land, end quote, meaning that it was supplied by the observer, and the Welsh bard warns his countrywoman that, quote, half of their charms with Catwallon shall die. End quote. The new virtue which constitutes a thing beautiful is a certain cosmical quality, or a power to suggest relation to the whole world and so lift the object out of a pitiful individuality. Every natural feature, sea, sky, rainbow, flowers, musical tone, has in it somewhat which is not private, but universal, speaks of that central benefit which is the soul of nature, and thereby is beautiful. And, in chosen men and women, I find somewhat in form, speech, and manners, which is not of their person and family, but of a humane, Catholic, and spiritual character, and we love them as the sky. They have a largeness of suggestion, and their face and manners carry a certain grandeur, like time and justice. The feat of the imagination is in showing the convertibility of everything into every other thing. Facts which had never before left their stark common sense suddenly figure as Eleusinian mysteries. My boots and chair and candlestick are fairies in disguise, meteors and constellations. All the facts in nature are nouns of the intellect and make the grammar of the internal language. Every word has a double, treble, or centuple use and meaning. What, has my stove and pepper-pot a false bottom? I cry you mercy, good shoe-box. I did not know you were a jewel-case. Chaff and dust begin to sparkle, and are clothed about with immortality. And there is a joy in perceiving the representative or symbolic character of a fact, which no bare fact or event can ever give. There are no days in life so memorable as those which vibrated to some stroke of the imagination. The poets are quite right in decking their mistresses with the spoils of the landscape, flower gardens, gems, rainbows, flushes of morning, and stars of night, since all beauty points at identity, and whatsoever thing does not express to me the sea and sky, day and night, is somewhat forbidden and wrong. Into every beautiful object there enters somewhat immeasurable and divine, and just as much into form bounded by outlines like mountains on the horizon as into tones of music or depths of space. 
polarized light showed the secret architecture of bodies, and when the second side of the mind is opened, now one color or form or gesture, and now another, has a pungency, as if a more interior ray had been admitted, disclosing its deep holdings in the frame of things. The laws of this translation we do not know, or why one feature or gesture and chance, why one word or syllable intoxicates, but the fact is familiar that the fine touch of the eye, or a grace of manners, or a phrase of poetry, plants wings at our shoulders, as if the divinity, in his approaches, lifts away mountains of obstruction, and deigns to draw a truer line, which the mind knows and owns. This is that haughty force of beauty, vis superba forme, which the poets praise, under calm and precise outline, the immeasurable and divine, beauty hiding all wisdom and power in its calm sky. All high beauty has a moral element in it, and I find the antique sculpture as ethical as Marcus Antoninus, and the beauty ever in proportion to the depth of thought. Gross and obscure natures, however decorated, seem impure shambles, but character gives splendor to youth, and awe to wrinkled skin and gray hairs. An adorer of truth we cannot choose but obey, and the woman who has shared with us the moral sentiment, her locks must appear to us sublime. Thus there is a climbing scale of culture from the first agreeable sensation which a sparkling gem or a scarlet stain affords the eye, up through fair outlines and details of the landscape, features of the human face and form, signs and tokens of thought and character and manners, up to the ineffable mysteries of the intellect. Wherever we begin, thither our steps ten, an ascent from the joy of a horse in his trappings up to the perception of Newton that the globe on which we ride is only a larger apple falling from a larger tree, up to the perception of Plato that globe and universe are rude and early expressions of an all-dissolving unity. The first stare on the scale to the temple of the mind. End of Essay 8《Essay 9 of Conduct of Life》by Ralph Waldo Emerson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon.《Essay 9 — Illusions — Flow, flow the waves hated, accursed, adored, the waves of mutation. No anchorage is. Sleep is not, death is not, who seem to die, live. House you were born in. Friends of your springtime, old man and young maid, day's toil and its guerdon, they're all vanishing, fleeing to fables, cannot be moored. See the stars through them, through treacherous marbles. No, the stars yonder, the stars everlasting, are fugitive also, and emulate, vaulted, the lambent heat lightning and fireflies' flight. When thou dost return on the wave's circulation, beholding the shimmer, the wild dissipation, and, out of endeavour to change and to flow, the gas becomes solid, and phantoms and nothings return to be things, and endless imbroglio is the law and the world. Then first shalt thou know that in the wild turmoil, horsed on the Proteus, Thou ridest to power and to endurance. Illusions Some years ago, in company with an agreeable party, I spent a long summer day in exploring the Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. We traversed through spacious galleries, affording a solid masonry foundation for the town and county overhead, the six or eight black miles from the mouth of the cavern to the innermost recess which tourists visit a niche or grotto made of one seamless stalactite, and called, I believe, Serena's Bower. I lost the light of one day. I saw high domes and bottomless pits, heard the voice of unseen waterfalls, paddled three-quarters of a mile in the deep Echo River, whose waters are peopled with a blind fish. 
crossed the streams Lethe and Styx, plied with music and guns the echoes in these alarming galleries, saw every form of stalagmite and stalactite in the sculptured and fretted chambers, icicle, orange flower, acanthus, grapes, and snowball. We shot Bengal lights into the vaults and groins of the sparry cathedrals, and examined all the masterpieces which the four combined engineers, water, limestone, gravitation, and time, could make in the dark. The mysteries and scenery of the cave had the same dignity that belongs to all natural objects, and which shames the fine things to which we foppishly compare them. I remarked, especially, the mimetic habit with which nature, on new instruments, hums our old tunes, making night to mimic day, and chemistry to ape vegetation. But I then took notice, and still chiefly remember, that the best thing which the cave had to offer was an illusion. On arriving at what is called the star chamber, our lamps were taken from us by the guide, and extinguished or put aside, and, on looking upwards, I saw, or seemed to see, the night heaven, thick with stars, glimmering more or less brightly over our heads, and even what seemed a comet flaming among them. All the party were touched with astonishment and pleasure. Our musical friends sung with much feeling a pretty song, the stars are in the quiet sky, etc., and I sat down on the rocky floor to enjoy the serene picture. Some crystal specks in the black ceiling high overhead, reflecting the light of a half-hit lamp, yielded this magnificent effect. I own I did not like the cave so well for eking out its sublimities with this theatrical trick, but I have had many experiences like it, before and since, and we must be content to be pleased without too curiously analysing the occasions. Our conversation with nature is not just what it seems. The cloud rack the sunrise and sunset glories, rainbows and northern lights, are not quite so spheral as our childhood thought them, and the part our organization plays in them is too large. The senses interfere everywhere, and mix their own structure with all they report of. Once we fancied the earth a plain and stationary. In admiring the sunset, we do not yet deduct the rounding, coordinating, pictorial powers of the eye. The same interference from our organization creates the most of our pleasure and pain. Our first mistake is the belief that the circumstance gives the joy which we give to the circumstance. Life is an ecstasy. Life is sweet as nitrous oxide, and the fisherman dripping all day over a cold pond, the switchman at the railway intersection, the farmer in the field, the negro in the rice swamp, the fop in the street, the hunter in the woods, the barrister with the jury, the bell at the ball, all ascribe a certain pleasure to their employment, which they themselves give it. Health and appetite impart the sweetness to sugar, bread, and meat. We fancy that our civilization has got on far, but we still come back to our primers. We live by our imaginations, by our admirations, by our sentiments, the child walks amid heaps of illusions which he does not like to have disturbed. The boy, how sweet to him is his fancy, how dear the story of barons and battles, what a hero he is whilst he feeds on his heroes, what a debt is his to imaginative books. He has no better friend or influence than Scott, Shakespeare, Plutarch, and Homer. The man lives to other objects, but who dare affirm that they are more real? Even the prose of the streets is full of refractions. In the life of the dreariest alderman, fancy enters into all details, and colours them with rosy hue. He imitates the air and actions of people whom he admires, and is raised in his own eyes. He pays a debt quicker to a rich man than to a poor man. He wishes the bow and compliment of some leader in the state or in society, weighs what he says, perhaps he never comes nearer to him for that, but dies at last better contented for this amusement of his eyes and his fancy. The world rolls, the din of life is never hushed. In London, in Paris, in Boston, in San Francisco, the carnival, the masquerade, is at its height. 
Nobody drops his domino. The unities, the fictions of the piece, it will be an impertinence to break. The chapter of fascinations is very long. Great is paint. Nay, God is the painter, and we rightly accuse the critic who destroys too many illusions. Society does not love its unmaskers. It was wittily, if somewhat bitterly, said by d'Alembert, Qu'un état de vapeur est à un état très fâcheux, parce qu'il nous fait savoir les choses comme elles sont. I find men victims of illusion in all parts of life. Children, youths, adults, and old men all are led by one bauble or another. Yoganidra, the goddess of illusion, Proteus, or Momus, or Gilfi's mocking, for the power has many names, is stronger than the Titans, stronger than Apollo. Few have overheard the gods or surprised their secret. Life is a succession of lessons which must be lived to be understood. All is riddle, and the key to a riddle is another riddle. There are as many pillows of illusion as flakes in a snowstorm. We wake from one dream into another dream. The toys, to be sure, are various and are graduated in refinement to the quality of the dupe. The intellectual man requires a fine bait. The sots are easily amused. But everybody is drugged with his own frenzy, and the pageant marches at all hours with music and banner and batch. Amid the joyous troop who give in to the charivari comes now and then a sad-eyed boy, whose eyes lack the requisite refractions to clothe the show in due glory, and who is afflicted with a tendency to trace home the glittering miscellany of fruits and flowers to one root. Science is a search after identity, and the scientific whim is lurking in all corners. At the state fair, a friend of mine complained that all the varieties of fancy pears in our orchards seems to have been selected by somebody who had a whim for a particular kind of pear, and only cultivated such as had that perfume. They were all alike. And I remember the quarrel of another youth with the confectioners that, when he racked his wit to choose the best comfits in the shops, in all the endless varieties of sweetmeat he could only find three flavours, or two. What then? Pears and cakes are good for something, and because you, unluckily, have an eye or nose too keen, why need you spoil the comfort which the rest of us find in them? I knew a humorist who, in a good deal of rattle, had a grain or two of sense. He shocked the company by maintaining that the attributes of God were two, power and risibility, and that it was a duty of every pious man to keep up the comedy. And I have known gentlemen of great stake in the community, but whose sympathies were cold, presidents of colleges and governors and senators, who held themselves bound to sign every temperance pledge and act with Bible societies and missions and peacemakers and cry, Hiss the boy, to every good dog. We must not carry comedy too far, but we all have kind impulses in this direction. When the boys come into my yard for leave to gather horse chestnuts, I own I enter into nature's game and affect to grant the permission reluctantly, fearing that any moment they will find out the imposture of that showy chaff. But this tenderness is quite unnecessary. The enchantments are laid on very thick. Their young life is thatched with them. Bare and grim to tears is the lot of the children in the hovel I saw yesterday. Yet not the less they hung it round with frippery romance, like the children of the happiest fortune, and talked of the dear cottage where so many joyful hours had flown. Well, this thatching of hovels is the custom of the country. Women, more than all, are the element and kingdom of illusion. Being fascinated, they fascinate. They see through Claude Lorraine, and how dare anyone, if he could, pluck away the coulisses, stage effects, and ceremonies by which they live. Too pathetic, too pitiable, is the region of affection, and its atmosphere always liable to mirage. We are not very much to blame for our bad marriages. We live amid hallucinations, and this especial trap is laid to trip up our feet with, and all are tripped up first or last. 
but the mighty mother who had been so sly with us as if she felt that she owed us some indemnity insinuates into the pandora box of marriage some deep and serious benefits and some great joys we find the delight in the beauty and happiness of children that makes the heart too big for the body in the worst assorted connections there is ever some mixture of true marriage teague and his jade get some just relations of mutual respect kindly observation and fostering of each other learn something and would carry themselves wiselier if they were now to begin tis fine for us to point at one or another fine madman as if there were any exempts the scholar in his library is none i who have all my life heard any number of orations and debates read poems and miscellaneous books conversed with many geniuses am still the victim of any new page and if marmaduke or you or moosehead or any other invent a new style or mythology i fancy that the world will be all brave and right if dressed in these colours which i had not thought of then at once i will daub with this new paint but it will not stick it is like the cement which the peddler sells at the door he makes broken crockery hold with it but you can never buy of him a bit of the cement which will make it hold when he's gone men who make themselves felt in the world avail themselves of a certain fate in their constitution which they know how to use but they never deeply interest us unless they lift a corner of the curtain or betray never so slightly their penetration of what is behind it it is the charm of practical men that outside of their practicality are a certain poetry and play as if they let the good horse power by the bridle and preferred to walk though they can ride so fiercely bonaparte is intellectual as well as caesar and the best soldiers sea captains and railway men have a gentleness when off duty a good-natured admission that there are illusions and who shall say that he is not their sport we stigmatize the cast-iron fellows who cannot so detach themselves as dragon-ridden thunder-stricken and fools of fate with whatever powers endowed since our tuition is through emblems and indirections it is well to know that there is method in it a fixed scale and rank above rank in the phantasms we begin low with coarse masks and rise to the most subtle and beautiful the red man told columbus they had an herb which took away fatigue but he found the illusion of arriving from the east at the indies more composing to his lofty spirit than any tobacco is not our faith in the impenetrability of matter more sedative than narcotics you play with jack-straws, balls, bowls, horse and gun, estates and politics, but there are finer games before you. Is not time a pretty toy? Life will show you masks that are worth all your carnivals. Yonder mountain must migrate into your mind. The fine stardust and nebulous blur in Orion, the portentous year of miser and Alcor, must come down and be dealt with in your household thought. What if you shall come to discern that the play and playground of all this pompous history are radiations from yourself, and that the sun borrows his beams? What terrible questions we are learning to ask! The former men believed in magic, by which temples, cities, and men were swallowed up, and all trace of them gone. We are coming on the secret of a magic which sweeps out of men's minds all vestige of theism, and beliefs which they and their fathers held and were framed upon there are deceptions of the senses deceptions of the passions and the structural beneficent illusions of sentiment and of the intellect there is the illusion of love which attributes to the beloved person all which that person shares with his or her family sex age or condition nay with the human mind itself tis these which the lover loves and Anna Matilda gets the credit of them. As if one shut up always in a tower with one window, through which the face of heaven and earth could be seen, should fancy that all the marvels he beheld belonged to that window. There is the illusion of time, which is very deep. Who has disposed of it? Or come to the conviction that what seems the succession of thought is only the distribution of holes into causal series? 
the intellect sees that every atom carries the whole of nature, that the mind opens to omnipotence, that, in the endless striving and ascents, the metamorphosis is entire, so that the soul doth not know itself in its own act when that act is perfected. There is illusion that shall deceive even the elect. There is illusion that shall deceive even the performer of the miracle. Though he make his body, he denies that he makes it. Though the world exist from thought, thought is daunted in presence of the world. One after the other, we accept the mental laws, still resisting those which follow, which, however, must be accepted. But all our concessions only compel us to new profusion. And what avails it that science has come to treat space and time as simply forms of thought, and the material world as hypothetical? And withal, our pretension of property, and even of selfhood, are fading with the rest, if, at last, even our thoughts are not finalities. But the incessant flowing and ascension reach these also, and each thought which yesterday was a finality, today is yielding to a larger generalization. With such volatile elements to work in, tis no wonder if our estimates are loose and floating. We must work and affirm, but we have no guess of the value of what we say or do. The cloud is now as big as your hand, and now it covers a county. That story of Thor, who was set to drain the drinking horn in Asgard, and to wrestle with the old woman, and to run with the runner Locke, and presently found that he'd been drinking up the sea, and wrestling with time, and racing with thought, describes us who are contending, amid these seeming trifles, with the supreme energies of nature. We fancy we have fallen into bad company and squalid condition, low debts, shoe bills, broken glass to pay for, pots to buy, butcher's meat, sugar, milk, and coal. Set me some great task, ye gods, and I will show my spirit. Not so, says the good heaven. Plod and plough, vamp your old coats and hats, weave a shoestring. Great affairs and the best wine, by and by. Well, tis all phantasm, and if we weave a yard of tape in all humility, and as well as we can... Long hereafter we shall see it was no cotton tape at all, but some galaxy which we braided, and the threads were time and nature. We cannot write the order of the variable winds. How can we penetrate the law of our shifting moods and susceptibility? Yet they differ as all and nothing. Instead of the firmament of yesterday, which our eyes require, it is today an eggshell which coops us in. We cannot even see what or where our stars of destiny are. From day to day the capital facts of human life are hidden from our eyes. Suddenly the mist rolls up and reveals them, and we think how much good time is gone that might have been saved had any hint of these things been shown. A sudden rise in the road shows us the system of mountains and all the summits which have been just as near us all the year, but quite out of mind but these alternations are not without their order, and we are parties to our various fortune. If life seem a succession of dreams, yet poetic justice is done in dreams also. The visions of good men are good. It is the undisciplined will that is whipped with bad thoughts and bad fortunes. When we break the laws, we lose our hold on the central reality. Like sick men in hospitals, we change only from bed to bed, from one folly to another, and it cannot signify much what becomes of such castaways, wailing, stupid, comatose creatures, lifted from bed to bed, from the nothing of life to the nothing of death. In this kingdom of illusions we grope eagerly for stays and foundations. There is none but a strict and faithful dealing at home, and a severe barring out of all duplicity or illusion there. Whatever games are played with us, we must play no games with ourselves, but deal in our privacy with the last honesty and truth. I look upon the simple and childish virtues of veracity and honesty as the root of all that is sublime in character. Speak as you think, be what you are, pay your debts of all kinds. 
I prefer to be owned as sound and solvent, and my word as good as my bond, and to be what cannot be skipped or dissipated or undermined to all the eclat in the universe. This reality is the foundation of friendship, religion, poetry, and art. At the top or at the bottom of all illusions I set the cheat which still leads us to work and live for appearances, in spite of our conviction in all sane hours, that it is what we really are that avails with friends, with strangers, and with fate or fortune. One would think from the talk of men that riches and poverty were a great matter, and our civilization mainly respects it. But the Indians say that they do not think the white man with his brow of care, always toiling, afraid of heat and cold, and keeping within doors, has any advantage of them. The permanent interest of every man is never to be in a false position, but to have the weight of nature to back him in all that he does. Riches and poverty are a thick or thin costume, and our life, the life of all of us, identical. For we transcend the circumstance continually, and taste the real quality of existence, as in our employments, which only differ in the manipulations, but express the same laws, or in our thoughts, which wear no silks and taste no ice-creams. We see God face to face every hour, and know the savour of nature. The early Greek philosophers, Heraclitus and Xenophanes, measured their force on this problem of identity. Diogenes of Apollonia said, that unless the atoms were made of one stuff, they could never blend and act with one another. But the Hindus, in their sacred writings, expressed the liveliest feeling, both of the essential identity and of that illusion which they conceive variety to be. Quote, the notions I am and this is mine, which influence mankind, are but delusions of the mother of the world. Dispel, O Lord, of all creatures, the conceit of knowledge which proceeds from ignorance. End quote. And the beatitude of men they hold to lie in being freed from fascination. The intellect is stimulated by the statement of truth in a trope, and the will by clothing the laws of life in illusions. But the unities of truth and of right are not broken by the disguise. There need never be any confusion in these. In a crowded life of many parts and performers, on a stage of nations, or in the obscurest hamlet in Maine or California, the same elements offer the same choices to each newcomer, and, according to his election, he fixes his fortune in absolute nature. It would be hard to put more mental and moral philosophy than the Persians have thrown into a sentence. Quote, fool thou must be, though wisest of the wise, then be the fool of virtue, not of vice." End quote. There is no chance and no anarchy in the universe. All is system and gradation. Every god is there, sitting in a sphere. The young mortal enters the hall of the firmament. There is he alone with them alone, they pouring on him benedictions and gifts, and beckoning him up to their thrones. On the instant, and incessantly, fall snowstorms of illusions. He fancies himself in a vast crowd which sways this way and that, and whose movement and doings he must obey. He fancies himself poor, orphaned, insignificant. The mad crowd drives hither and thither, now furiously commanding this thing to be done, now that. What is he that he should resist their will and think or act for himself? Every moment new changes and new showers of deceptions to baffle and distract him. And when, by and by, for an instant, the air clears and the cloud lifts a little, there are the gods still sitting around him on their thrones. They alone with him alone. The End End of Essay 9 End of Conduct of Life by Rolf Waldo Emerson